Chapter 15 The Great Challenge That night, when Bonor entered the suite to call Thomas Covenant to the evening meeting of the Lords, he found Covenant still sitting within the oriel of his bedroom window. By the light of Bonor's torch, Covenant appeared gaunt and spectral, as if half seen through shadows. The sockets of his eyes were dark with exhausted emotion. His lips were gray, bloodless, and the skin of his forehead had an ashen undertone. He held his arms across his chest as if he were trying to comfort a pain in his heart, watched the plains as if he were waiting for moonrise. Then he noticed the blood guard, and his lips pulled back, bared his teeth. You still don't trust me, he said in a spent voice. Bonor shrugged. We are the blood guard. We have no use for white gold. No use? It's a knowledge, a weapon. We have no use for weapons. No use? Covenant repeated dully. How do you defend the lords without weapons? We... Bonor paused as if searching the language of the land for a word to match his thought. Suffice. Covenant brooded for a moment, then swung himself out of the oriel. Standing in front of Bonor, he said softly, Bravo. Then he picked up his staff and left the rooms. This time he paid more attention to the route Bonor chose and did not lose his sense of direction. Eventually he might be able to dispense with Bonor's guidance. When they reached the huge wooden doors of the close, they met Foam Follower and Korik. The giant greeted Covenant with a salute and a broad grin, but when he spoke his voice was serious. Stone and sea, er, Lord Covenant, I am glad you did not choose to make me wrong. Perhaps I do not comprehend all your dilemma, but I believe you have taken the better risk for the sake of all the land. You're a fine one to talk, replied Covenant wanly. His sarcasm was a defensive reflex. He had lost so much other armor. How long have you giants been lost? I don't think you would know a good risk if it kicked you. Foam follower chuckled. Bravely said, my friend. It may be that the giants are not good advisers, all our years notwithstanding. Still, you have lightened my fear for the land. Grimacing uselessly, Covenant went on into the close. The council chamber was as brightly lit and acoustically perfect as before, but the number of people in it had changed. Tamarantha and Variol were absent, and scattered through the gallery were a number of spectators, Rodomero, Lillianril, warriors, lower wardens, Blood guard sat behind Moram and Osandrea, and Tuvor, Garth, Birinair, and Torm were in their places behind the High Lord. Foam follower took his former seat, gesturing Covenant into a chair near him at the Lord's table. Behind them, Banor and Korik sat down in the lower tier of the gallery. The spectators fell silent almost at once. Even the rustle of their clothing grew still. Shortly, everyone was waiting for the High Lord to begin. Prothal sat as if wandering in thought for some time, before he climbed tiredly to his feet. He held himself up by leaning on his staff, and when he spoke his voice rattled agedly in his chest. But he went without omission through the ceremonies of honoring Foam Follower and Covenant. The giant responded with a gaiety which disguised the effort he made to be concise. But Covenant rejected the formality with a scowl and a shake of his head. When he was done, Prothor said, without meeting the eyes of his fellow lords, There is a custom among the new lords, a custom which began in the days of High Lord Valiant a hundred years ago. It is this. When a high lord doubts his ability to meet the needs of the land, he may come to the council and surrender his high lordship. Then any lord who so chooses may claim the place for himself. With an effort, Prothol continued firmly, 
I now surrender my leadership. Rock and root, the trial of these times is too great for me. Er Lord Thomas Covenant, you are permitted to claim the high lordship if you wish. Covenant held Trothall's eyes, trying to measure the high lord's intentions, but he could find no duplicity in Trothall's offer. Softly he replied, You know I don't want it. Yet I ask you to accept it. You bear the white gold. Forget it, Covenant said. It isn't that easy. After a moment, Prothal nodded slowly. I see. He turned to the other lords. Do you claim the high lordship? You are the high lord, Moram averred. And Osandrea added, Who else? Do not waste more time in foolishness. Very well. Prothal squared his shoulders. The trial and the doom of this time are on my head. I am High Lord Prothal, and by the consent of the Council, my will prevails. Let none fear to follow me, or blame another if my choices fail. An involuntary twitch passed across Covenant's face, but he said nothing. And shortly Prothal sat down, saying, Now let us consider what we must do. In silence, the lords communed mentally with each other. Then Osandrea turned to Foam Follower. Rock Brother, it is said, when many matters press you, consider friendship first. For the sake of your people, you should return to Sea Reach as swiftly as may be. The giants must be told all that has transpired here. But I judge that the waterway of Andalane will no longer be safe for you. We will provide an escort to accompany you through Grimmerdhor Forest and the North Plains until you are past Landsdrop and Sarangrave Flat. Thank you, my lords, replied Foam Follower formally. But that will not be needed. I have given some thought myself to this matter. In their wandering... My people learned a saying from the Brothair. He who waits for the sword to fall upon his neck will surely lose his head. I believe that the best service which I can do for my people is to assist whatever course you undertake. Please permit me to join you. High Lord Protho smiled and bowed his head in acknowledgment. My heart hoped for this. Be welcome in our trial peril or plight, the giants of sea reach, strengthen us, and we cannot sing our gratitude enough. But your people must not be left unwarned. We will send other messengers. Foam follower bowed in turn, and then Lord Osandrea resumed by calling on war mark Garth. Garth stood and reported, Lord, I have done as you requested. Pearl's fire now burns atop Revelstone. All who see it will warn their folk, and will spread the warning of war south and east and north. By morning, all who live north of the Soul's Ease and west of Grimmerdhor will be forearmed, and those who live near the river will send runners into the center plains. Beyond that, the warning will carry more slowly. I have sent scouts in relays toward Grimmerdhor and Andalane. But six days will pass before we receive clear word of the forest, and though you did not request it, I have begun preparations for a siege. In all, 1,300 of my warriors are now at work. Twenty eomen remain ready. That is well, said Osandrea. The warning which must be taken to sea reach we entrust to you, Send as many warriors as you deem necessary to ensure the embassy. Garth bowed and sat down. Now, she nodded her head as if to clear it of other considerations. I have given my time to the study of Er Lord Covenant's tale of his journey. The presence of white gold explains much, but still many things require thought. South running storms, 
a three-winged bird, an abominable attack on the race of Andalane, the bloodying of the moon. To my mind, the meaning of these signs is clear. Abruptly, she slapped the table with her palm, as if she needed the sound and the pain to help her speak. Drool Rockworm has already found his bane, the ill earth stone or some other deadly evil. With the staff of law, he has might enough to blast the seasons in their course. A low groan arose from the gallery, but Prothol and Moram did not appear surprised. Still, a dangerous glitter intensified in Moram's eyes as he said softly, Please explain. The evidence of power is unmistakable. We know that Drool has the staff of law, but the staff is not a neutral tool. It was carved from the one tree as a servant of the earth and the earth's law. Yet all that has occurred is unnatural, wrong. Can you conceive the strength of will which could corrupt the staff even enough to warp one bird? Well, perhaps madness gives drool that will. Or perhaps the despiser now controls the staff. But consider, birthing a three-winged bird is the smallest of these ill feats. At his peak in the former age, Lord Fowl did not dare attack the wraiths. And as for the desecrated moon, only the darkest and most terrible of ancient prophecies bespeak such matters. Do you call this proof conclusive that Lord Fowl indeed possesses the staff? But consider, for less exertion than corrupting the moon requires, he could surely stamp us into death. We could not fight such might, and yet he spends himself so, so vainly. Would he employ his strength to so little purpose against the wraiths first, when he could easily destroy us? And if he would, could he corrupt the moon using the staff of law, a tool not made for his hand, resisting his mastery at every touch? I judge that if Lord Fowl controlled the staff, he would not and perhaps could not do what has been done, not until we were destroyed. But if Drool still holds the staff, then it alone does not suffice. No cave white is large enough to perform such crimes without the power of both staff and stone. The cave whites are weak-willed creatures, as you know. They are easily swayed, easily enslaved, and they have no heaven-challenging lore. Therefore, they have always been the fodder of Lord Fowl's armies. If I judge truly, then the despiser himself is as much at Drool's mercy as we are. The doom of this time rides on the mad whim of a cave white. This I conclude, because we have not been attacked. Prothal nodded glumly to Osandrea, and Moram took up the line of her reasoning. So Lord Fowl relies upon us to save him and damn ourselves. In some way, he intends that our response to Ur Lord Covenant's message will spring upon ourselves a trap which holds both us and him. He has pretended friendship to Drool to preserve himself until his plans are ripe, and he has taught Drool to use this new-found power in ways which will satisfy the Cave White's lust for mastery without threatening us directly. Thus he attempts to ensure that we will make trial to wrest the staff of law from Drew. And therefore, Osandrea barked, it would be the utterest folly for us to make trial. How so? Moram objected. The message said, Without it, they will not be able to resist me for seven years. He foretells a sooner end for us if we do not make the attempt, or if we attempt and fail than if we succeed. What does he gain by such foretellings? What but our immediate deaths? His message is only a lure of false hope to lead us into folly. But Moram replied by quoting, 
Drool Rockworm has the staff, and that is a cause for terror. He will be enthroned at Lord's Keep in two years if the message fails. The message has not failed, Osandrea insisted. We are forewarned. We can prepare. Drool is mad, and his attacks will be flawed by madness. It may be that we will find his weakness and prevail. By the seven, Revelstone will never fall while the blood guard remain, and the giants and Ranihin will come to our aid. Turning toward the High Lord, she urged, Prothol, do not follow the lure of this quest. It is Chimera. We will fall under the shadow and the land will surely die. But if we succeed, Moram countered, if we gain the staff, then our chance is prolonged. Lord Fowl's prophecy notwithstanding, we may find enough earth power in the staff to prevail in war. And if we do not, still we will have that much more time to search for other salvations. How can we succeed? Drool has both the staff of law and the ill earth stone. And is master of neither. Master enough. Ask the race the extent of his might. Ask the moon. Ask me, growled Covenant, climbing slowly to his feet. For a moment he hesitated, torn between a fear of drool and a dread of what would happen to him if the lords did not go in search of the staff. He had a vivid apprehension of the malice behind Drool's lava eyes, but the thought of the staff decided him. He felt that he had gained an insight into the logic of his dream. The staff had brought him to the land. He would need the staff to escape. Ask me, he said again. Don't you think I have a stake in this? The lords did not respond, and Covenant was forced to carry the argument forward himself. In his brooding, he had been able to find only one frail hope. With an effort, he broached the subject. According to you, Fowl chose me. But he talked about me on Kevin's watch, as if I had been chosen by someone else. My enemy, he said. Who was he talking about? Thoughtfully, the High Lord replied, I do not know. We said earlier that we hoped there were other forces at work in your selection. Perhaps there were. A few of our oldest legends speak of a creator, the creator of the earth, but we know nothing of such a being. We only know that we are mortal, but Lord Fowl is not. In some way, he surpasses flesh. The Creator, Covenant muttered. All right. A disturbing memory of the old beggar who had accosted him outside the courthouse flared momentarily. Why did he choose me? Prothol's abnegate eyes did not waver. Who can say? Perhaps for the very reasons that Lord Fowl chooses you. That paradox angered Covenant but he went on as if inspired by the contradiction. Then this creator also wanted you to hear Fowl's message. Take that into account. There, Osandrea pounced, there is the lie I sought, the final bait. By raising the hope of unknown help, Lord Fowl seeks to ensure that we will accept this mad quest. Covenant did not look away from the High Lord. He held Prothol's eyes, tried to see beyond the wear of long asceticisms into his mind. But Prothol returned the gaze unflinchingly. The lines at the corners of his eyes seemed etched there by self-abrogation. Lord Osandrea, he said evenly, does your study reveal any signs of hope? Signs? Omens? Her voice sounded reluctant in the close. I am not Moram. If I were, I would ask Covenant what dreams he has had in the land. But I prefer practical hopes. I see but one. So little time has been lost. It is in my heart that no other combination of chance and choice could have brought Covenant here so swiftly. Very well, Prothol replied. 
his look, locked with covenants, sharpened momentarily, and in it covenant at last saw that the high lord had already made his decision. He only listened to the debate to give himself one last chance to find an alternative. Awkwardly, Covenant dropped his eyes, slumped in his chair. How does he do it? He murmured pointlessly to himself. Where does all this courage come from? Am I the only coward? A moment later, the High Lord pulled his blue robe about him and rose to his feet. My friends, he said, his voice thick with room, the time has come for decision. I must choose a course to meet our need. If any have thoughts which must be uttered, speak now. No one spoke, and Prothor seemed to draw dignity and stature from the silence. Hear then the will of Prothol, son of Dwilian, High Lord, by the choice of the council, and may the land forgive me if I mistake or fail. In this moment, I commit the future of the earth. Lord Osandrea, to you and to the lords Variol and Tamarantha, I entrust the defenses of the land. I charge you, do all which wisdom or vision suggest to preserve the life and our sworn care. Remember that there is always hope while Revelstone stands. But if Revelstone falls, then all the ages and works of the lords, from Beric Hartthew to our generation, shall come to an end, and the land will never know the like again. Lord Moram and I will go in search of Drool Rockworm and the Staff of Law. With us will go the giant, Saltheart Foam Follower, Ur Lord Thomas Covenant, as many of the Blood Guard as First Mark Tubord deems proper to spare from the defense of Revelstone, and one Eoman of the Warward. Thus we will not go blithe or unguarded into doom, but the main might of Lord's Keep will be left for the defense of the land if we fail. Hear and be ready. The quest departs at first light. High Lord, protested Garth, leaping to his feet, will you not wait for some word from my scouts? You must brave Grimmerdhor to pass toward Mount Thunder. If the forest is infested by the servants of Drool or the Grey Slayer, you will have little safety until my scouts have found out the movements of the enemy. That is true, Warmark, said Prothor. But how long will we be delayed? Six days, High Lord. Then we will know how much force the crossing of Grimmerdhort requires. For some time, Moram had been sitting with his chin in his hands, staring absently into the graveling pit. But now he roused himself and said, One hundred blood guard, or every warrior that Revelstone can provide. I have seen it. There are Irviles in Grimmerdhor, and wolves by the thousands. They hunt in my dreams. His voice seemed to chill the air in the close, like a wind of loss. But Prothor spoke at once, resisting the spell of Moram's words. No, Garth, we cannot delay, and the peril of Grimmerdhor is too great. Even Drool Rockworm must understand that our best road to Mount Thunder leads through the forest and along the north of Andalane. No, we will go south, around Andalane, then east through Morenmos to the plains of Ra, before moving north to Graventhrendor. I know that seems a long way, full of needless leagues, for a quest which must rue the loss of each day. But this southward way will enable us to gain the help of the Roman. Thus all the despisers, old and foes, will share in our quest, and perhaps we will throw drool out of his reckoning. No, my choice is clear. The quest will depart tomorrow, riding south. That is my word. Let anyone who doubt speak now. And Thomas Covenant, who doubted everything, felt Prothor's resolution and dignity so strongly 
that he said nothing. Then Moram and Osandrea stood, followed immediately by Foam Follower, and behind them the assembly rushed to its feet. All turned toward High Lord Prothor, and Osandrea lifted up her voice to say, Melancurian Skyweir, watch over you, High Lord. Melancurian Abatha, preserve and prevail. Seed and rock, may your purpose flourish. Let no evil blind or ill assail. No fear or faint, no rest or joy or pain assuage the grief of wrong. Cowardice is inexculpate, corruption unassoiled. Sky weir watch and earth root anneal. Melancholian Abatha, Minas Mil Cabal. Protho bowed his head, and the gallery and the lords responded with one unanimous salute, one extending of arms in mute benediction. Then, in slow order, the people began to leave the close. At the same time, Prothol, Moram, and Osandrea departed through their private doors. Once the lords were gone, the home follower joined Covenant, and they moved together up the steps, followed by Banor and Korik. Outside the close, the home follower hesitated, considering something, then said, My friend, will you answer a question for me? You think I've got something left to hide? As to that, who knows? The fairy Elohim had a saying, The heart cherishes secrets not worth the telling. Ah, they were a laughing people, but... No, Covenant cut in. I've been scrutinized enough. He started away toward his rooms. But you have not heard my question. He turned. Why should I? You were going to ask what Ati Aran had against me. No, my friend, replied Foam Follower, laughing softly. Let your heart cherish that secret to the end of time. My question is this. What dreams have you had since you came to the land? What did you dream that night in my boat? Impulsively, Covenant answered. A crowd of my people, real people, were spitting blood at me. And one of them said, There is only one good answer to death. Only one? What answer is that? Turn your back on it, Covenant snapped as he strode away down the corridor. Outcast it. Foam Follower's good-natured humor echoed in his ears, but he marched on until he could no longer hear the giant. Then he tried to remember the way to his rooms. With some help from Banor, he found the suite and shut himself in, only bothering to light one torch before closing the door on the blood guard. He found that in his absence someone had shuttered his windows against the fell light of the moon. Perversely, he yanked one of them open. But the bloodscape hurt his eyes like the stink of a corpse, and he slammed the shutter closed again. Then, for a long time before he went to bed, he paced the floor, arguing with himself until fatigue overcame him. When morning neared and Banor began shaking him awake, he resisted. He wanted to go on sleeping, as if in slumber he could find absolution. Dimly, he remembered that he was about to start on a journey far more dangerous than the one he had just completed, and his tired consciousness moaned in protest. Come, said Banor. If we delay, we will miss the call of the Ranihin. Go to hell, Covenant mumbled. Don't you ever sleep? The Bloodguard do not sleep. What? No Bloodguard has slept since the Haruchai swore their vow. With an effort, Covenant pulled himself into a sitting position. He peered blearily at Banor for a moment, then muttered, You are already in hell. The alien flatness of Banor's voice did not waver as he replied, You have no reason to mock us. Of course not, Covenant growled, climbing out of bed. Naturally, I am supposed to enjoy having my integrity judged, by someone who doesn't even need sleep. We do not judge. We are cautious. The lords are in our care. 
like Kevin, who killed himself and took just about everything else with him. But as he made his retort, he felt suddenly ashamed of himself. In the firelight, he remembered the costliness of the blood guard's fidelity. Wincing at the coldness of the stone floor, he said, Forget it. I talk like that in self-defense. Ridicule seems to be my only answer. Then he hurried away to wash, shave, and get dressed. After a quick meal, he made sure of his knife and staff, and at last nodded his readiness to the blood guard. Bonor led him down to the courtyard of the old gildan tree. A haze of night still dimmed the air, but the stars were gone, and sunrise was clearly imminent. Unexpectedly, he felt that he was taking part in something larger than himself. The sensation was an odd one, and he tried to reason it away as he followed Bonor through the tunnel, between the huge knuckled tower gates and out into the dawn. There, near the wall, a short distance to the right of the gate, was gathered the company of the quest. The warriors of the third eelman sat astride their horses in a semicircle behind Warhaft Quan, and to their left stood nine blood guard led by First Mark Tuvor. Within the semicircle were Prothol, Moram, and Saltheart Foam Follower. The giant carried in his belt a quarter staff as tall as a man, and wore a blue neck scarf that fluttered ebulliently in the morning breeze. Nearby were three men holding three horses saddled in Klingor. Above them all, the face of Revelstone was crowded with people. The dwellers of the mountain city thronged every balcony and terrace, every window, and facing the gathered company was Lord Osandrea. She held her head high, as if she defied her responsibility to make her stoop. Then the sun crested the eastern horizon. It caught the upper rim of the plateau, where burned the blue flame of warning. It moved down the wall until it lifted High Lord's furl out of the gloaming, like the lighting of a torch. Next it revealed the red pennant, and then a new white flag. Nodding up at the new flag, Bonor said, That is for you, Er Lord, the sign of white gold. Then he went to take his place among the blood guard. Silence rested on the company until the sunlight touched the ground, casting its gold glow over the questers. As soon as the light reached her feet, Osandrea began speaking, as if she had been waiting impatiently for this moment and she covered the ache in her heart with a scolding tone. I am in no mood for the ceremony, Prothol. Call the Rani hin and go. The folly of this undertaking will not be made less by delay and brave words. There is nothing more for you to say. I am well suited for my task, and the defense of the land will not falter while I live. Go. Call the Rani hin. Prothol smiled gently and Moram said with a grin, We are fortunate in you, O Sandrea. I could not entrust any other with Variol, my father, and Tamarantha, my mother. Taunt me at your peril, she snapped. I am in no mood, no mood, do you hear? I hear. You know that I do not taunt you. Sister O Sandrea, be careful. I am always careful. Now go before I lose patience altogether. Prothol nodded to Tuvor. The ten blood guard turned and spread out, so that each faced into the rising sun with no one to obscure his view. One at a time, each blood guard raised a hand to his mouth and gave a piercing whistle which echoed off the wall of the keep into the dawn air. They whistled again, and then a third time, and each call sounded as fierce and lonely as a heart cry but the last whistle was answered by a distant whinny and a low thunder of mighty hooves. All eyes turned expectantly eastward, squinted into the morning glory. For a long moment nothing appeared, and the rumble of the earth came disembodied to the company, a mystic manifestation. 
but then the horses could be seen within the sun's orb, as if they had materialized in sky fire. Soon the Ronihin passed out of the direct line of the sun. There were ten of them, wild and challenging animals. They were great craggy beasts, deep-chested, proud-necked, with some of the delicacy of pure-blooded stock and some of the rough angularity of mustangs. They had long flying manes and tails, gates as straight as plumb lines, eyes full of restless intelligence. Chestnuts, bays, roans, they galloped toward the blood guard. Covenant knew enough about horses to see that the Ronihin were as individual as people, but they shared one trait. A white star marked the center of each forehead. As they approached, with the dawn burning on their backs, they looked like the land personified, the essence of health and power. Nickering and tossing their heads, they halted before the blood guard, and the blood guard bowed deeply to them. The Ronihans stamped their feet and shook their manes, as if they were laughing affectionately at a mere human show of respect. After a moment, Tuvor spoke to them. Hail, Ronihin, land riders and proud bearers, sun, flesh, and sky mane, we are glad that you have heard our call. We must go on a long journey of many days. Will you bear us? In response, a few of the horses nodded their heads, and several others pranced in circles like colts. Then they moved forward, each approaching a specific blood guard and nuzzling him, as if urging him to mount. This the blood guard did, though the horses were without saddle or bridle. Riding bareback, the blood guard trotted the Ronihin in a circle around the company and arrayed themselves beside the mounted warriors. Covenant felt that the departure of the company was imminent, and he did not want to miss his chance. Stepping close to Osandrea, he asked, What does it mean? Where did they come from? The Lord turned and answered almost eagerly, as if glad for any distraction. Of course you are a stranger. Now, how can I explain such a deep matter briefly? Consider, the Ranihin are free, untamed, and their home is in the plains of Ra. They are tended by the Raman, but they are never ridden unless they choose a rider for themselves. It is a free choice. And once a Ronihin selects a rider, it is faithful to that one, though fire and death interdict. Few are chosen. Tamarantha is the only living lord to be blessed with a Ronihin mount. Hineril bears her proudly, though neither Prothol nor Moram have yet made the trial. Prothol has been unwilling, but I suspect that one of his reasons for journeying south is to give Moram a chance to be chosen. No matter. Since the age of High Lord Kevin, a bond has grown up between the Ronihin and the Blood Guard. For many reasons, only some of which I can guess, no Blood Guard has remained unchosen. As to the coming here of the Ronihin today, that surpasses my explaining. They are creatures of earth power. In some way, each Ronihin knows when its rider will call. Yes, knows, and never fails to answer. Here are Hurin, Rabha, Marni, and others. Ten days ago they heard the call, which only reached our ears this morning, and after more than four hundred leagues they arrive as fresh as the dawn. If we could match them, the land would not be in such peril. As she had been speaking, Prothol and Moram had mounted their horses, and she finished while walking Covenant toward his mustang. Under the influence of her voice, he went up to the animal without hesitation. But when he put his foot in the stirrup of the Klingor saddle, he felt a spasm of reluctance. He did not like horses, did not trust them. Their strength was too dangerous. He backed away and found that his hands were trembling. Osandrea regarded him curiously, but before she could say anything, a bustle of surprise ran through the company. When he looked up, Covenant saw three old figures riding forward, 
the Lords Variol and Tamarantha, and Harthrol Viranair. Tamarantha sat astride a great roan Ronihan mare with laughing eyes. Bowing toward them from the back of his horse, High Lord Prothor said, I am glad that you have come. We need your blessing before we depart, just as Osandrea needs your help. Tamarantha bowed in return, but there was a sly half-smile on her wrinkled lips. She scanned the company briefly. You have chosen well, Prothol. Then she brought her old eyes back to the High Lord. But you mistake us. We go with you. Prothol began to object, but Viranair put in stoutly. Of course, what else? A quest without a higher brand indeed. Viranair, said Prothol reprovingly, surely our work for the sea-reached giants requires you. Requires, of course. As to that, why, the higher brand huffed, as to that, no. Shames me to say it. I have given all the orders. No, the others are abler. Have been for years. Prothol, Tamarantha urged, do not forbid. We are old. Of course we are old. And the way will be long and hard. But this is the great challenge of our time. The only high and bold enterprise in which we will ever be able to share. Is the defense of Revelstone then such a little thing? Variol jerked up his head, as if Prothol's question had been a jibe. Revelstone remembers we have failed to retrieve any of Kevin's lore. What possible help can we be here? Osandrea is more than enough. Without this quest, our lives will be wasted. No, my lords, no, not wasted, Prothol murmured. With a baffled expression, he looked to Moram for support. Smiling crookedly, Moram said, Life is well designed. Men and women grow old, so that someone will be wise enough to teach the young. Let them come. After another moment's hesitation, Prothol decided, Come then, you will teach us all. Variol smiled up at Tamarantha, and she returned his gaze from the high back of the Ranihin. Their faces were full of satisfaction and calm expectancy, which they shared in the silent marriage of their eyes. Watching them, Covenant abruptly snatched up his horse's reins and climbed into the saddle. His heart thudded anxiously, but almost at once the Klingor gave him a feeling of security which eased his trepidation. Following the example of Prothol and Moram, he slid the staff under his left thigh, where it was held by the Klingor. Then he gripped the Mustang with his knees and tried not to fret. The man who had been holding the horse touched Covenant's knee to get his attention. Her name is Gura, Gura Fairflank. Horses are rare in the land. I have trained her well. She is as good as a Ranihin he boasted, then lowered his eyes, as if embarrassed by his exaggeration. Covenant replied gruffly, I don't want a Ronihin. The man took this as approval of Dura, and beamed with pleasure. As he moved away, he touched his palms to his forehead and spread his arms wide in salute. From his new vantage, Covenant surveyed the company. There were no pack horses, but attached to every saddle were bags of provisions and tools, and Biranair had a thick bundle of Lillian reel rods behind him. The blood guard were unencumbered, but Foam Follower carried his huge sack over his shoulder and looked ready to travel as fast as any horse. Shortly, Prothol rose in his stirrups and called out over the company, My friends, we must depart. The quest is urgent, and the time of our trial presses upon us. I will not try to stir your hearts with long words, or bind you with awesome oaths. But I give you two charges. Be true to the limit of your strength, and remember the oath of peace. We go into danger, and perhaps into war. We will fight, if need be. But the land will not be served by angry bloodshed. 
remember the code. Do not hurt where holding is enough. Do not wound where hurting is enough. Do not maim where wounding is enough. And kill not where maiming is enough. The greatest warrior is one who does not need to kill. Then the High Lord wheeled his mount to face Revelstone. He drew out his staff, swung it three times about his head, and raised it to the sky. From its end, a blue incandescent flame burst, and he cried to the keep, Hail, Revelstone! The entire population of the keep responded with one mighty, heart-shaking shout, Hail! That myriad-throated paean sprang across the hills. The dawn air itself seemed to vibrate with praise and salutation. Several of the Ranihin nickered joyously. In answer, Covenant clenched his teeth against a sudden thickening in his throat. He felt unworthy. Then Prothol turned his horse and urged it into a canter down the hillside. Swiftly the company swung into place around him. Moram guided Covenant to a position behind Prothol, ahead of Variol and Tamarantha. Four blood guard flanked the lords on either side. Quan, Tuvor, and Korik rode ahead of Prothol, and behind came Dirinair and the Eoman. After a long, loping stride, Foam Follower pulled abreast of Moram and Covenant, where he jogged as easily as if such traveling were natural to him. Thus the quest for the Staff of Law left Lord's Keep in the sunlight of a new day. Chapter 16 Bloodborne Thomas Covenant spent the next three days in one long, acute discovery of saddle soreness. Sitting on thin leather, he felt as if he were riding bareback. The hard physical fact of Dura's spine threatened to saw him open. His knees felt as if they were being twisted out of joint. His thighs and calves ached and quivered with the strain of gripping his mount, a pain which slowly spread into and up his back, and his neck throbbed from the lash of Dura's sudden lurchings as she crossed the obstacles of the terrain. At times he remained on her back, only because the Klingor saddle did not let him fall, and at night his clenched muscles hurt so badly that he could not sleep without the benefit of diamond draft. As a result, he noticed little of the passing countryside, or the weather, or the mood of the company. He ignored or rebuffed every effort to draw him into conversation. He was consumed by the painful sensation of being broken in half, once again, he was forced to recognize the suicidal nature of this dream, of what the subconscious darkness of his mind was doing to him. But the giant's diamond draft and the land's impossible health worked in him regardless of his suffering. His flesh grew tougher to meet the demands of Dura's back, and without knowing it, he had been improving as a rider. He was learning how to move with instead of resisting his mount. When he woke up after the third night, he found that physical hurting no longer dominated him. By that time, the company had left behind the cultivated region around Revelstone and had moved out into rough plains. They had camped in the middle of a rude flatland, and when Covenant began to look about him, the terrain that met his eyes was rocky and unpromising. Nevertheless, the sense of moving forward reasserted itself in him, gave him once again the illusion of safety. Like so many other things, Revelstone was behind him. When Foam Follower addressed him, he was able to respond without violence. At that, the giant remarked to Moram, Stone and sea, my lord, I believe that Thomas Covenant has chosen to rejoin the living. Surely this is the work of Diamond Draft. Hail, Er Lord Covenant. Welcome to our company. Do you know, Lord Moram, there is an ancient giantish tale about a war which was halted by Diamond Draft? Would you like to hear? I can tell it in half a day. Indeed, 
Moram chuckled. And will it take only half a day if you tell it on the run while we ride? Thong follower laughed broadly. Then I can be done by sunset tomorrow. I, salt heart, foam follower, say it. I have heard that tale, High Lord Prothor said, but the teller assured me that Diamond Draft did not, in fact, end the conflict. The actual reign was giantish talk. When the giants were done asking after the causes of the war, the combatants had been listening so long that they had forgotten the answer. Ah, High Lord, Foam Follower chortled, you misunderstand. It was the giants who drank the diamond draft. Laughter burst from the listening warriors, and Prothor smiled as he turned to mount his horse. Soon the quest was on its way, and Covenant fell into place beside Moram. Now as he rode, Covenant listened to the traveling noises of the company. The lords and bloodguard were almost entirely silent preoccupied, but over the thud of hooves he could hear talk and snatches of song from the warriors. In Quan's leadership they sounded confident and occasionally eager, as if they looked forward to putting their years of sword training to the test. Sometime later Lord Moram surprised Covenant by saying without preamble, Er, Lord, as you know there were questions which the Council did not ask of you. May I ask them now? I should like to know more concerning your world. My world? Covenant swallowed roughly. He did not want to talk about it. He had no desire to repeat the ordeal of the council. Why? Moram shrugged. Because the more I know of you, the better I will know what to expect from you in times of peril. Or because an understanding of your world may teach me to treat you rightly, or because I have asked the question in simple friendship. Covenant could hear the candor in Moram's voice, and it disarmed his refusals. He owed the lords and himself some kind of honesty. But that debt was bitter to him, and he could not find an easy way to articulate all the things which needed saying. Instinctively, he began to make a list. We have cancer, heart failure, tuberculosis, multiple sclerosis, birth defects, leprosy. We have alcoholism, venereal disease, drug addiction, rape, robbery, murder, child beating, genocide. But he could not bear to utter a catalogue of woes that might run on forever. After a moment, he stood in his stirrups and gestured out over the ruggedness of the plains. You probably see it better than I do, but even I can tell that this is beautiful. It's alive. It's alive the way it should be alive. This kind of grass is yellow and stiff and thin, but I can see that it's healthy. It belongs here in this kind of soil. By hell, I can even see what time of year this is by looking at the dirt. I can see spring. Where I come from, we don't see. If you don't know the annual cycles of the plants, you can't tell the difference between spring and summer. If you don't have a, have a standard of comparison, you can't recognize. But the world is beautiful, what's left of it, what we haven't damaged. Images of Haven Farm sprang irrefusably across his mind. He could not restrain the mordancy of his tone as he concluded, we have beauty, too. We call it scenery. Scenery? Moram echoed. The word is strange to me, but I do not like the sound. Covenant felt oddly shaken, as if he had just looked over his shoulder and found himself standing too close to a precipice. It means that beauty is something extra, he rasped. It's nice, but we can live without it. Without? Moram's gaze glittered dangerously. And behind him, Thome Follower breathed in astonishment. Live without beauty? Ah, oh, my friend, how do you resist despair? I don't think we do, Covenant muttered. 
Some of us are just stubborn. Then he fell silent. Moram asked him no more questions, and he rode on, chewing the gristle of his thoughts, until High Lord Prothol called a rest halt. As the day progressed, Covenant silence seemed slowly to infect the company. The traveling banter and singing of the eelmen faded gradually into stillness. Moram watched Covenant curiously askance, but made no effort to renew their conversation, and Prothol looked as night-faced as the blood guard. After a time, Covenant guessed the cause of their reticence. Tonight would be the first full of the bloody moon. A shiver ran through him. That night would be a kind of test of Drool's power. If the cave white could maintain his red hold even when the moon was full, then the lords would have to admit that his might had no discernible limit. And such might would be spawning armies, would almost certainly have already produced marauders to feed Drool's taste for pillage. Then the company would have to fight for passage. Covenant remembered with a shudder his brief meeting with Drool in the cavern of Kirill Threndor. Like his companions, he fell under the pall of what the night might reveal. Only Variol and Tamarantha seemed untouched by the common mood. She appeared half asleep and rode casually, trusting the Ranihin to keep her on its back. Her husband sat erect with a steady hand on his reins, but his mouth was slack and his eyes unfocused. They looked frail. Covenant felt that he could see the brittleness of their bones. But they alone of all the company were blithe against the coming night. Blithe or uncomprehending. The riders camped before dusk on the north side of a rough hill, partially sheltered from the prevailing southwest breeze. The air had turned cold like a revisitation of winter and the wind carried a chill to the hearts of the travelers. In silence, some of the warriors fed and rubbed down the horses, while others cooked a spare meal over a fire that Virenair coaxed from one of his Lillian reel rods and some scrub wood. The Ranihin galloped away together to spend the night in some secret play or rite, leaving the horses hobbled and the blood guard standing sentinel and the rest of the company huddled in their cloaks around the fire. As the last of the sunlight scudded from the air, the breeze stiffened into a steady wind. Covenant found himself wishing for some of the camaraderie that had begun the day, but he could not supply the lack himself. He had to wait until High Lord Prothol rose to meet the apprehension of the quest. Planting his staff firmly, he began to sing the Vespers hymn of Revelstone. Moram joined him, followed by Variol and Tamarantha, and soon the whole eelman was on its feet, adding its many-throated voice to the song. There they stood under the stern sky, twenty-five souls singing like witnesses. Seven hells for failed faith, for land's betrayers, man and wraith, and one brave lord to deal the doom, to keep the blacking blight from beauty's bloom. They raised their voices bravely, and their melody was counterpointed by the tenor roll of Thome Follower's plain song. When they were done, they reseated themselves and began to talk together in low voices, as if the hymn were all they needed to restore their courage. Covenant sat staring at his knotted hands. Without taking his eyes off them, he knew when moonrise came. He felt the sudden stiffening around him as the first crimson glow appeared on the horizon. But he gnawed on his lip and did not look up. His companions breathed tensely. A red cast slowly deepened in the heart of the fire, but he clenched his gaze as if he was studying the way his knuckles whitened. Then he heard Lord Moram's agonized whisper. Melancholian, and he knew that the moon was full red, stained as if its defilement were complete, as bloody as if the night sky had been cut to the heart. He felt the light touch his face, and his cheek twitched in revulsion. The next moment there came a distant wail like a cry of protest, 
It throbbed like desolation in the chill air. In spite of himself, Covenant looked over the blood-hued plain. For an instant, he expected the company to leap to the relief of that call. But no one moved. The cry must have come from some animal. Glancing briefly at the full violated moon, he changed his grip and lowered his eyes again. When his gaze reached his fingers, he saw in horror that the moonlight gave his ring a reddish cast. The metal looked as if it had been dipped in blood. Its inner silver struggled to show through the crimson, but the bloodlight seemed to be soaking inward, slowly quenching, perverting the white gold. He understood instinctively. For one staggering heartbeat, he sat still, howled silent and futile warnings at his unsuspecting self. Then he sprang to his feet, erect and rigid, as if he had been yanked upright by the moon, arms tight at his sides, fists clenched. Behind him, Bonor said, Do not fear, Er Lord. The Ranihin will warn us if the wolves are any danger. Covenant turned his head. The blood guard reached a restraining hand toward him. Don't touch me, Covenant hissed. He jerked away from Banor. For an instant, while his heart labored, he observed how the crimson moon made Banor's face look like old lava. Then a vicious sense of wrong exploded under his feet, and he pitched toward the fire. As he struck the earth, he flung himself onward, careless of everything but his intense, visceral need to escape the attack. After one roll, his legs crashed among the flaming brands. But as Covenant fell, Bonor sprang forward. When Covenant hit the fire, the blood guard was only a stride away. He caught Covenant's wrist in almost the same instant, heaved him, child light, out of the flames and onto his feet. Even before he had regained his balance, Covenant spun on Bonor and yelled into the blood guard's face, Don't touch me! Bonor released Covenant's wrist, backed away a step. Prothol, Moram, foam follower, and all the warriors were on their feet. They stared at Covenant in surprise, confusion, outrage. He felt suddenly weak. His legs trembled. He dropped to his knees beside the fire, thinking, Hell fire and bloody foul has done it to me. He's taking me over damnation. He pointed an unsteady finger at the ground that had stung him. There, he gasped. It was there. I felt it. The lords reacted immediately. While Moram shouted for Birinir, Prothol hurried forward and stooped over the spot Covenant indicated. Mumbling softly to himself, he touched the spot with the tips of his fingers, like a physician testing a wound. Then he was joined by Moram and Birinir. Birinir thrust the High Lord aside, took his Lillianril staff, and placed its end on the sore place. Rotating the staff between his palms, he concentrated imperiously on his beloved wood. For one moment, Prothol murmured, for one moment I felt something, some memory in the earth. Then it passed beyond my touch. He sighed. It was terrible. Virenair echoed, terrible, talking to himself in his concentration. Prothol and Moram watched him as his hands trembled with either age or sensitivity. Abruptly he cried, Terrible! The hand of the slayer! He dares do this! He snatched himself away so quickly that he stumbled and would have fallen if Prothol had not caught him. Momentarily, Prothol and Birinair met each other's eyes, as if they were trying to exchange some knowledge that could not be voiced. Then Birinair shook himself free. Looking about him as if he could see the shards of his dignity scattered around his feet, he mumbled gruffly, Stand on my own. Not that old yet. After a glance at Covenant, he went on more loudly, You think I am old, of course, old and foolish. Push himself into a quest when he should be resting his bones by the hearth, like a lump. Pointing toward the unbeliever, 
he concluded. Ask him. Ask. Covenant had climbed to his feet while the attention of the company was on the higher brand and had pushed his hands into his pockets to hide the hue of his ring. As Birnir pointed at him, he raised his eyes from the ground. A sick feeling of presage twisted his stomach as he remembered his attacks in Underlane and what had followed them. Prothor said firmly, Step there again, Er Lord. Grimacing, Covenant strode forward and stamped his foot on the spot. As his heel hit the ground, he winced in expectation, tried to brace himself for the sensation that at this one point the earth had become insecure, foundationless. But nothing stung him. As in Underlane, the ill had vanished, leaving him with the impression that a veneer of trustworthiness had been replaced over a pit. In answer to the silent question of the lords, he shook his head. After a pause, Moram said evenly, You have felt this before. With an effort, Covenant forced himself to say, Yes, several times in Underlane, before that attack on the celebration. The hand of the Grey Slayer touched you, Virenir spat, but he could not sustain his accusation. His bones seemed to remember their age, and he sagged tiredly, leaned on his staff. In an odd tone of self-reproach, as if he were apologizing, he mumbled, Of course, younger, if I were younger. He turned from the company and shuffled away to his bed beyond the circle. Why did you not tell us? Moram asked severely. The question made Covenant feel suddenly ashamed, as if his ring were visible through the fabric of his pants. His shoulders hunched, drove his hands deeper into his pockets. I didn't, at first, I didn't want you to know what, how important foul and drool think I am. After that, he referred to his crisis in the close with his eyes, I was thinking about other things. Moram accepted this with a nod, and after a moment Covenant went on. I don't know what it is, but I only get it through my boots. I can't touch it with my hands or my feet. Moram and Protho shared a glance of surprise. Shortly the High Lord said, Unbeliever, the cause of these attacks surpasses me. Why do your boots make you sensitive to this wrong? I do not know. But either Lord Moram or myself must remain by you at all times so that we may respond without delay. Over his shoulder he said, First Mark Tuvor, Warhaft Quan, have you heard? Quan came to attention and replied, Yes, High Lord. And from behind the circle, Tuvor's voice carried softly, There will be an attack, we have heard. Readiness will be needed said Moram grimly, and stout hearts to face an onslaught of Irviles and wolves and cave whites without faltering. That is so, the High Lord said at last, but such things will come in their own time. Now we must rest, we must gather strength. Slowly the company began the business of bedding down. Humming his giantish plain song, Foam follower stretched out on the ground with his arm around his leather flask of diamond draft. While the blood guards set watches, the warriors spread blankets for themselves and the lords. Covenant went to bed self-consciously, as if he felt the company studying him, and he was glad of the blankets that helped him hide his ring. Then he lay awake long into the night, feeling too cold to sleep. The blankets did not keep out the chill which emanated from his ring. But until he finally fell asleep, he could hear foam followers humming and see Prothal sitting by the embers of the fire. The giant and the high lord kept watch together, two old friends of the land sharing some vigil against their impending doom. The next day dawned gray and cheerless overcast with clouds like ashes in the sky, and into it Covenant rode, bent in his saddle as if he had a weight around his neck. 
His ring had lost its red stain with the setting of the moon, but the color remained in his mind, and the ring seemed to drag him down like a meaningless crime. Helplessly he perceived that an allegiance he had not chosen, could not have chosen, was being forced upon him. The evidence seemed irrefutable. Like the moon, he was falling prey to Lord Fowle's machinations. His volition was not required. The strings which dangled him were strong enough to overbear any resistance. He did not understand how it could happen to him. Was his death wish, his leper's weariness or despair, so strong? What had become of his obdurate instinct for survival? Where was his anger, his violence? Had he been victimized for so long that now he could only respond as a victim, even to himself? He had no answers. He was sure of nothing but the fear which came over him when the company halted at noon. He found that he did not want to get down from Dura's back. He distrusted the ground, dreaded contact with it. He had lost a fundamental confidence. His faith that the earth was stable, a faith so obvious and constant and necessary that it had been unconscious until now, had been shaken. Blind, silent soil had become a dark hand, malevolently seeking out him and him alone. Nevertheless, he swung down from the saddle, forced himself, set foot on the ground, and was stung. The virulence of the sensation made all his nerves cringe, and he could hardly stand as he watched Prothol and Moram and Birenair try to capture what he had felt. But they failed completely. The misery of that ill touch withdrew the instant he jumped away from it. That evening, during supper, he was stung again. When he went to bed to hide his ring from the moon, he shivered as if he were feverish. On the morning of the sixth day, he arose with a grey face and a crippled look in his eyes. Before he could mount Dura, he was stung again, and again during one of the company's rest halts, and again the instant he mustered enough to spare to dismount at the end of the day's ride. The wrong felt like another spike in his coffin lid. This time his nerves reacted so violently that he tumbled to the ground like a demonstration of futility. He had to lie still for a long time before he could coax his arms and legs under control again, and when he finally regained his feet, he jerked and winced with fear at every step. Pathetic, pathetic, he panted to himself, but he could not find the rage to master it. With keen concern in his eyes, Foam Follower asked him why he did not take off his boots. Covenant had to think for a moment before he could remember why. Then he murmured, They're part of me. They're part of the way I have to live. I don't have very many parts left. And besides, he added warmly, if I don't keep having these fits, how is Prothol going to figure them out? But do not do such a thing for us, Moram replied intently. How could we ask it? But Covenant only shrugged and went to sit by the fire. He could not face food that night. The thought of eating made his raw nerves nauseous, but he tried a few aliantha from a bush near the camp and found that they had a calming effect. He ate a handful of the berries, absent-mindedly tossing away the seeds as Lena had taught him, and returned to the fire. When the company had finished its meal, Moram seated himself beside Covenant. Without looking at him, the Lord asked, How can we help you? Should we build a litter so that you will not have to touch the earth? Or are there other ways? Perhaps one of Foam Follower's tales would ease your heart. I have heard giants boast that the despiser himself would become an earth friend if he could be made to listen to the story of Bagoon the Unbearable and Thelma Two-Fist. Such healing there is in stories. Abruptly Moram turned squarely toward Covenant, and Covenant saw that the Lord's face was full of sympathy. I see your pain, Er Lord. Covenant hung his head to avoid Moram's gaze, made sure his left hand was securely in his pocket. 
After a moment, he said distantly, Tell me about the Creator. Ah, Moram sighed. We do not know that a Creator lives. Our only lore of such a being comes from the most shadowy reaches of our oldest legends. We know the despiser, but the Creator we do not know. Then Covenant was vaguely startled to hear Lord Tamarantha cut in. Of course we know. Ah, the folly of the young. Moram, my son, you are not yet a prophet. You must learn that kind of courage. Slowly she pulled her ancient limbs together and got to her feet, leaning on her staff for support. Her thin white hair hung in wisps about her face as she moved into the circle around the fire, muttering frailly. Oracles and prophecy are incompatible. According to Kevin's lore, only Hartthew, the Lord Fatherer, was both seer and prophet. Lesser souls lose the paradox. Why, I do not know. But when Kevin Landwaster decided in his heart to invoke the ritual of desecration, he saved the Bloodguard and the Ranihin and the Giants because he was an oracle. And because he was no prophet, he failed to see that Lord Fowl would survive, a lesser man than Beric. Of course, the Creator lives. She looked over at Variol for confirmation, and he nodded, but Covenant could not tell whether he was approving or drowsing. But Tomarantha nodded in return as if Variol had supported her. Lifting her head to the night sky and the stars, she spoke in a voice fragile with age. Of course the Creator lives, she repeated. How else? Opposites require each other. Otherwise the difference is lost, and only chaos remains. No, there can be no despite without creation. Better to ask how the Creator could have forgotten that when he made the earth. For if he did not forget, then creation and despite existed together in his one being, and he did not know it. This the elder legends tell us. Into the infinity before time was made came the Creator like a worker into his workshop. And since it is the nature of creating to desire perfection, the Creator devoted all himself to the task. First he built the arch of time, so that his creation would have a place in which to be, and for the keystone of that arch he forged the wild magic, so that time would be able to resist chaos and endure. Then within the arch he formed the earth. For ages he labored, formed and unformed, trialed and tested and rejected, and trialed and tested again so that when he was done, his creation would have no cause to reproach him. And when the earth was fair to his eye, he gave birth to the inhabitants of the earth, beings to act out in their lives his reach for perfection. And he did not neglect to give them the means to strive for perfection themselves. When he was done, he was proud as only those who create can be. Alas, he did not understand despite, or had forgotten it. He undertook his task, thinking that perfect labor was all that he required to create perfection. But when he was done, and his pride had tasted its first satisfaction, he looked closely at the earth, thinking to gratify himself with the sight, and he was dismayed. For behold, Buried deep in the earth through no ill or forming of his were banes of destruction, powers virile enough to rip his masterwork into dust. Then he understood or remembered. Perhaps he found despite itself beside him, misguiding his hand. Or perhaps he saw the harm in himself. It does not matter. He became outraged with grief and torn pride. In his fury he wrestled with despite, either within him or without, and in his fury he cast the despiser down, out of the infinity of the cosmos, onto the earth. Alas, thus the despiser was imprisoned within time. 
and thus the creator's creation became the despiser's world to torment as he chose for the very law of time the principle of power which made the arch possible worked to preserve lord fowl as we now call him that law requires that no act may be undone desecration may not be undone defilement may not be recanted it may be survived or healed but not denied therefore lord fowl has afflicted the earth and the creator cannot stop him for it was the creator's act which placed despite here in sorrow and humility the creator saw what he had done so that the plight of the earth would not be utterly without hope he sought to help his creation in indirect ways he guided the lord fatherer to the fashioning of the staff of law a weapon against despite but the very law of the earth's creation permits nothing more if the creator were to silence lord fowl that act would destroy time and then the despiser would be free in infinity again free to make whatever befoulments he desired Tamarantha paused. She had told her tale simply, without towering rhetoric or agitation or any sign of passion beyond her agedness. But for a moment her thin old voice convinced Covenant that the universe was at stake, that his own struggle was only a microcosm of a far larger conflict. During that moment he waited in suspense for what she would say next. Shortly she lowered her head, and turned her wrinkled gaze full on him. Almost whispering, she said, Thus we are come to the greatest test. The wild magic is here. With a word, our world could be riven to the core. Do not mistake, she quavered. If we cannot win this unbeliever to our cause, then the earth will end in rubble but Covenant could not tell whether her voice shook because she was old or because she was afraid. Moonrise was near. He went to his bed to avoid exposing the alteration of his ring. With his head under the blankets, he stared into the blackness, saw when the moon came up by the bloody glow which grew in his wedding band. The metal seemed more deeply stained than it had two nights ago. It held his covered gaze like a fixation, and when he finally slept, he was as exhausted as if he had been worn out under an interrogation. The next morning he managed to reach Dura's back without being attacked, and he groaned in unashamed relief. Then Prothol broke his usual habit and did not call for a halt at noon. The reason became clear when the riders topped a rise and came in sight of the Soul's Ease River. They rode down out of the harsh plains and swam their horses across the river before stopping to rest. And there again Covenant was not attacked when he set foot on the ground. But the rest of the day contrasted grimly with this inexplicable respite. A few leagues beyond the Soul's Ease, the quest came upon a waymeet for the first time. Remembering Covenant's tale of a murdered wain him, Prothor sent two bloodguard, Korik and Terrell, who warded Lord Moram, into the waymeet. The investigation was only necessary for confirmation. Even Covenant, in his straitened condition, could see the neglect, smell the disuse. The green traveler's haven had gone brown and sour. When Korik and Terrell returned, they could only report what the company had already perceived. The way meat was untended. The lords met this discovery with stern faces. Clearly, they had feared that the murder Covenant had described would lead the Wainhim to end their service. But several of the warriors groaned in shock and dismay, and Foam Follower ground his teeth. Covenant glanced around at the giant, and for a moment saw Foam Follower's face suffused with fury. The expression passed quickly, but it left Covenant feeling shaken. Unexpectedly, he sensed that the unmarred loyalty of the giants to the land was dangerous. It was quick to judge. 
So there was a gloom on the company at the end of the seventh day, a gloom which could only be aggravated by the moon, incarnadine and corrupt, as it colored the night like a conviction of disaster. Only Covenant received any relief. Once again, his private, stalking ill, left him alone. But the next day brought the riders in sight of Andalane. Their path lay along the outskirts of the hills on the southwest side, and even through the hanging gray weather, the richness of Andalane glistened like the proudest gem of the earth. It made the company feel light-boned, affected the quest like a living view of what the land had been like before the desecration. Covenant needed that quiet consolation as much as anyone, but it was denied him. While eating breakfast, he had been bitten again by the wrong in the earth. The previous day's respite seemed only to multiply the virulence of the attack. It was compact with malevolence, as if that respite had frustrated it, intensified its spite. The sensation of wrong left him foundering. During one of the rest halts, he was struck again. And that evening, while he made himself a supper of Aliantha, he was struck again. This time the wrong lashed him so viciously that he passed out for some time. When he regained consciousness, he was lying in foam follower's arms like a child. He felt vaguely that he had had convulsions. Take off your boots, foam follower urged intently. Numbness filled Covenant's head like mist, clouded his reactions. But he mustered the lucidity to ask, Why? Why, stone and sea, my friend, when you ask like that, how can I answer? Ask yourself, what do you gain by enduring such wrong? Myself, he murmured faintly. He wanted simply to recline in the giant's arms and sleep, but he fought the desire, pushed himself away from foam follower, until the giant set him on his feet by Birinair's Lillian Rill fire. For a moment he had to cling decrepitly to Foam Follower's arm to support himself, but then one of the warriors gave him his staff, and he braced himself on it, by resisting. But he knew in his bones that he was not resisting. They felt weak, as if they were melting under the strain. His boots had become a hollow symbol for an intransigence he no longer felt. Foam followers started to object, but Moram stopped him. It is his choice, the Lord said softly. After a while, Covenant fell into feverish sleep. He did not know that he was carried tenderly to bed, did not know that Moram watched over him during the night and saw the bloody stain on his wedding band. He reached some sort of crisis while he slept and awoke with the feeling that he had lost that his ability to endure had reached the final either-or of a toss which had gone against him. His throat was parched like a battleground. When he forced his eyes open, he found himself again prostrated in Foam Follower's arms. Around him the company was ready to mount for the day's ride. When he saw Covenant's eyes open, Foam Follower bent over him and said quietly, I would rather bear you in my arms and see you suffer. Our journey to Lord's Keep was easier for me than watching you now. Part of Covenant rallied to look at the giant. Foam Follower's face showed strain, but it was not the strain of exhaustion. Rather, it seemed like a pressure building up in his mind, a pressure that made the fortress of his forehead appear to bulge. Covenant stared at it dumbly for a long moment, before he realized that it was sympathy. The sight of his own pain made Foam Follower's pulse throb in his temples. Giants, Covenant breathed to himself, are they all like this? Watching that concentration of emotion, he murmured, What's a Foam Follower? The giant did not appear to notice the irrelevance of the question. A follower is a compass, he answered simply. So, foam follower, see compass. Covenant began weakly moving, trying to get out of the giant's arms. But foam follower held him, forbade him in silence to set his feet on the ground. 
Lord Moram intervened. With grim determination in his voice, he said, Set him down. Down, Covenant echoed. Several retorts passed under a phone follower's heavy brows, but he only said, Why? I have decided, Moram replied. We will not move from this place until we understand what is happening to Ur Lord Covenant. I have delayed this risk too long. Death gathers around us. Set him down. His eyes flashed dangerously. Still, Foam Follower hesitated until he saw High Lord Protho nod support for Moram. Then he turned Covenant upright and lowered him gently to the ground. For an instant, his hands rested protectively on Covenant's shoulders. Then he stepped back. No, Ur Lord, said Moram. Give me your hand. We will stand together until you feel the ill, and I feel it through you. At that, a coil of weak panic writhed in Covenant's heart. He saw himself reflected in Moram's eyes, saw himself standing lornly with what he had lost written in his face. That loss dismayed him. In that tiny, reflected face, he perceived abruptly that if the attacks continued, he would inevitably learn to enjoy the sense of horror and loathing which they gave him. He had discovered a frontier into the narcissism of revulsion, and Moram was asking him to risk crossing over. Come, the Lord urged, extending his right hand. We must understand this wrong if we are to resist it. In desperation or despair, Covenant thrust out his hand. The heels of their palms met. They gripped each other's thumbs. His two fingers felt weak, hopeless for Moram's purpose. But the Lord's grasp was sturdy. Hand to hand, like combatants, they stood there as though they were about to wrestle with some bitter ghoul. The attack came almost at once. Covenant cried out, shook as if his bones were gibbering, but he did not leap away. In the first instant, Moram's hard grip sustained him. Then the Lord threw his arm around Covenant, clasped him to his chest. The violence of Covenant's distress buffeted Moram, but he held his ground, gritted his embrace. As suddenly as it had come, the attack passed. With a groan, Covenant sagged in Moram's arms. Moram held him up until he moved and began to carry his own weight. Then, slowly, the Lord released him. For a moment, their faces appeared oddly similar. They had the same haunted expression, the same sweat-damp, hollow gaze. But shortly, Covenant gave a shuddering sigh, and Moram straightened his shoulders, and the similarity faded. I was a fool, Moram breathed. I should have known. That ill is drool rockworm, reaching out with the power of the staff to find you. He can sense your presence by the touch of your boots on the earth, because they are unlike anything made in the land. Thus he knows where you are, and so where we are. It is my guess that you were untouched the day we crossed the Soul Z's, because Drool expected us to move toward him on the river, and was searching for us on water rather than on land. But he learned his mistake and regained contact with you yesterday. The Lord paused, gave what he was saying a chance to penetrate covenant. Then he concluded, Er, Lord, for the sake of us all, for the sake of the land, you must not wear your boots. Drool already knows too much of our movements. His servants are abroad. Covenant did not respond. Moram's words seemed to sap the last of his strength. The trial had been too much for him. With a sigh, he fainted into the Lord's arms. So he did not see how carefully his boots and clothes were removed and packed in Dura's saddlebags how tenderly his limbs were washed by the lords and dressed in a robe of white samite, how sadly his ring was taken from his finger and placed on a new patch of clingor over his heart, 
how gently he was cradled in Saltheart foam follower's arms throughout the long march of that day. He lay in darkness like a sacrifice. He could hear the teeth of his leprosy devouring his flesh. There was a smell of contempt around him, insisting on his impotence. But his lips were bowed in a placid smile, a look of fondness, as if he had come at last to approve his disintegration. He continued to smile when he awoke late that night and found himself staring into the wide ghoul grin of the moon. Slowly his smile stretched into a taut grimace, a look of happiness or hatred. But then the moon was blocked out of his vision by a foam follower's great bulk. The giant's huge palms, each as large as Covenant's face, stroked his head tenderly, and in time the caress had its effect on him. His eyes lost their ghastly appearance, and his face relaxed, drifted away from torment into repose. Soon he was deep in a less perilous slumber. The next day, the tenth of the quest, he awoke calmly, as if he were held in numb truce or stasis between irreconcilable demands. A feeling of affectlessness pervaded him, as if he no longer had the heart to care about himself. Yet he was hungry. He ate a large breakfast and remembered to thank the wood and woman who seemed to have assigned herself the task of providing for him. His new apparel he accepted with a rueful shrug, noticing in silent, dim sarcasm how easily, after all, he was able to shed himself, and how the white robe flattered his gaunt form as if he were born to it. Then, dumbly, he mounted Dura. His companions watched him as if they feared he would fall. He was weaker than he had realized. He needed most of his concentration to keep his seat, but he was equal to the task. Gradually the questers began to believe that he was out of danger. Among them he rode through the sunshine and the warm spring air along the flowered marge of Andelaine, rode attenuated and careless, as if he were locked between impossibilities. Chapter 17 End in Fire that night the company camped in a narrow valley between two rocky hillsides half a league from the thick grasses of Andalane. The warriors were cheery, recovering their natural spirits after the tensions of the past few days, and they told stories and sang songs to the quiet audience of the lords and bloodguard. Though the lords did not participate, they seemed glad to listen, and several times Moram and Quan could be heard chuckling together. But Covenant did not share the ebullience of the eelman. A heavy hand of blankness held shut the lid of his emotions, and he felt separate, untouchable. Finally, he went to his bed before the warriors were done with their last song. He was awakened some time later by a hand on his shoulder. Opening his eyes, he found Foam Follower stooping beside him. The moon had nearly set. Arise, the giant whispered. The Ranihin have brought word. Wolves are hunting us. Irviles may not be far behind. We must go. Covenant blinked sleepily at the giant's benighted face for a moment. Why, won't they follow? Make haste, Erlord. Terrell, Korik, and perhaps a third of Quan's eelmen will remain here in ambush. They will scatter the pack. Come. But Covenant persisted. So what? They'll just fall back and follow again. Let me sleep. My friend, you try my patience. Arise, and I will explain. With a sigh, Covenant rolled from his blankets. While he tightened the sash of his robe, settled his sandals on his feet, and assured himself of his staff and knife, his wood helven and helper snatched up his bedding and packed it away. Then she led Dura toward him. Amid the silent urgency of the company, he mounted, then went with Foam Follower toward the center of the camp, where the lords and blood guard were already mounted. When the warriors were ready, Deer and Air extinguished the last embers of the fire, 
and climbed stiffly onto his horse. A moment later, the riders turned and fled the narrow valley, picking their way across the rough terrain by the last red light of the moon. The ground under Dura's hooves looked like blood slowly clotting, and Covenant clutched his ring to preserve it from the crimson light. Around him, the company moved in a tight suspense of silence. Every low metal clatter of sword was instantly muffled, every breath covered. The Ranihin were as noiseless as shadows, and on their broad backs the blood guards sat like statues, eternally alert and insentient. Then the moon set. Darkness was a relief, though it seemed to increase the hazard of their escape. But the whole company was surrounded, guided by the Ranihin, and the mighty horses chose a path which kept the other mounts safe between them. After two or three leagues had passed, the mood of the quest relaxed somewhat. They heard no pursuit, sensed no danger. Finally, Foam Follower gave Covenant the explanation he had promised. It is simple, the giant whispered. After scattering the wolves, Korik and Terrell will lead a trail away from ours. They would go straight into Underlane, east toward Mount Thunder, until pursuit has been confused. Then they will turn and rejoin us. Why? Covenant asked softly. Lord Moram took up the explanation. We doubt that Drool can understand our purpose. Covenant could not feel the Lord's presence as strongly as foam followers, so Moram's voice sounded disembodied in the darkness, as if the night were speaking. That impression seemed to belie his words, as if without the verification of physical presence what the Lord said was vain. Much of our quest may seem foolhardy or foolish to him. Since he holds the staff, we are mad to approach him. But if we mean to approach none the less, then our southward path is folly, for it is long, and his power grows daily. He will expect us to turn east toward him, or south toward Doom's retreat, and escape. Korik and Terrell will give Drool Scout's reason to believe that we have turned to attack. If he becomes unsure of where we are, he will not guess our true aim. He will search for us in Underlane, and will seek to strengthen his defenses in Mount Thunder. Believing that we have turned to attack him, he will also believe that we have mastered the power of your white gold. Covenant considered momentarily before asking, What's Fowl going to be doing during all this? Ah, Moram sighed, that is a question. There hangs the fate of our quest and of the land. He was silent for a long time. In my dreams, I see him laughing. Covenant winced at the memory of Fowl's crushing laughter and fell silent. So the riders crept on through the dark, trusting themselves to the instincts of the Ranihin. When dawn came, they had left their ambush for the wolves far behind. It took the company four more days of hard riding, fifteen leagues a day, to reach the Mithill River, the southern boundary of Anderlane. For sixty leagues the quest drove to the southeast without a hint of what had befallen Korik's group. In all, only eight people had left the company, but somehow without them the quest seemed shrunken and puny. The concern of the High Lord and his companions rumbled in the hoofbeats of their mounts and echoed in the silence that lay between them like an empty beer. Gone now was the gladness of eye with which the warriors had beheld Andalane, never more than a league to their left. From dawn to dusk every glance studied the eastern horizons. They saw nothing but a void in which Korik's riders had not appeared. Time and again, Foam Follower broke away from the company to trot up the nearest hill and peer into the distance. Time and again he returned panting and comfortless, and the company was left to conceive nightmares to explain Korik's absence. The unspoken consensus was 
that no number of wolves was large enough to conquer two bloodguard, mounted as they were on Hurin and Brabha of the Ranihin. No, Korik's group must have fallen into the hands of a small army of Irviles, so the company reasoned, though Prothol argued that Korik might have had to ride many leagues to find a river or other means to throw the wolves off his trail. The High Lord's words were sound, but somehow, under the incarnadine moon, they seemed hollow. In spite of them, Warhaft Quan went about his duties with the deaths of six warriors in his face. All the riders were shrouded in gloom when, near twilight on the fourth day, they reached the banks of the Mithill. Immediately on their left, as they neared the river, stood a steep hill like a boundary of Andalane. It guarded the north bank. The company could only cross its base into Andalane by riding single file along the river edge. But Prothol chose that path in preference to swimming the stiff current of the Mithill. With only two vor before him, he led the way east along the scant bank. The questers followed one by one. Soon the entire company was traversing the boundary of the hill. Spread out as they were, they were vulnerable. As the hill rose beside him, its slope became almost sheer, and its rocky crown commanded the path along the river like a fortification. The riders moved with their heads craned upward. They were keenly conscious of the hazard of their position. They were still in the traverse when they heard a hail from the hilltop. Among the rocks, a figure rose into view. It was Terrell. The riders returned his hail joyfully. Hurrying, they crossed the base of the hill and found themselves in a broad grassy valley where horses, two Ronihin and five Mustangs, grazed up away from the river. The Mustangs were exhausted. Their legs quivered weakly and their necks drooped. They barely had strength enough to eat. Five, Covenant repeated. He felt numbly sure that he had miscounted. Korik was on his way down from the hilltop. He was accompanied by five warriors. With an angry shout, Quan leaped from his horse and ran toward the bloodguard. Irin, he demanded. Where is Irin by the seven? What has happened to her? Korik did not answer until he stood with his group before High Lord Prothol. They struck Covenant as a strange combination. Five warriors full of conflicting excitement, courage, grief. And one bloodguard, as impassive as a patriarch. If Korik felt any satisfaction or pain, he did not show it. He held a bulging pack in one hand, but did not refer to it immediately. Instead, he saluted Prothol and said, Hi, Lord, you are well. Have you been pursued? We have seen no pursuit, Prothol replied gravely. That is good. It appeared to us that we were successful. Prothol nodded, and Korik began his tale. We met the wolves and sought to scatter them, but they were Krish. He made a splitting sound not easily turned aside. So we led them eastward. They would not enter Andalane. They howled on our track, but would not enter. We watched from a distance until they turned away to the north. Then we rode east. After a day and a night, we broke trail and turned south. But we came upon marauders. They were mightier than we knew. There were Irviles and Cave Whites together and with them a griffin. Korik's audience murmured with surprise and chagrin, and the bloodguard paused to utter what sounded like a long curse in the tonal native tongue of the Haru Chai. Then he continued, Irin purchased our escape, but we were driven far from our way. We reached this place only a short time before you. With a revolted flaring of his nostrils, he lifted the pack. This morning we saw a hawk over us. It flew strangely. We shot it. Reaching into the pack, he drew out the body of the bird. Above its vicious beak, 
It had only one eye, a large, mad orb centered in its forehead. It struck the company with radiated malice. The hawk was ill, incondign, a thing created by wrong for purposes of wrong, bent away from its birth by a power that dared to warp nature. The sight stuck in Covenant's throat, made him want to retch. He could hardly hear Prothal say, This is the work of the ill-earth stone. How could the staff of law perform such a crime, such an outrage? Ah, oh, my friends, this is the outcome of our enemy. Look closely. It is a mercy to take such creatures out of life. Abruptly the High Lord turned away, burdened by his new knowledge. Quan and Birenir cremated the ill-formed hawk. Soon the warriors who had gone with Korik began to talk, and a fuller picture of their past four days emerged. Attention naturally centered on the flight which had killed Iren of the Eoman. The Ranihin Brabha had first smelled danger and had given the warning to Korik. At once he had hidden his group in a thick copse to await the coming of the marauders. Listening with his ear to the ground, he had judged that they were a mixed force of unmounted Irviles and Cave Whites. Cave Whites had not the Irviles' ability to step softly, totaling no more than fifteen. So Korik had asked himself which way his service lay, to preserve his companions as defenders of the Lords, or to damage the Lords' enemies. The Bloodguard were sworn to the protection of the Lords, not of the land. He had elected to fight because he judged that his force was strong enough, considering the element of surprise, to meet both duties without loss of life. His decision had saved them. They learned later that if they had not attacked, they would have been trapped in the copse. The panic of the horses would have given away their hiding. It was a dark night after moonset, the second night after Korik's group had left the company, and the marauders were moving without lights. Even the blood guard's keen eyes discerned nothing more than the shadowy outlines of the enemy, and the wind blew between the two forces, so that the Ranihin were prevented from smelling the extent of their peril. When the marauders reached open ground, Korik signaled to his group. The warriors swept out of the copse behind him and Terrell. The Ranihin outdistanced the others at once, so Korik and Terrell had just engaged the enemy when they heard the terror screams of the horses. Wheeling around, the blood guards saw all six warriors struggling with their panicked steeds, and the griffin hovering over them. The griffin was a lion-like creature with sturdy wings that enabled it to fly for short distances. It terrified the horses, swooped at the riders. Korik and Terrell raced toward their comrades, and behind them came the marauders. The bloodguard hurled themselves at the griffin, but aloft, with its clawed feet downward, it had no vulnerable spots that they could reach without weapons. Then the marauders fell on the group. The warriors rallied to defend their horses. In the melee, Korik poised himself on Brabha's back to spring up at the griffin at the first opportunity. But when his chance came, Erin cut in front of him. Somehow she had captured a long cave whitish broadsword. The griffin snatched her up in its claws, and as it ripped her apart, she beheaded it. The next moment another party of marauders charged forward. The warriors' horses were too terrified to do anything but run, so Korik's group fled, dashed east and north with the enemy on their heels. By the time they lost the pursuit, they had been driven so far into Andalane that they had not been able to rejoin Prothal until the fourth day. Early in the evening, the reunited company set up camp. While they prepared supper, a cool wind slowly mounted out of the north. At first it felt refreshing, full of Andalanian scents. But as moonrise neared, it stiffened with a palpable wrench until it was scything straight through the valley. Covenant could taste its unnaturalness. He had felt something like it before. Like a whip, it drove dark cloud banks southward. 
as the evening wore on, no one seemed inclined towards sleep. Depression deepened in the company, as if the wind were taut with dismay. On opposite sides of the camp, Foam Follower and Quan paced out their uneasiness. Most of the warriors squatted around in dejected attitudes, fiddling aimlessly with their weapons. Viranair poked in unrelieved dissatisfaction at the fire. Prothol and Moram stood squarely in the wind, as if they were trying to read it with the nerves of their faces. And Covenant sat with his head bowed under a flurry of memories. Only Variol and Tamarantha remained ungloomed. Arm in arm, the two ancient lords sat and stared with a dreaming, drowsy look into the fire, and the firelight flickered like writing on their foreheads. Around the camp the bloodguards stood as stolid as stone. Finally, Moram voiced the feeling of the company. Something happens, something dire. This is no natural wind. Under the clouds, the eastern horizon glowed red with moonlight. From time to time, Covenant thought he saw an orange flicker in the crimson, but he could not be sure. Covertly, he studied his ring and found the same occasional orange cast under the dominating blood. But he said nothing. He was too ashamed of drool's hold on him. Still no storm came. The wind blew on, rife with red mutterings and old ice, but it brought nothing but clouds and discouragement to the company. At last, most of the warriors dozed fitfully, shivering against the cut of the wind as it bore its harvest of distress toward Doom's retreat and the southern wastes. There was no dawn. Clouds choked the rising sun. But the company was roused by a change in the wind. It dropped and warmed, swung slowly toward the west. But it did not feel healthier, only more subtle. Several of the warriors rolled out of their blankets, clutching their swords. The company ate in haste, impelled by the indefinite apprehension of the breeze. The old higher brand, Viranair, was the first to understand. While chewing a mouthful of bread, he suddenly jerked erect as if he had been slapped. Quivering with concentration, he glowered at the eastern horizon, then spat the bread to the ground. Burning, he hissed. The wind, I smell it, burning. What? I can smell burning. A tree. A tree, he wailed. Ah, they dare. For an instant the company stared at him in silence. Then Moram ejaculated, Soaring wood helven is in flames. His companion sprang into action. Shrilly, the bloodguard whistled for the Ranihan. Prothor snapped orders which Quan echoed in a raw shout. Some of the warriors sprinted to saddle the horses, while others broke camp. By the time Covenant was dressed and mounted on Dura, the quest was ready to ride. At once it galloped away eastward along the mid-hill. Before long, the horses began to give trouble. Even the freshest ones could not keep pace with the Ranihin, and the Mustangs, which had been with Korik and Andalane, had not recovered their strength. The terrain did not allow for speed. It was too uneven. Prothal sent two bloodguard ahead as scouts. But after that he was forced to move more slowly. He could not afford to leave part of his force behind. Still, he kept the pace as fast as possible. It was a frustrating ride, Covenant seemed to hear Quan grinding his teeth, but it could not be helped. Grimly, Prothal held the fresher horses back. By noon they reached the ford of the Mithil. Now they could see smoke due south of them, and the smell of burning was powerful in the air. Prothal commanded a halt to water the horses. Then the riders pushed on, urging their weakest mounts to find somewhere new resources of strength and speed. Within a few leagues, the High Lord had to slow his pace still more. The scouts had not returned. The possibility that they had been ambushed clenched his brow, and his eyes glittered as if the orbs had facets of granite. He held the riders to a walk while he sent two more blood guard ahead. These two returned before the company had covered a league. 
They reported that Soaring Woodhelven was dead. The area around it was deserted. Signs indicated that the first two scouts had ridden away to the south. Muttering, Melancholian, under his breath, Frothal led the riders forward at a canter until they reached the remains of the tree village. The destruction was a fiendish piece of work. Fire had reduced the original tree to smoldering spars less than a hundred feet tall, and the charred trunk had been split from top to bottom, leaving the two halves leaning slightly away from each other. Occasional flames still flickered near their tips, and all around the base of the tree, corpses littered the ground, as if the earth were already too full of dead to contain the population of the village. Other wood helven and bodies, unburned, were scattered generally in a line to the south across the glade. Along this southward line, a few dead cave whites sprawled in battle contortion. But near the tree there was only one body which was not human, one dead Irvile. It lay on its long back on the south of the tree, facing the split trunk, and its soot-black frame was as twisted as the iron stave still clutched in its hands. Nearby lay a heavy iron plate nearly ten feet across. The stench of dead, burned flesh appalled the surrounding glade. A memory of Woodhelven and children writhed in Covenant's guts. He felt like vomiting. The Lord seemed stupefied by the sight, stunned to realize that people under their care could be so murdered. After a moment, First Mark Tuvor reconstructed the battle for them. The folk of Soaring Woodhelven had not had a chance. Late the previous day, Tuvor judged, a large party of cave whites and Irviles, the trampling of the glade attested that the party was very large, had surrounded the tree. They had kept out of effective arrow range. Instead of assaulting the wood helven indirectly, they sent a few of their number, almost certainly Irviles, forward under cover of the iron plate. Thus protected, the Irviles set flame to the tree. A poor fire, Viranair inserted. Approaching the tree, he tapped it with his staff. A patch of charcoal fell away, showing white wood underneath. Strong fire consumes everything, he muttered. Almost they survived. This is good wood. Make the flame a little weaker, and the wood survives. Those who did, only strong enough by a little. Numbers are nothing. Strength counts, of course. A narrow chance. Or if the higher brand had known, been ready, he could have prepared the tree, given it strength. They could have lived. Ah, oh, I should have been here. They would not do this to wood in my care. Once the fire began, Tuvor explained, the attackers simply shot arrows to prevent the flames from being put out and waited for the desperate wood helvenin to attempt escape. Hence the line of unburned bodies running southward. That was the direction taken by the sortie. Then, when the fire was too great for the wood helvenin to resist further, the Irvile lore master split the tree to destroy it utterly, and to shake any survivors from its limbs. Again, Viranir spoke. He learned retribution. The fool, not master of his own power, the tree struck him down. Good wood. Even burning it was not dead. The higher brand, a brave man, struck back. And, and before the desecration, the Lillian Rill could have saved what life is left. He scowled as if he dared anyone to criticize him. No more. This I cannot. But a moment later his imperiousness faded, and he turned sadly back to gaze on the ruined tree, as if silently asking it to forgive him. Covenant did not question Tuvor's analysis. He felt too sickened by the blood-thick reek around him. But Foam Follower did not seem affected in that way. Dully, he asserted, this is not drool's doing. No cave white is the master of such strategy. Winds and clouds to disguise the signs of attack 
should any help be near. Iron protection carried here from who knows what distance. An attack with so little waste of resource. No, the hand of Soul Crusher is here from first to last. Stone and sea. Without warning, his voice caught, and he turned away, groaning his giantish plain song to steady himself. Into the silence, Quan asked, But why here? There was an edge like panic in his voice. Why attack this place? Something in Quan's tone, some hint of hysteria among brave but inexperienced, appalled young warriors, called Prothal back from the wilderland where his thoughts wandered. Responding to Quan's emotion rather than to his question, the High Lord said sternly, Warhaft Quan, there is much work to be done. The horses will rest, but we must work. Burial must be dug for the dead. After their last ordeal, it would be unfitting to set them to the pyre. Put your eomen to the task. Dig graves in the south glade, there. He indicated a spread of grass about a hundred feet from the riven tree. We, he referred to his fellow lords, we will carry the dead to their graves. Thome follower interrupted his plain song. No, I will carry. Let me show my respect. Very well, Prothol replied. We will prepare food and consider our situation. With a nod, he sent Quan to give orders to the eelman. Then, turning to Tuvor, he asked what sentries be posted. Tuvor observed that eight blood guard were not enough to watch every possible approach to an open area as large as the glade. But if he sent the Ronihin roaming separately around the bordering hills, he might not need to call on the eelman for assistance. After a momentary pause, the first mark asked what should be done about the missing scouts. We will wait, Prothal responded heavily. Tuvor nodded and moved away to communicate with the Ronihin. They stood in a group nearby, looking with hot eyes at the burned bodies around the tree. When Tuvor joined them, they clustered about him as if eager to do whatever he asked, and a moment later they charged out of the glade, scattering in all directions. The lords dismounted, unpacked the sacks of food, and set about preparing a meal on a small Lillian rill fire Viranair built for them. Warriors took all the horses upwind from the tree, unsaddled and tethered them. Then the eomen went to begin digging. Taking care not to step on any of the dead, Foam Follower moved toward the tree, reached the iron plate. It was immensely heavy, but he lifted it and carried it beyond the ring of bodies. There he began gently placing corpses on the plate, using it as a sled to move the bodies to their graves. Knots of emotion jumped and bunched across his buttressed forehead, and his eyes flared with a dangerous enthusiasm. For a while, Covenant was the only member of the company without an assigned task. The fact disturbed him. The stench of the dead, Barodicus included somewhere among them, he thought achingly. Barodicus and Laura and children, children, made him remember soaring wood helven as he had left it days ago, tall and proud, lush with the life of a fair people. He needed something to do to defend himself. As he scanned the company, he noticed that the warriors lacked digging tools. They had brought few picks and shovels with them. Most of them were trying to dig with their hands or their swords. He walked over to the tree. Scattered around the trunk were many burned branches, some of them still solid in the core. Though he had to pick his way among the dead, though the close sight of all that flesh, smeared like moldering wax over charred bones, hurt his guts, he gathered branches that he could not break across his knee. These he carried away from the tree, then used his stone downer knife to scrape them clean, and cut them into stakes. The work blackened his hands, his white robe. 
and the knife twisted awkwardly in his half-fingered grip, but he persisted. The stakes he gave to the warriors, and with them they were able to dig faster. Instead of individual graves, they dug trenches, each deep and long enough to hold a dozen or more of the dead. Using covenant stakes, the warriors began to finish their graves faster than foam follower could fill them. Late in the afternoon, Prothal called the company to eat. By that time, nearly half the bodies had been buried. No one felt like consuming food with their lungs full of acrid air and their eyes sore of tormented flesh. But the High Lord insisted. Covenant found this strange until he tasted the food. The lords had prepared a stew unlike anything he had eaten in the land. Its savor quickened his hunger, and when he swallowed it, it soothed his distress. It was the first meal he had had since the previous day, and he surprised himself by eating ravenously. Most of the warriors were done eating, and the sun was about to set when their attention was snatched erect by a distant hail. The southmost sentry answered, and a moment later the two missing blood guard came galloping into the glade. Their Ronihin were soaked with sweat. They brought two people with them, a woman and a boy child the size of a four-year-old, both wood Heldenen, both marked as if they had survived a battle. The tale of the scouts was quickly told. They had reached the deserted glade and had found the southward trail of the wood Heldenen's attempted escape, and they had seen some evidence that all the people might not have been killed. Since the enemy had gone, so there was no compelling need to ride back to warn the lords, they had decided to search for survivors. They had erased the signs so that any returning marauders might not find them, and had ridden south. Early in the afternoon they found the woman and child fleeing madly without thought or caution. Both appeared injured. The child gave no sign of awareness at all, and the woman vacillated between lucidity and incoherence. She accepted the blood guard as friends, but was unable to tell them anything. However, in a lucid moment, she insisted that an unfettered healer lived a league or two away. Hoping to gain knowledge from the woman, the scouts took her to the cave of the healer, but the cave was empty, and appeared to have been empty for many days. So the scouts brought the two survivors back to soaring Woodhelven. The two stood before the lords, the woman clutching the child's unresponsive hand. The boy gazed in curiously about him, but did not notice faces or react to voices. When his hand slipped from the woman's, his arm fell limply to his side. He neither resisted nor complied when she snatched it up again. His unfocused eyes seemed preternaturally dark, as if they were full of black blood. The sight of him jabbed Covenant. The boy could have been the future of his own son, Roger, the son of whom he had been dispossessed, reft, as if even his fatherhood had been abrogated by leprosy. Children, foul, he panted. Children! As if in oblique answer to his thoughts, the woman suddenly said, He is Piaton, son of Soranel. He likes the horses. It is true, one of the scouts responded. He rode before me and stroked the Ronihin's neck. But Covenant was not listening. He was looking at the woman. Confusedly, he sorted through the battle wreckage of her face, the cuts and burns and grime and bruises. Then he said hesitantly, Laura? The sun was setting, but there was no sunset. Clouds blanked the horizon, and a short twilight was turning rapidly into night. But as the sun fell, the air became thicker and more sultry, as if the darkness were sweating in apprehension. Yes, I know you, the woman said in a flagellated voice. You are Thomas Covenant, unbeliever, and white gold wielder, in the semblance of Beric Halfhand. Jehannam spoke truth. Great evil has come, she articulated with extreme care, 
as if she were trying to balance her words on the edge of a sword. I am Laura, daughter of Anamar, of the Heers of Soaring Woodhelven. Our scouts must have been slain. We had no warning. Be but as she tried to say the words, her balance failed, and she collapsed into a hoarse, repeating moan. Un, 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 un. As if the connection between her brain and her throat broke, leaving her struggling frantically with her inability to speak. Her eyes burned with furious concentration, and her head shook as she tried to form words. But nothing came between her juddering lips except, mm, mm, mm. The bloodguard scout said, So she was when we found her. At one moment she can speak, a moment later she cannot. Hearing this, Laura clenched herself violently and pushed down her hysteria, rejecting what the scout said. I am Laura, she repeated. Laura, of the Heers of Soaring Woodhelven. Our scouts must have been slain. I am Laura. I am Laura, she insisted. Beware. Again her voice broke into moaning. <laughs> Her panic mounted. Be, uh, 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 be, uh, uh. I am Laura. You are the Lords. You must let, uh, uh, amp, uh, uh, uh. As she fought, Covenant glanced around the company. Everyone was staring intently at Laura, and Variol and Tamarantha had tears in their eyes. Somebody do something, he muttered painfully. Somebody. Abruptly, Laura seemed to collapse. Clutching her throat with her free hand, she shrieked, You must hear me, and started to fall. As her knees gave way, Prothal stepped forward and caught her. With fierce strength, he gripped her upper arms and held her erect before him. Stop, he commanded. Stop. Do not speak any more. Listen, and use your head to answer me. A look of hope flared across Laura's eyes, and she relaxed until Prothol set her on her feet. Then she regained the child's hand. Now, the High Lord said levelly, staring deep into her ravaged eyes, you are not mad, your mind is clear. Something has been done to you. Laura nodded eagerly. Yes. When your people attempted to escape, you were captured. She nodded. Yes. You and the child. Yes. And something was done to him as well? Yes. Do you know what it was? She shook her head. No. Was the same done to you both? No. Well, Prothol sighed. Both were captured instead of slain, and the Irvile lore master afflicted you. Laura nodded. Yes shuddering. Damaged you? Yes. Caused the difficulty that you now have when you speak? Yes. Now your ability to speak comes and goes? No. No? Prothal paused to consider for a moment, and Covenant interjected. Hellfire, get her to write it down. Laura shook her head, raised her free hand. It trembled uncontrollably. Abruptly, Prothal said, Then there are certain things that you cannot say. Yes. There is something that the attackers do not wish you to speak. Yes. Then, the High Lord hesitated, as if he could hardly believe his thoughts. Then the attackers knew that you would be found by us or others who came too late to the aid of Soaring Woodhelven. Yes. Therefore you fled south, toward Banyanwood Helven and the southern Stone Downs. She nodded, but her manner seemed to indicate that he had missed the point. Observing her, he muttered, By the seven, this cannot do. Such questioning requires time, and my heart tells me we have little. What has been done to the boy? How could the attackers know that we, or anyone, would come this way? What knowledge could she have? 
knowledge that an ervile loremaster would fear to have told. No, we must find other means. At the edge of his sight, Covenant saw Bariol and Tamarantha setting out their blankets near the campfire. Their action startled him away from Laura for a moment. Their eyes held a sad and curiously secret look. He could not fathom it, but for some reason it reminded him that they had known what Prothal's decision for the quest would be before that decision was made. High Lord, said Birinair stiffly. Concentrating on Laura, Prothal replied, Yes. That young whelp of a gravelingus, Torm, gave me a Radomerol gift. I almost thought he mocked me, laughed because I am not a puppy like himself. It was Hurtlom. Hurtlom? Prothol echoed in surprise. You have some? Have it, of course. No fool, you know, I keep it moist. Torm tried to teach me, as if I knew nothing. Mastering his impatience, Prothol said, Please bring it. A moment later, Birinair handed to the High Lord a small stoneware pot full of the damp, glittering clay, Hurtlom. Watch out, Covenant murmured with complex memories in his voice. It'll put her to sleep. But Prothol did not hesitate. In darkness, lit only by Birinair's Lillian Rill fire and the last coals of the riven tree, he scooped out some of the Hurtlom. Its golden flecks caught the firelight and gleamed. Tenderly, he spread the mud across Laura's forehead, cheeks, and throat. Covenant was marginally aware that Lord Moram no longer attended Prothol and Laura. He had joined Bariol and Tamarantha and appeared to be arguing with them. They lay side by side on their backs, holding hands, and he stood over them as if he were trying to ward off a shadow, but they were unmoved. Through his protests, Tamarantha said softly, It is better thus, my son. And Vario murmured, Poor Laura, this is all we can do. Covenant snapped a look around the company. The warrior seemed entranced by the questioning of the here, but foam followers' cavernous eyes flicked without specific focus over the glade as if they were weaving dangerous visions. Covenant turned back toward Laura, with an ominous chill scrabbling along his spine. The first touch of the hurt loam only multiplied her distress. Her face tightened in torment, and a rictus, like a foretaste of death, stretched her lips into a soundless scream. But then a harsh convulsion shook her, and the crisis passed. She fell to her knees and wept with relief, as if a knife had been removed from her mind. Prothol knelt beside her, and clasped her in the solace of his arms, waiting without a word for her self-control to return. She needed a moment to put aside her weeping. Then she snatched herself up, crying, Flee! You must flee! This is an ambush! You are trapped! But her warning came too late. At the same moment, Tuvor returned from his lookout at a run, followed almost at once by the other blood guard. Prepare for attack, the first mark said flatly. We are surrounded. The Ranihin were cut off and could not warn us. There will be battle. We have only time to prepare. Covenant could not grasp the immediacy of what he heard. Protho barked orders. The camp began to clear. Warriors and blood guard dove into the still empty trenches, hid themselves in the hollow base of the tree. Leave the horses, Tuvor commanded. The Ranihin will break through to protect them if it is possible. Prothol consigned Laura and the child to Foam Follower, who placed them alone in a grave and covered them with the iron plate. Then Prothol and Moram jumped together into the southmost trench. But Covenant stood where he was. Vaguely, he watched Birinair reduce the campfire to its barest embers then position himself against the burned trunk of the tree. Covenant needed time to comprehend what had been done to Laura. Her plight numbed him. First, she had been given knowledge which might have saved the lords. 
and then she had been made unable to communicate that knowledge. And her struggles to give the warning only ensured her failure by guaranteeing that the lords would attempt to understand her rather than ride away. Yet what had been done to her was unnecessary, gratuitous. The trap would have succeeded without it. In every facet of her misery, Covenant could hear Lord Fowle laughing. Bonor's touch on his shoulder jarred him. The blood guard said as evenly as if he were announcing the time of day, Come, Er Lord, you must conceal yourself. It is necessary. Necessary. Silently, Covenant began to shout, Do you know what he did to her? But when he turned, he saw Variol and Tamarantha still lying by the last embers of the fire, protected by only two bloodguard. What? he gaped. They'll be killed. At the same time, another part of his brain insisted, He's doing the same thing to me, exactly the same thing. To Bonor, he groaned, Don't touch me. Hellfire and bloody damnation. Aren't you ever going to learn? Without hesitation, Bonor lifted Covenant, swung him around, and dropped him into one of the trenches. There was hardly room for him. Foam follower filled the rest of the grave, squatting to keep his head down. But Bonor squeezed into the trench after Covenant, positioned himself with his arms free over the unbeliever. Then a silence full of the aches and quavers of fear fell over the camp. At last, the apprehension of the attack caught up with Covenant. His heart lurched, sweat bled from his forehead, his nerves shrilled as if they had been laid bare. A gray nausea that filled his throat like dirt almost made him gag. He tried to swallow it away and could not. No, he panted, not like this. I will not. Exactly the same. Exactly what happened to Laura. A hungry shriek ripped the air. After it came the tramp of approach. Covenant risked a glance over the rim of the grave and saw the glade surrounded by black forms and hot lava eyes. They moved slowly, giving the encamped figures a chance to taste their own end. And flapping heavily overhead, just behind the advancing line, was the dark shape of a beast. Covenant recoiled. In fear, he watched the attack like an outcast from a distance. As the cave whites and Irviles contracted their ring around the glade, centered their attack on the helpless campsite, the wall of them thickened, reducing at every step the chance that the company might be able to break through their ranks. Slowly, their approach became louder. They stamped the ground as if they were trying to crush the grass, and a low wind of mutterings became audible. Soft snarls, hissings through clenched teeth, gurgling, gleeful salivations, blew over the graves like an exhalation littered with the wreckage of mangled lives. The cave whites gasped like lunatics tortured into a love of killing. The nasal sensing of the Irviles sibilated wetly, and behind the other sounds, terrible in their quietness, came the wings of a griffin drumming a dirge. The tethered horses began to scream. The stark terror of the sound pulled Covenant up, and he looked long enough to see that the Mustangs were not harmed. The tightening ring parted to bypass them, and a few cave whites dropped from the attack to unfetter them, lead them away. The horses fought hysterically, but the strength of the cave whites mastered them. Then the attackers were less than a hundred feet from the graves. Covenant cowered down as far as he could. He hardly dared to breathe. The whole company was helpless in the trenches. The next moment, a howl went up among the attackers. Several cave whites cried, Only five? All those horses? Cheated! In rage at the puny number of their prey, nearly a third of them broke ranks and charged the campfire. Instantly the company seized its chance. The Ranihin whinnied. Their combined call throbbed in the air like the shout of trumpets. Together they thundered out of the east, 
toward the captured horses. Giranair stepped away from the ribbon tree. With a full swing of his staff and a cry, he struck the burned wood. The tree erupted in flames, threw dazzling light at the attackers. Prothol and Moram sprang together from the southmost trench. Their staffs flared with blue lord's fire. Crying, Melancurian, they drove their power against the creatures. The nearest cave whites and Irviles retreated in fear from the flames. Warriors and blood guard leaped out of the graves, sprinted from the hollow of the tree, and behind them came the towering form of Saltheart Foam Follower, shouting a rare giantish war call. With cries of fear and rage, fire, swift blows, and clashing weapons, the battle began. The company was outnumbered ten to one. Jerking his gaze from scene to scene, Covenant saw how the fighting commenced. The blood guard deployed themselves instantly, two to defend each lord, with one standing by Birenair and another, Bonner, warding the trench where Covenant stood. The warriors rapidly formed groups of five. Guarding each other's backs, they strove to cut their way in and out of the line of the attackers. Moram charged around the fight, trying to find the commanders or lore masters of the enemy. Prothal stood in the center of the battle to give the company a rallying point. He shouted warnings and orders about him. But Foam Follower fought alone. He rampaged through the attack like a berserker, pounding with his fists, kicking, throwing anything within reach. His war call turned into one long, piercing snarl of fury. His huge strides kept him in the thick of the fighting. At first he looked powerful enough to handle the entire host alone, but soon the great strength of the cave whites made itself felt. They jumped at him in bunches. Four of them were able to bring him down. He was up again in an instant, flinging bodies about him like dolls. But it was clear that if enough cave whites attacked him together, he would be lost. Variol and Tamarantha were in no less danger. They lay motionless under the onslaught, and their four blood guards strove extravagantly to preserve them. Some of the attackers risked arrows. The blood guard knocked the shafts aside with the backs of their hands. Spears followed, and then the cave whites charged with swords and staves. Weaponless and unaided, the blood guard fought back with speed, balance, skill, with perfectly placed kicks and blows. They seemed impossibly successful. Soon a small ring of dead and unconscious cave whites encircled the two lords. But like foam follower, they were vulnerable, would have to be vulnerable, to a concerted assault. At Prothal's order, one group of warriors moved to help the four blood guard. Covenant looked away. He found Moram waging a weird contest with thirty or forty Irviles. All the Irviles in the attack, they were few in proportion to the cave whites, had formed a fighting wedge behind their tallest member, their lore master, a wedge which allowed them to focus their whole power in the leader. The lore master wielded a scimitar with a flaming blade, and against it, Moram opposed his fiery staff. The clashing of power showered hot sparks that dazzled and singed the air. Then a swirl of battle swept toward Covenant's trench. Figures leaped over him. Bonor fought like a dervish to ward off spears. A moment later, a warrior came to his aid. She was the wood helvenan who had assigned herself to Covenant. She and Bonor struggled to keep him alive. He clutched his hands to his chest, as if to protect his ring. His fingers unconsciously took hold of the metal. Through the dark flash of legs, he got a glimpse of Prothal, saw that the High Lord was under attack. Using his blazing staff like a lance, he strove with the griffin. The beast's wings almost buffeted him from his feet, but he kept his position and jabbed his blue fire upward. But astride the griffin sat another Irvile lore master. The creature used a black stave, 
to block the High Lord's thrusts. As Covenant watched, the desperation of the conflict mounted. Figures fell and rose and fell again. Blood spattered down on him. Across the glade, Foam Follower heaved to his feet from under a horde of cave whites and was instantly deluged. Prothal fell to one knee under the combined force of his assailants. The Irvile Wedge drove Moram steadily backward. The two blood guard with him were hard pressed to protect his back. Covenant's throat felt choked with sand. Already two warriors had fallen among the cave whites around Variol and Tamarantha. At one instant, a blood guard found himself and Tamarantha behind him, attacked simultaneously by three cave whites with spears. The blood guard broke the first spear with a chop of his hand and leaped high over the second to kick its wielder in the face. But even his great speed was not swift enough. The third cave white caught him by the arm. Grappling at once, the first latched his long fingers onto the blood guard's ankle. The two stretched their captive between them, and their companion jabbed his spear at the blood guard's belly. Covenant watched, transfixed with helplessness, as the blood guard strained against the cave whites, pulled them close enough together to wrench himself out of the path of the spear. Its tip scored his back. The next instant, he groined both his captors. They dropped him, staggered back. He hit the ground and rolled. But the middle cave white caught him with a kick so hard that it flung him away from Tamarantha. Yelling his triumph, the cave white lunged forward with his spear raised high in both hands to impale the recumbent lord. Tamarantha! Her peril overwhelmed Covenant's fear. Without thinking, he vaulted from the safety of his trench and started toward her. She was so old and frail that he could not restrain himself. The wood and yelled, Down! His sudden appearance above ground distracted her, gave her opponents a target. As a result, she missed a parry, and a sword thrust opened her side. But Covenant did not see her. He was already running toward Tamarantha, and already too late. The cave white drove his spear downward. At the last instant, the blood guard saved Tamarantha by diving across her and catching the spear in his own back. Covenant hurled himself at the cave white and tried to stab it with his stone knife. The blade twisted in his half hand. He only managed to scratch the creature's shoulder blade. The knife fell from his wrenched fingers. The cave white whirled and struck him to the ground with a slap. The blow stunned him for a moment, but Bonor rescued him by attacking the creature. The cave white countered as if elevated, inspired by his success against the dead blood guard. He shrugged off Bonor's blows, caught him in his long, strong arms, and began to squeeze. Bonor struck at the cave white's ears and eyes, but the maddened creature only tightened his grip. Inchoate rage roared in Covenant's ears. Still half-dazed, he stumbled toward Tamarantha's still form and snatched her staff from her side. She made no movement, and he asked no permission. Turning, he wheeled the staff wildly about his head and brought it down with all his strength on the back of the cave-white skull. White and crimson power flashed in a silent explosion. The cave white fell instantly dead. The ignition blinded Covenant for a moment, but he recognized the sick red hue of the flare. As his eyes cleared, he gaped at his hands, at his ring. He could not remember having removed it from the clingor on his chest, but it hung on his wedding finger and throbbed redly under the influence of the cloud-locked moon. Another cave white loomed out of the battle at him. Instinctively, he hacked with the staff at the creature. It collapsed in a bright flash that was entirely crimson. At the sight, his old fury erupted. His mind went blank with violence. Howling, foul, as if the despiser were there before him, he charged into the thick of the fray. Flailing about him like madness, 
he struck down another cave white, and another, and another. But he did not watch where he was going. After the third blow, he fell into one of the trenches. Then, for a long time, he lay in the grave like a dead man. When he finally climbed to his feet, he was trembling with revulsion. Above him, the battle burned feverishly. He could not judge how many of the attackers had been killed or disabled, but some turning point had been reached. The company had changed its tactics. Prothal fled from the griffin to foam followers' aid, and when the giant regained his feet, he turned, dripping blood, to fight the griffin while Prothal joined Moram against the Irviles. Bonor held himself over Covenant, but Quan marshaled the survivors of his eomen to make a stand around Vario and Tamarantha. A moment later, the Ranihin gave a ringing call. Having freed the horses, they charged into the battle, and as their hooves and teeth crashed among the cave whites, Prothal and Moram together swung their flaming staffs to block the lore master's downstroke. Its hot scimitar shattered into fragments of lava, and the backlash of power felled the Irvile itself. Instantly the creatures shifted their wedge to present a new leader, but their strongest had fallen, and they began to give way. On the other side of the battle, Foam Follower caught the griffin by surprise. The beast was harrying the warriors around Variol and Tamarantha. With a roar, Foam Follower sprang into the air and wrapped his arms in a death hug around the body of the griffin. His weight bore it to the ground. They rolled and struggled on the blood-slick grass. The riding Irvile was thrown off, and Quan beheaded it before it could raise its staff. The griffin yowled hideously with rage and pain, tried to twist in Foam Follower's grip to reach him with its claws and fangs, but he squeezed it with all his might, silently braced himself against its thrashings, and strove to kill it before it was able to turn and rend him. For the most part, he succeeded. He exerted a furious jerk of pressure and heard bones retort loudly in the beast's back. The griffin spat a final scream and died. For a moment, he rested beside its body, panting hoarsely. Then he lumbered to his feet. His forehead had been clawed open to the bone. But he did not stop. Dashing blood from his eyes, he ran and threw himself full length onto the tight wedge of the Irviles. Their formation crumbled under the impact. At once, the Irviles chose to flee. Before Foam Follower could get to his feet, they were gone, vanished into the darkness. Their defection seemed to drain the Cave White's mad courage. The gangrel creatures were no longer able to brave the Lord's fire. Panic spread among them from the brandished staffs, flash firing in the sudden tinder of their hearts. A cry of failure broke through the attack. The cave whites began to run. Howling their dismay, they scattered away from the blazing tree. They ran with grotesque jerkings of their knuckle joints, but their strength and length of limb gave them speed. In moments, the last of them had fled the glade. Foam Follower charged after them. Yelling giantish curses, he chased the fleers as if he meant to crush them all underfoot. Swiftly, he disappeared into the darkness, and soon he could no longer be heard. But from time to time, there came faint screams through the night as he caught escaping cave whites. Tuvor asked Prothal if some of the blood guard should join Foam Follower but the High Lord shook his head. We have done enough, he panted. Remember the oath of peace. For a time of exhaustion and relief, the company stood in silence, underscored by the gasp of their breathing and the groans of the disabled cave whites. No one moved. To Covenant's ears, the silence sounded like a prayer. Unsteadily, he pulled himself out of the trench. Looking about him with glazed eyes, he took the toll of the battle. Cave whites sprawled around the camp in twisted heaps, 
nearly a hundred of them, dead, dying, and unconscious, and their blood lay everywhere like a dew of death. There were ten Irviles dead. Five warriors would not ride again with their eomen, and none of Quan's command had escaped injury. But of the blood guard, only one had fallen. With a groan that belied his words, High Lord Prothal said, We are fortunate. Fortunate? Covenant echoed in vague disbelief. We are fortunate. An accent of anger emphasized the old roomy rattle of Prothal's voice. Consider that we might all have died. Consider such an attack during the full of the moon. Consider that while Drool's thoughts are turned here, he is not multiplying defenses in Mount Thunder. We have paid, his voice choked for a moment, paid but little for our lives and hope. Covenant did not reply for a moment. Images of violence dizzied him. All the wood helvenen were dead. Cave whites, Irviles, the warrior who had chosen to watch over him. He did not even know her name. Foam follower had killed. He himself had killed five. Five. He was trembling, but he needed to speak, needed to defend himself. He was sick with horror. Foam followers right, he rasped hoarsely. This is Fowl's doing. No one appeared to hear him. The blood guard went to the Ranihin and brought their fallen comrade's mount close to the fire. Lifting the man gently, they set him on the Ranihin's back and bound him in place with Klingor thongs. Then together they gave a silent salute, and the Ranihin galloped away, bearing its dead rider toward the western mountains and guards' gap, home. Fowl planned the whole thing. When the Ranihin had vanished into the night, some of the blood guard tended the injuries of their mounts, while others resumed their sentry duty. Meanwhile, the warriors began moving among the cave whites, finding the living among the dead. All that were not mortally wounded were dragged to their feet and chased away from the camp. The rest were piled on the north side of the tree for a pyre. It means two things, Covenant strove to master the quaver in his voice. It's the same thing that he's doing to me. It's a lesson, like what happened to Laura. Fowl is telling us what he's doing to us because he's sure that knowing won't help. He wants to milk us for all the despair we're worth. With the aid of two warriors, Prothor released Laura and Pietan from their tomb. Laura looked exhausted to the limit. She was practically prostrate on her feet. But little Pietan ran his hands over the blood-wet grass, then licked his fingers. Covenant turned away with a groan. The other thing is that Fowl really wants us to get at Drool, to die or not. He tricked Drool into this attack, so that he wouldn't be busy defending himself. So Fowl must know what we're doing, even if Drool doesn't. Prothal seemed troubled by the occasional distant screams, but Moram did not notice them. While the rest of the company set about their tasks, the Lord went and knelt beside Variol and Tamarantha. He bent over his parents, and under his red-stained robe his body was rigid. I tell you, this is all part of Fowl's plan. Hellfire, aren't you listening to me? Abruptly, Moram stood and faced Covenant. He moved as if he were about to hurl a curse at Covenant's head. But his eyes bled with tears, and his voice wept as he said, They are dead. Variol and Tamarantha, my parents, father and mother of me, body and soul. Covenant could see the hue of death on their old skin. It cannot be, one of the warriors cried. I saw no weapon touch them. They were kept by the blood guard. Prothal hastened to examine the two lords. He touched their hearts and heads, then sagged and sighed, nevertheless. Both Variol and Tamarantha were smiling. The warriors stopped what they were doing. 
In silence, the Ilioman put aside its own fatigue and grief to stand bowed in respect before Moram and his dead. Stooping, Moram lifted both Variol and Tamarantha in his arms. Their thin bones were light in his embrace, as if they had lost the weight of mortality. On his cheeks, tears gleamed orangely, but his shoulders were steady, unsob shaken to uphold his parents. Covenant's mind was beclouded. He wandered in mist, and his words were wind-torn from him. Do you mean to tell me that we, that I, we, for a couple of corpses? Moram showed no sign of having heard, but a scowl passed like a spasm across Prothal's face, and Quan stepped to the unbeliever's side at once, gripped his elbow, whispered into his ear, If you speak again, I will break your arm. Don't touch me, Covenant returned. But his voice was forceless. He submitted, swirling in lost fog. Around him the company took on an attitude of ritual. Leaving his staff with one of the warriors, High Lord Prothol retrieved the staffs of the dead lords and held them like an offering across his arms. And Moram turned toward the blaze of the tree, with Variol and Tamarantha clasped erect in his embrace. The silence quivered painfully. After a long moment, he began to sing. His rough song sighed like a river, and he sang hardly louder than the flow of water between quiet banks. Death reaps the beauty of the world, Bundles old crops to hasten you. Be still, heart. Hold peace. Growing is better than decay. I hear the blade which severs life from life. Be still, peace. Hold, heart. Death is passing on, the making way of life and time for life. Hate dying and killing, not death. Be still, heart. Make no expostulation. Hold peace and grief and be still. As he finished, his shoulders lurched as if unable to bear their burden without giving at least one sob to the dead. Ah, Creator, he cried in a voice full of bereavement, how can I honor them? I am stricken at heart and consumed with the work that I must do. You must honor them for they have honored you. At the edge of the firelight, the Ranihin, Hineru, gave a whinny like a cry of grief. The great roan mare reared and pawed the air with her forelegs, then whirled and galloped away eastward. Then Moram murmured again, Be still, heart. Make no expostulation. Hold peace and grief and be still. Gently he laid Variol on the grass and lifted Tamarantha in both arms. Calling hoarsely, Hail, he placed her into the cleft of the burning tree, and before the flames could blacken her age-etched skin, he lifted Variol and set him beside her, calling again, Hail. Their shared smile could be seen for a moment before the blaze obscured it, so they lay together in consummation. Already dead, Covenant groaned. That blood guard was killed. Oh, Moram! In his confusion, he could not distinguish between grief and anger. His eyes now dry, Moram turned to the company, and his gaze seemed to focus on Covenant. My friends, be still at heart, he said comfortingly. Hold peace for all your grief. Variol and Tamarantha are ended. Who could deny them? They knew the time of their death. They read the close of their lives in the ashes of soaring Woodhelven and were glad to serve us with their last sleep. They chose to draw the attack upon themselves so that we might live. Who will say that the challenge which they met was not great? Remember the oath and hold peace. Together, the eoman made the heart-opening salute of farewell 
arms spread wide as if uncovering their hearts to the dead. Then Quan cried, Hail! and led his warriors back to the work of piling cave whites and burying wood helvenen. After the eelmen had left, High Lord Prothal said to Moram, Lord Variol's staff, from father to son, take it. If we survive this quest to reach a time of peace, master it. It has been the staff of a high lord. Moram accepted it with a bow. Prothal paused for a moment, irresolute, then turned to Covenant. You have used Lord Tamarantha's staff. Take it for use again. You will find it readier to aid your ring than your higher brand staff. The Lillian Rill work in other ways than the Lord's, and you are Ur Lord Thomas Covenant. Remembering the red blaze which had raged out of that wood to kill and kill, Covenant said, Burn it. A touch of danger tightened Moram's glance, but Prothal shrugged gently, took Lord Tamarantha's staff to the fire, and placed it into the cleft of the tree. For an instant, the metal ends of the staff shone as if they were made of verdigris. Then Moram cried, Where the tree? Quickly the company moved away from the fiery spars. The staff gave a sharp report, like the bursting of bonds. Blue flame detonated in the cleft, and the riven tree dropped straight to the ground in fragments, collapsing as if its core had been finally killed. The heap of wood burned furiously. From a distance, Covenant heard Virenair snort, the unbelievers doing, as if that were a calumny. Don't touch me, he muttered to himself. He was afraid to think. Around him, darkness lurked like vulture wings made of midnight. Horrors threatened. He felt ghoul-begotten. He could not bear the bloodiness of his ring, could not bear what he had become. He searched about him as if he were looking for a fight. Unexpectedly, Saltheart Foam Follower returned. He shambled out of the night like a massacre, metaphored in flesh, an icon of slaughter. He was everywhere smeared in blood, and much of it was his own. The wound on his forehead covered his face with a dark, wet sheen, and through the stain his deep eyes looked sated and miserable. Shreds of cave-white flesh still clung to his fingers. Piaden pointed at the giant and twisted his lips in a grin that showed his teeth. At once Laura grabbed his hand and pulled him away to a bed which the warriors had made for them. Prothal and Moram moved solicitously toward the giant, but he pushed past them to the fire. He knelt near the blaze as if his soul needed warming, and his groan as he sank to his knees sounded like a rock cracking. Covenant saw his chance, approached the giant. Foam Follower's manifest pain brought his confused, angry grief to a pitch that demanded utterance. He himself had killed five cave whites. Five. His ring was full of blood. Well, he snarled, that must have been fun. I hope you enjoyed it. From the other side of the camp, Quan hissed threateningly. Prothal moved to Covenant's side, said softly, Do not torment him, please. He is a giant. This is the Kaamora, the fire of grief. Has there not been enough pain this night? I killed five cave whites, Covenant cried in bereft fury. But Foam Follower was speaking as if entranced by the fire, and unable to hear them. His voice had a keening sound. He knelt before the fire in an attitude of lament. Ah, brothers and sisters, did you behold me? Did you see, my people? We have come to this. Giants, I am not alone. I feel you in me, your will in mine. You would not have done differently, not felt other than I felt, not grieved apart from my grief. This is the result. Stone and sea, we are diminished. Lost home and weak seed have made us less than we were. 
Do we remain faithful even now? Ah, faithful. My people, my people, if steadfastness leads to this, look upon me. Do you find me admirable? I stink of hate and unnecessary death. A chill blew through his words. Tilting back his head, he began a low chant. His threnody went on until Covenant felt driven to the brink of screaming. He wanted to hug or kick the giant to make him cease. His fingers itched with mounting frenzy. Stop, he moaned. I can't stand it. A moment later, Foam Follower bowed his head and fell silent. He remained still for a long time, as if he were preparing himself. Then he asked flatly, Who has been lost? Very few, Frothal answered. We were fortunate. Your valor served us well. Who? Foam Follower ached. With a sigh, Frothal named the five warriors, the Blood Guard, Variol, and Tamarantha. Stone and sea, the giant cried. With a convulsion of his shoulders, he thrust his hands into the fire. The warriors gasped. Frothal stiffened at Covenant's side. But this was the giantish Kaamora, and no one dared interfere. Foam Follower's face stretched in agony, but he held himself still. His eyes seemed to bulge in their sockets, yet he kept his hands in the fire as if the blaze could heal, or at least sear, the blood on them, cauterize, if it could not assuage, the stain of shed life. But his pain showed in his forehead. The hard heart pulse of hurt broke the crust on his wound. New blood dripped around his eyes and down his cheeks into his beard. Panting, hell fire, hell fire, Covenant pushed away from Prothal. Stiffly, he went close to the kneeling giant. With a fierce effort that made him sound caustic in spite of his intent, he said, Now somebody really ought to laugh at you. His jutting head was barely as high as the giant's shoulder. For a moment, Foam Follower gave no sign of having heard. But then his shoulder slumped. With a slow exertion, almost as though he were reluctant to stop torturing himself, he withdrew his hands. They were unharmed. For some reason, his flesh was impervious to flame. But the blood was gone from them. They looked as clean as if they had been scrubbed by exoneration. His fingers were still stiff with hurt, and he flexed them painfully before he turned his bloody face toward Covenant. As if he were appealing a condemnation, he met the unbeliever's impacted gaze and asked, Do you feel nothing? Feel, Covenant groaned. I'm a leper. Not even for tiny Pietan, a child. His appeal made Covenant want to throw his arms around the giant, accept this terrible sympathy as some kind of answer to his dilemma. But he knew it was not enough, knew in the deepest marrow of his leprosy that it did not suffice. We killed them too, he croaked. I killed. I'm no different than they are. Abruptly he turned, walked away into the darkness to hide his shame. The battleground was a fit and proper place for him. His nostrils were numb to the stink of death. After a time he stumbled, then lay down among the dead, on blood surrounded by graves and pyres. Children! He was the cause of their screams and their agony. Fowl had attacked the wood helven because of his white gold ring. Not again. I won't. His voice was empty of weeping. I will not do any more killing. Chapter 18 The Plains of Ra Despite the battleground, despite the acrid smoke of flame and flesh and power, despite the nearby trenches, where the dead were graved like lumps of charred agony, piled wearily into the earth, like accumulated pain for which only the ground could now find use or surcease, 
despite his own inner torn and trampled ground, Covenant slept. For what was left of the night, the other survivors of the battle labored to bury or burn the various dead, but Covenant slept. Restless unconsciousness arose from within him like a perpetually enumerated VSE, and he spent his repose telling in dreams that rigid round. Left arm, shoulder to wrist, left hand, palm and back, each finger, right arm, shirt, chest, left leg. He awoke to meet a dawn which wore the aspect of an uncomfortable tomb. Shuddering himself to his feet, he found that all the work of burying was done. Each of the trenches was filled, covered with dirt, and planted with a sapling which Birenir had found somewhere. Now most of the warriors lay awkwardly on the ground, in fatigue, searching themselves for some kind of strength. But Prothol and Moram were busy cooking a meal, and the blood guard were examining and readying the horses. A spate of disgust crossed Covenant's face, disgust that he had not done his share of the work. He looked at his robe. The Samite was stiff and black with encrusted blood. Fit apparel for a leper, he thought, an outcast. He knew that it was past time for him to make a decision. He had to determine where he stood in his impossible dilemma. Propped on his staff in the sepulchral dawn, he felt that he had reached the end of his evasions. He had lost track of his self-protective habits, lost the choice of hiding his ring, lost even his tough boots, and he had shed blood. He had brought down doom on soaring Woodhelven. He had been so preoccupied with his flight from madness that he had not faced the madness toward which his fleeing took him. He had to keep moving. He had learned that. But going on posed the same impenetrable problem. Participate and go mad. Or refuse to participate and go mad. He had to make a decision find bedrock somewhere and cling to it. He could not accept the land and could not deny it. He needed an answer. Without it, he would be trapped like Laura, forced to the tune of Fowl's glee to lose himself in order to avoid losing himself. Then Moram looked up from his stirring and saw the disgust and dismay on Covenant's face. Gently, the Lord said, what troubles you, my friend? For a moment Covenant stared at Moram. The Lord looked as if he had become old overnight. The smoke and dirt of battle marked his face, accentuating the lines on his forehead and around his eyes, like a sudden aggravation of wear and decay. His eyes seemed dulled by fatigue, but his lips retained their kindness, and his movements, though draped in such a rent and bloodied robe, were steady. Covenant flinched instinctively away from the tone in which Moram said, My friend. He could not afford to be anyone's friend. And he flinched away, too, from his impulse to ask what it caused Tamarantha's staff to become so violent in his hands. He feared the answer to that question. To cover his wincing, he turned roughly away and went in search of Foam Follower. The giant was sitting with his back to the last standing, extinguished fragment of soaring Woodhelven. Grime and blood darkened his face. His skin had the color of a flaw in the heart of a tree. But the wound on his forehead dominated his appearance. Ripped flesh hung over his brows like a foliage of pain. And through the wound, drops of new blood seeped as if red thoughts were making their way from a crack in his skull. He had his right arm wrapped around his great jug of diamond draft, and his eyes followed Laura as she tended little Pieton. Covenant approached the giant, but before he could speak, Foam Follower said, Have you considered them? Do you know what has been done to them? The question raised black echoes in Covenant's mind. I know about her. And Pieton, tiny Pieton, a child? Covenant shrugged awkwardly. Think, unbeliever. 
His voice was full of swirling mists. I am lost. You can understand. With an effort, Covenant replied, The same thing, just exactly what's been done to us and to Laura. A moment later, he added mordantly, And to the cave whites. Foam followers' eyes shied, and Covenant went on. We are all going to destroy whatever we want to preserve. The essence of Fowl's method. Pietan is a present to us, an example of what we are going to do to the land when we try to save it. Fowl is that confident, and prophecies like that are self-fulfilling. At this, foam followers stared at Covenant, as if the unbeliever had just laid a curse on him. Covenant tried to hold the giant's eyes, but an unexpected shame made him drop his head. He looked at the power-scorched grass. The burning of the grass was curious. Some patches did not look as wrong as others. Apparently, Lord's fire did less essential damage than the might of the Irviles. After a moment, Foam Follower said, You forget that there is a difference between a prophet and a seer. Seeing the future is not prophecy. Covenant did not want to think about it. To get away from the subject, he demanded, Why didn't you get some of that hurt loam for your forehead? This time, Foam Follower's eyes turned away. Distantly, he said, There was none left. His hands opened and closed in a gesture of helplessness. Others were dying, and others needed the hurt loam to save their arms or legs, and his voice stumbled momentarily. And I thought Tiny Pietan might be helped. He is only a child, he insisted, looking up suddenly with an appeal that Covenant could not understand. But one of the cave whites was dying slowly, in such pain. A new trickle of blood broke open in his forehead and began to drip from his brow. Stone and sea, he moaned. I could not endure it. Hearthrall beer and air kept aside a touch of hurt loam for me, from all the wounds to be treated. But I gave it to the cave white, not to Pietan, to the cave white, because of the pain. Abruptly, he put back his head and took a long pull of diamond draft. With the heel of his palm, he wiped roughly at the blood on his brows. Covenant gazed intently at the giant's racked visage. Because he could find no other words for his sympathy, he asked, How are your hands? My hands? Foam follower seemed momentarily confused, but then he remembered. Ah, the Kaamora. My friend, I am a giant, he explained. No ordinary fire can harm me. But the pain, the pain teaches many things. A flinch of self-disgust crossed his lips. It is said that the giants are made of granite, he mumbled. Do not be concerned for me. On an impulse, Covenant responded, In parts of the world where I come from, there are little old ladies who sit by the side of the road, pounding away all day on hunks of granite with little iron hammers. It takes a long time, but eventually they turn big pieces into little pieces. Foam follower considered briefly before asking, is that prophecy, Er Lord Covenant? Don't ask me. I wouldn't know a prophecy if it fell on me. Nor would I, said Foam Follower. A dim smile tinged his mouth. Shortly, Lord Moram called the company to the meal he and Prothol had prepared. Through a haze of suppressed groans, the warriors pried themselves to their feet and moved toward the fire. Foam Follower lurched upright. He and Covenant followed Laura and Pietan to get something to eat. The sight and smell of food suddenly brought Covenant's need for decision to a head. He was empty, hollow with hunger. But when he reached out to take some bread, he saw how his arm was befouled with blood and ashes. He had killed. The bread dropped from his fingers. This is all wrong, he murmured. Eating was a form of acquiescence, a submission to the physical actuality of the land. 
He could not afford it. I've got to think. The emptiness in him ached with demands, but he refused them. He took a drink of spring wine to clear his throat, then turned away from the fire with a gesture of rejection. The lords and foam follower looked after him inquiringly, but made no comment. He needed to put himself to the test, discover an answer that would restore his ability to survive. With a grimace, he resolved to go hungry until he found what he required. Perhaps in hunger, he would become lucid enough to solve the fundamental contradiction of his dilemma. All the abandoned weapons had been cleared from the glade, gathered into a pile. He went to it and searched until he found Ati Aran's stone knife. Then, on an obscure impulse, he walked over to the horses to see if Dura had been injured. When he learned that she was unscathed, he felt a vague relief. He did not want, under any circumstances, to be forced to ride a Ranihin. A short time later, the warriors finished their meal. Wearily, they moved to take up the quest again. As Covenant mounted Dura, he heard the blood guard whistle sharply for the Ranihin. The call seemed to hang in the air for a moment. Then, from various directions around the glade, the great horses came galloping, manes and tails flaring as if afire hooves pounding in long, mighty, trip-rhythmed strides. Nine star-browed chargers, as swift and elemental as the life pulse of the land. Covenant could hear in their bold nickering the excitement of going home toward the plains of Ra. But the questers who left dead soaring Woodhelven that morning had little of the bold or home-going in their attitudes. Kwan's eelman, was now six warriors short, and the survivors were gaunt with weariness and battle. They seemed to carry their shadows in their faces as they rode north toward the Mithill River. The riderless horses they took with them to provide relief for the weaker mounts. Among them, Saltart Foam Follower trudged as if he were carrying the weight of all the dead. In the crook of one arm he cradled Piaton, who had fallen asleep as soon as the sun cleared the eastern horizon. Laura rode behind Lord Moram, gripping the sides of his robe. She appeared bent and frail behind his grim-set face and erect posture. But he shared with her an eroded expression, an air of inarticulate grief. Ahead of them moved Prothal, and his shoulders bespoke the same kind of inflexible will which Atiaran had used to make Covenant walk from Mithil Stone Down to the Sol Zees River. Vaguely, Covenant wondered how much farther he would have to follow other people's choices. But he let the thought go and looked at the bloodguard. They were the only members of the company who did not appear damaged by the battle. Their short robes hung in tatters. They were as filthy as anyone. One of their number had been killed, and several were injured. They had defended the lords, especially Variol and Tamarantha, to the utmost. But the bloodguard were unworn and undaunted, free of rue. Manor rode his prancing, rainless Ronihan beside Covenant and gazed about him with an impervious eye. The horses of the company could manage only a slow, stumbling walk, but even that frail pace brought the riders to the ford of the Mithill before noon. Leaving their mounts to drink or graze, all of them, except the blood guard, plunged into the stream. Scrubbing at themselves with fine sand from the river bottom, they washed the blood and grit and pain of death and long night into the wide current of the mid-hill. Clear skin and eyes reappeared from under the smears of battle. Minor, unhurt loamed wounds opened and bled clean. Scraps of shredded clothing floated out of reach. Among them, Covenant beat his robe clean, rubbed and scratched stains from his flesh, as if he were trying to rid himself of the effects of killing. And he drank quantities of water in an effort to appease the aching hollowness of his hunger. Then, when the warriors were done, they went to their horses to get new clothing from their saddlebags. After they had dressed and regained command of their weapons, they posted themselves as sentries, while first Mark Tuvor and the blood guard bathed. 
the blood guard managed to enter and leave the river without splashing, and they washed noiselessly. In a few moments they were dressed in new robes and mounted on the Ranihin. The Ranihin had refreshed themselves by crossing into Andalane and rolling on the grass while their riders bathed. Now the company was ready to travel. High Lord Prothal gave the signal, and the company rode away eastward along the south bank of the river. The rest of the day was easy for the riders and their mounts. There was soft grass under hoof, clean water at one side, a tang of vitality in the air, and a nearby view of Andalane itself, which seemed to pulse with robust sap. The people of the land drew healing from the ambience of the hills, but the day was hard for Covenant. He was hungry, and the vital presence of Andalane only made him hungrier. He kept his gaze away from it as best he could, refusing the sight as he had refused food. His gaunt face was set in stern lines, and his eyes were hollow with determination. He followed a double path. His flesh rode Jura doggedly, keeping his position in the company, but in his mind he wandered in chasms, and their dark, empty inanition hurt him. I will not. He wanted to survive. I am not. From time to time, Aliantha lay directly in his path like a personal appeal from the land, but he did not succumb. Covenant, he thought. Thomas Covenant, unbeliever. Leper, outcast, unclean. When a pang from his hunger made him waver, he remembered Drool's bloody grip on his ring, and his resolve steadied. From time to time, Laura looked at him with the death of soaring Woodhelven in her eyes, but he only clenched himself harder and rode on. I won't do any more killing. He had to have some other answer. That night he found that a change had come over his ring. Now all evidence that it resisted red encroachments was gone. His wedding band burned completely crimson under the dominion of the moon, flaming coldly on his hand as if in greedy response to Drool's power. The next morning he began the day's riding like a man torn between opposing poles of insanity. But there was a foretaste of summer in the noon breeze. The air turned warm and redolent with the ripeness of the earth. The flowers had a confident bloom, and the birds sang languidly. Gradually, Covenant grew full of lassitude. Languor loosened the strings of his will. Only the habit of riding kept him on Dura's back. He became numb to such superficial considerations. He hardly noticed when the river began to curve northward away from the company, or when the hills began to climb higher. He moved blankly on the warm currents of the day. That night he slept deeply, dreamlessly, and the next day he rode on in numbness and unconcern. Waking slumber held him. It was a wilderland that he wandered unaware. He was in danger without knowing it. Lassitude was the first step in an inexorable logic, the law of leprosy. The next was gangrene, a stink of rotting live flesh so terrible that even some physicians could not bear it, a stench which ratified the outcasting of lepers in a way no mere compassion or unprejudice could oppose. But Covenant traveled his dream with his mind full of sleep. When he began to recover, early in the afternoon of the third day from soaring Woodhelven, the eighteenth since the company had left Revelstone, he found himself looking over Moran Moss Forest. The company stood on the last hilltop before the land fell under the dark aegis of the trees. Moran Moss lay at the foot of the hill like a lapping sea. Its edges gripped the hillsides as if the trees had clenched their roots in the slopes and refused to be driven back. The dark, various green of the forest spread to the horizon, north and east and south. It had a forbidding look. It seemed to defy the quest to pass through it. High Lord Prothal stopped on the crest of the hill and gazed for a long time over the forest, weighing the time needed to ride around Moran Moss 
against the obscure dangers of the trees. Finally, he dismounted. He looked over the riders, and his eyes were full of potential anger as he spoke. We will rest now. Then we will ride into Morenmos, and will not stop until we have reached the far side, a journey of nearly a day and a night. During that ride, we must show neither blade nor spark. Hear you? All swords sheathed, all arrows quivered, all knives cloaked, all spear tips bound, and every spark or gleam of fire quenched. I will have no mistake. Morinmos is wilder than Grimmerdhor, and none go unanxious into that wood. The trees have suffered for ages, and they do not forget their kinship with Garroting Deep. Pray that they do not crush us all regardless. He paused, scanning the company, until he was sure that all understood him. Then he added more gently, it is possible that there is still a forestal in Morenmos, though that knowledge has been lost since the desecration. Several of the warriors tensed at the word forestal, but Covenant, coming slowly out of his languor, felt none of the awe which seemed to be expected of him. He asked, as he had once before, Do you worship trees? Worship? Prothol seemed puzzled. The word is obscure to me. Covenant stared. A moment later, the High Lord went on. Do you ask if we reverence the forests? Of course. They are alive, and there is earth power in all living things, all stone and earth and water and wood. Surely you understand that we are the servants of that power. We care for the life of the land. He glanced back at the forest, then continued. The earth power takes many forms between wood and stone. Stone bedrocks the world, and to the best of our comprehension, weak as it is, that form of power does not know itself, but wood is otherwise. At one time, in the dimmest, lost distance of the past, nearly all the land was one forest one mighty wood, from Trothgard and Melancurian Skyweir to Sarengray Flat and Sea Reach. And the forest was awake. It knew and welcomed the new life which people brought to the land. It felt the pain when mere men, blind, foolish moments in the ancientness of the land, cut down and burned out the trees to make space in which to breed their folly. Ah, it is hard to take pride in human history. Before the slow knowledge spread throughout the forest, so that each tree knew its peril, hundreds of leagues of life had been decimated. By our reckoning, the deed took time, more than a thousand years, but it must have seemed a rapid murder to the trees. At the end of that time, there were only four places left in the land where the soul of the forest lingered, survived and shuddered in its awesome pain, and took resolve to defend itself. Then, for many ages, giant woods and grimmered hoar and moor and moss and garroting deep lived, and their awareness endured in the care of the forestals. They remembered, and no human or vile or cave white who dared enter them survived. Now even those ages are past. We know not if the forestals yet live, though only a fool would deny that Caroyle Wildwood still walks in garroting deep. But the awareness which enabled the trees to strike back is fading. The lords have defended the forest since Beric Halfhand first took up the staff of law. We have not let the trees diminish, yet their spirit fails. Cut off from each other, the collective knowledge of the forest dies, and the glory of the world becomes less than it was. Frothal paused sadly for a moment before concluding. It is in deference to the remaining spirit and in reverence for the earth power that we ask permission for so many to enter the forest at one time, and it is in simple caution that we offer no offense. The spirit is not dead, 
and the power of Moran Moss could crush a thousand thousand men if the trees were pained into wakefulness. Are there other dangers? Quan asked. Will we need our weapons? No. Lord Fowl's servants have done great harm to the forests in ages past. Perhaps Grimmerdhor has lost its power, but Moran Moss remembers. And tonight is the dark of the moon. Even Drool Rockworm is not mad enough to order his forces into Moran Moss at such a time, and the Despiser has never been such a fool. Quietly the riders dismounted. Some of the eomen fed the horses, while others prepared a quick meal. Soon all the company except Covenant had eaten. And after the meal, while the blood guard watched, the questers laid themselves down to rest before the long passage of the forest. When they were roused again and ready to travel, Prothol strode up to the edge of the hill crest. The breeze was stronger there. It fluttered his black-sashed blue robe as he raised his staff and cried loudly, Hail Morin Moss, forest of the one forest, enemy of our enemies, Morin Moss, hail. His voice fell into the expanse of the woods forlornly, without echo. We are the lords, foes to your enemies, and learners of the Lillian Rill lore. We must pass through. Hearken, Morin Moss, we hate the axe and flame which hurt you. Your enemies are our enemies. Never have we brought edge of axe or flame or fire to touch you, nor ever shall. Morin Moss, hearken. Let us pass. His call disappeared into the depths of the forest. At last he lowered his arms, then turned and came back to the company. He mounted his horse, looked once more sternly over the riders. At his signal, they rode down toward the knuckled edges of Moran Moss. They seemed to fall like a stone into the forest. One moment they were still winding down the hillside above the trees. The next they had penetrated the gloomy deep, and the sunlight closed behind them like an unregainable door. Birinair went at the head of the company, with his higher brand staff held across his mount's neck, and behind him rode first Mark Tuvor on the Ronihin stallion Marnie. For the Ronihin had nothing to fear from the old anger of Moran Moss, and Marnie could guide Birinair if the aged Hearthrall went astray. Behind Tuvor came Prothol and Moram, with Laura at Moram's back, and behind them came Covenant and Foam Follower. The giant still carried the sleeping child. Then followed Quan and his eelmen, bunched together among the blood guard. There was room for them to pass. The trees with their dark mingled ebony and russet trunks were widely placed, leaving space between them for undergrowth and animals, and the riders found their way without difficulty. But the trees were not tall. They rose for fifteen or twenty feet on squat trunks, then spread outward in gnarled, drooping branches, heavy with foliage, so that the company was completely enshrouded in the gloom of Moran Moss. The branches interwove until each tree seemed to be standing with its arms braced heavily on the shoulders of its kindred, and from the limbs hung great curtains and strands of moss, dark, thick, damp moss, falling from the branches like slow blood caught and frozen as it bled. The moss dangled before the riders as if it were trying to turn them aside, deflect them from their path and on the deep, mossy ground the hooves of the horses made no sound. The riders went their way as silently as if they had been translated into an illusion. Instinctively dodging away from the dark touch of the moss, Covenant peered into the forest's perpetual gloaming. As far as he could see in all directions, he was surrounded by the grotesque ire of moss and branch and trunk. But beyond the limit of his explicit senses he could see more, see and smell, and in the silence of the forest hear the brooding heart of the woods. There the trees contemplated their grim memories, 
the broad, budding burst of self-awareness, when the spirit of the wood lay grandly over hundreds of leagues of rich earth, and the raw plummet of pain and horror and disbelief, spreading like ripples on an ocean, until the farthest leaves in the land shivered, when the slaughter of the trees began, root and branch, and all cut and consumed by axe and flame, and stumps dragged away, and the scurry and anguish of the animals, slaughtered too, or bereft of home and health and hope, and the clear song of the forest of, whose tune taught the secret, angry pleasure of crushing, of striking back at tiny men and tasting their blood at the roots, and the slow weakness which ended even that last fierce joy and left the trees with nothing but their stiff memories and their despair as they watched their rage fall into slumber. Covenant sensed that the trees knew nothing of lords or friendship. The lords were too recent in the land to be remembered. No, it was weakness, the failure of spirit, that let the riders pass. Weakness, sorrow, helpless sleep. Here and there he could hear trees that were still awake and aching for blood, but they were too few, too few. Moran Moss could only brood, bereft of force by its own ancient mortality. A hand of moss struck him and left moisture on his face. He wiped the wet away as if it were acid. Then the sun set beyond Moran Moss, and even that low light was gone. Covenant leaned forward in his saddle, alert now, and afraid that Deeranair would lose his way or stumble into a curtain of moss and be smothered. But as darkness seeped into the air, as if it were dripping from the enshrouding branches, a change came over the wood. Gradually, a silver glow grew on the trunks, grew and strengthened as night filled the forest, until each tree stood shimmering like a lost soul in the gloom. The silver light was bright enough to show the riders their way. Across the shifting patterns of the glow, the moss sheets hung like shadows of an abyss, black holes into emptiness, giving the wood a blotched, leprous look. But the company huddled together and rode on through a night illumined only by the gleam of the trees and by the red burn of Covenant's ring. He felt that he could hear the trees muttering in horror at the offense of his wedding band, and its pulsing red glow appalled him. Moss fingers flicked his face with a wet, probing touch. He clenched his hands over his heart, trying to pull himself inward, reduce himself and pass unnoticed, rode as if he carried an axe under his robe, and was terrified lest the trees discover it. That long ride passed like the hurt of a wound. Acute throbs finally blurred together, and at last the company was again riding through the dimness of day. Covenant shivered, looked about within himself. What he saw left him mute. He felt that the cistern of his rage was full of darkness. But he was caught in toils of insoluble circumstance. The darkness was a cup which he could neither drink nor dash aside, and he was trembling with hunger. He could hardly restrain himself from striking back at the damp clutch of the moss. Still the company traveled the perpetual twilight of Moran Moss. They were silent, stifled by the enshrouding branches, and in the clawing quiet Covenant felt as lost as if he had missed his way in the old forest which had covered all the land. With vague fury he ducked and dodged the grasping of the moss. Time passed, and he had a mounting desire to scream. Then, finally, Miranair waved his staff over his head and gave a weak shout. The horses understood. They stumbled into a tired run beside the strong step of the Ranihin. For a moment, the trees seemed to stand back as if drawing away from the company's madness. Then the riders broke out into sunshine. They found themselves under a noon sky on a slope which bent gradually down to a river lying squarely across their way. 
Guerinere and Marnie had brought them unerringly to Rome's Edge Fort. Hoarsely shouting their relief, the warriors set heels to their mounts, and the company swept down the slope at a brave gallop. Shortly the horses splashed into the stream, showering themselves and their glad riders with the cool spray of the Rome's Edge. On the southern bank, Prothal called a halt. The passage of Moran Moss was over. Once halted, the company tasted the toll of the passage. Their foodless vigil had weakened the riders, but the horses were in worse condition. They quivered with exhaustion. Once their last run was over, their necks and backs sagged. They scarcely had the strength to eat or drink. Despite the nickering encouragement of the Ronihin, two of the Eoman Mustangs collapsed on their sides on the grass, and the others stood around with unsteady knees, like foals. Rest, rest, Prothol said, in roomy anxiety. We go no farther this day. He walked among the horses, touching them with his old hands and humming a strengthening song. Only the Ronihin and the blood guard were unmarred by fatigue. Thomefollower lowered the child Pietan into Laura's arms, then dropped himself wearily on his back on the stiff grass. Since the company had left Soaring Woodhelpen, he had been unnaturally silent. He had avoided speaking, as if he feared his voice would betray him. Now he appeared to feel the strain of traveling without the support of stories and laughter. Covenant wondered if he would ever hear the giant laugh again. Sourly, he reached a hand up to get his staff from Dura's saddle, and noticed for the first time what Morinmos had done to his white robe. It was spattered and latticed with dark green stains, the markings of the moss. The stains offended him. With a scowl he looked around the company. The other riders must have been more adept at dodging. They showed none of the green signature of the moss. Lord Moram was the only exception. Each shoulder of his robe bore a dark stripe, like an insignia. Roughly, Covenant rubbed at the green, but it was dry and set. Darkness murmured in his ears like the distant rumor of an avalanche. His shoulders hunched like a strangler's. He turned away from the questers, stamped back into the river. Nodding his fingers in his robe, he tried to scrub out the stains of the forest. But the marks had become part of the fabric, immitigable. They clung to his robe, signing it like a chart, a map to unknown regions. In a fit of frustration, he pounded the river with his fists, but its current erased his ripples as if they had never existed. He stood erect and dripping in the stream. His heart labored in his chest. For a moment, he felt that his rage must either overflow or crack him to the bottom. None of this is happening. His jaw quivered. I can't stand it. Then he heard a low cry of surprise from the company. An instant later, Moram commanded quietly, Covenant, come. Spitting protests against so many things that he could not name them all, he turned around. The questers were all facing away from him, their attention bent on something which he could not see because of the water in his eyes. Moram repeated, Come. Covenant wiped his eyes, waded to the bank, and climbed out of the river. He made his dripping way through the eelman until he reached Moram and Prothol. Before them stood a strange woman. She was slim and slight, no taller than Covenant's shoulder, and dressed in a deep brown shift which left her legs and arms free. Her skin was sun-darkened to the color of earth. Her long black hair she wore tied into one strand by a heavy cord. The effect was severe, but this was relieved by a small necklace of yellow flowers. Despite her size, she stood proudly, with her arms folded and her legs slightly apart, as if she could deny the company entrance to the plains of Ra if she chose. She watched Covenant's approach as if she had been waiting for him. 
when he stopped, joining Moram and Trothal. She raised her hand and gave him the salute of welcome awkwardly, as if it were not a natural gesture for her. Hail Ringthane, she said in a clear, nickering voice. White gold is known. We homage and serve. Be welcome. He shook the water from his forehead and stared at her. After greeting him, she turned with a ritual precision toward each of the others. Hail, High Lord Prothol. Hail, Lord Moram. Hail, Saltart Foam Follower. Hail, First Mark Tuvor. Hail, Warhaft Quan. In turn, they saluted her gravely, as if they recognized her as a potentate. Then she said, I am main thrall live. We see you. Speak. The plains of Ra are not open to all. Prothal stepped forward. Raising his staff, he held it in both hands level with his forehead and bowed deeply. At this, the woman smiled faintly. Holding her own palms beside her head, she matched his bow. This time, her movement was smooth, natural. You know us, she said. You come from afar, but you are not unknowing. Prothal replied, We know that the main thralls are the first tenders of the Ranihin. Among the Raman, you are most honored, and you know us. He stood close to her now, and the slight stoop of his agedness inclined him over her. Her brown skin and his blue robe accentuated each other like earth and sky. But still she withheld her welcome. No, she returned. Not no. You come from afar, unknown. Yet you speak our names, she shrugged. We are cautious. We have watched since you left Morinmos. We heard your talk. We? Covenant wondered blankly. Slowly her eyes moved over the company. We know the sleepless ones, the blood guard. She did not appear pleased to see them. They take the Ranihin into peril, but we serve. They are welcome. Then her gaze settled on the two collapsed horses, and her nostrils flared. You have urgency? she demanded, but her tone said that she would accept few justifications for the condition of the Mustangs. At that, Covenant understood why she hesitated to welcome the lords, though they must have been known to her, at least by legend or reputation. She wanted no one who mistreated horses to enter the plains of Ra. The High Lord answered with authority, Yes, Fang Thane lives. Lyth faltered momentarily. When her eyes returned to Covenant, they swarmed with hints of distant fear. Fang Thane! she breathed, enemy of earth and Ranihin. Yes, white gold knows. The ring thane is here. Abruptly her tone became hard. To save the Ranihin from rending. She looked at Covenant, as if demanding promises from him. He had none to give her. He stood angrily dripping, too soaked with hunger, to respond in repudiation or acquiescence or shame. Soon she retreated in bafflement. To Prothal she said, Who is he? What manner of man? With an ambivalent smile, Prothal said, He is Erlord Thomas Covenant, unbeliever and white gold wielder. He is a stranger to the land. Do not doubt him. He turned the battle for us when we were beset by the servants of Fangfane, Cave Whites and Irviles, and a griffin spawned in some unknown pit of malice. Lithe nodded noncommittally, as if she did not understand all his words. But then she said, There is urgency. No action against Fangfane must be hindered or delayed. There have been other signs. Rending beasts have sought to cross into the plains. High Lord Prothol, be welcome in the plains of Ra. Come with all speed to Manholm. We must take counsel. Your welcome honors us, the High Lord responded. We return honor in accepting. 
We will reach Manholm the second day from today, if the horses live. His cautious speech made Lythe laugh lightly. You will rest in the hospitality of the Raman before the sun sets a second time from this moment. We have not served the Rani Hin knowledgeless from the beginning. Cords, up! Here is a test for your maining. At once four figures appeared. They suddenly stood up from the grass in a loose semicircle around the company as if they had risen out of the ground. The four, three men and a woman, were as slight as main thrall lithe, and dressed like her in brown over their tanned skin. But they wore no flowers, and had short lengths of rope wrapped around their waists. Come, cords, said lithe. Stalk these riders no longer. You have heard me welcome them. Now tend their horses and their safety. They must reach man home before nightfall of the next day. The four Ramans stepped forward, and Lythe said to Prothal, Here are my cords, Thew, Hearn, Grace, and Rusta. They are hunters. While they learn the ways of the Ranihin and the knowing of the main thralls, they protect the plains from dangerous beasts. I have spent much time with them. They can care for your mounts. With courteous nods to the company, the cords went straight to the horses and began examining them. Now, Lythe continued, I must depart. The word of your coming must cross the plains. The Windholms must prepare for you. Follow Rooster. He is nearest to his maning. Hail, lords. We will eat together at nightfall of the new day. Without waiting for a reply, the main thrall turned southward and sprinted away. She ran with surprising speed. In a few moments, she had crested a hill and vanished from sight. Watching her go, Moram said to Covenant, It is said that a main thrall can run with a Ronihin for a short time. Behind them, Cord Hearn muttered, It is said, and it is true. Moram faced the cord. He stood as if waiting to speak. His appearance was much like Lythe's, though his hair had not been permitted to grow as long as hers, and his features had a dour cast. When he had Moram's attention, he said, There is a grass which will heal your horses. I must leave you to bring it. Gently the Lord responded, The knowing is yours. Do what is best. Hearn's eyes widened, as if he had not expected soft words from people who mistreated horses. Then, uncertain of his movements, he saluted Moram in Lord's fashion. Moram returned a Raman bow. Hearn grinned and was about to gallop away when Covenant abruptly asked, Why don't you ride? You've got all those running in. Moram moved swiftly to restrain Covenant, but the damage was already done. Hearn stared as if he had heard blasphemy, and his strong fingers twitched the rope from about his waist, holding it between his fist like a garrot. We do not ride. Have a care, Hearn, said Cord Rusta softly. The main thrall welcomed him. Hearn glared at his companion, then roughly re-knotted his rope around his waist. He spun away from the company and soon vanished as if he had disappeared into the earth. Gripping Covenant's arm, Moram said sternly, The Ramans serve the Ranihin. That is their reason for life. Do not affront them, unbeliever. They are quick to anger, and the deadliest hunters in the land. There might be a hundred of them within the range of my voice, and you would never know. If they chose to slay you, you would die ignorant. Covenant felt the force of the warning. It seemed to invest the surrounding grass with eyes that peered balefully. He felt conspicuous, as if his green-mapped robe were a guide for deadly intentions hidden in the ground. He was trembling again. While Hearn was away, the rest of the cords worked on the horses, caressing, cajoling them into taking water and food. Under their hands, most of the Mustangs grew steadier. Satisfied that their mounts were in good hands, the lords went to talk with Quan and Tuvor, and around them 
the warriors began preparing food. Covenant cursed the aroma. He lay on the stiff grass and tried to still his gnawing emptiness by staring at the sky. Fatigue caught up with him, and he dozed for a while. But soon he was roused by a new smell which made his hunger sting in his guts. It came from clumps of rich, ferny flowers that the horses were munching, the healing herbs which Cord Hearn had brought for them. All the horses were on their feet now, and they seemed to gain strength visibly as they ate. The piquant odor of the flowers gave Covenant a momentary vision of himself on his hands and knees, chewing like the horses, and he muttered in suppressed savagery, Damn horses, eat better than we do. Cord Rusta smiled oddly and said, This grass is poison to humans. It is Amanibhavam, the flower of health and madness. Horses it heals, but men and women, ah, they are not enough for it. Covenant answered with a glare and tried to stifle the groan of his hunger. He felt a perverse desire to taste the grass. It sang to his senses delectably. Yet the thought that he had been brought so low was bitter to him, and he savored its sourness instead of food. Certainly the plants worked wonders for the horses. Soon they were feeding and drinking normally, and looked sturdy enough to bear riders again. The questers finished their meal, then packed away their supplies. The cords pronounced the horses ready to travel. Shortly the riders were on their way south, over the swift hills of Ra, with the Raman trotting easily beside them. Under the hooves of the horses, the grasslands rolled and passed like mild billows, giving the company an impression of speed. They rode over the hardy grass, up and down short, low slopes, along shallow valleys between copses and small woods, beside thin streams, across broad flats. It was a rough land. Except for the faithful Aliantha, the terrain was unrefined by fruit trees or cultivation or any flowers other than Amanibhavam. But still the plain seemed full of elemental life, as if the low, quick hills were formed by the pulse of the soil, and the stiff grass were rich enough to feed anything strong enough to bear its nourishment. When the sun began to set, the bracken on the hillsides glowed purple. Herds of Nilgai came out of the woods to drink at the streams, and ravens flocked clamorously to the broad chintz trees which dotted the flats but the riders gave most of their attention to the roaming Ranihin. Whether galloping by like triumphal banners or capering together in evening play, the great horses wore an aura of majesty, as if the very ground they thundered on were proud of their creation. They called in fierce joy to the bearers of the blood guard, and these chargers did little dances with their hooves, as if they could not restrain the exhilaration of their return home. Then the unmounted Ranihan dashed away, full of gay blood and unfetterable energy, whinnying as they ran. Their calls made the air tingle with vitality. Soon the sun set in the west, bidding farewell to the plains with a flare of orange. Covenant watched it go with dour satisfaction. He was tired of horses, Tired of Ranihin and Ramen and Bloodguard and Lords and Quests. Tired of the unrest of life. He wanted darkness and sleep, despite the blood burn of his ring, the new coming crescent of the moon, and the vulture wings of horror. But when the sun was gone, Rusta told Prothal that the company would have to keep on riding. There was danger, he said. Warnings had been left in the grass by other Ramen. The company would have to ride until they were safe, a few leagues more. So they traveled onward. Later the moon rose, and its defiled sliver turned the night to blood, calling up a lurid answer from Covenant's ring and his hungry soul. Then Rusta slowed the riders, warned them to silence. With as much stealth as they could muster, they angled up the south side of a hill and stopped just below its crest. The company dismounted, 
left a few of the blood guard to watch over the horses, and followed the cords to the hilltop. Low, flat ground lay to the north. The cords peered across it for some time, then pointed. Covenant fought the fatigue of his eyes and the crimson dimness until he thought he saw a dark patch moving southward over the flat. Creesh, whispered Hearn. Yellow wolves, fang thanes brood. They have crossed Rome's edge. Wait for us, Rusta breathed. You will be safe. He and the other cords faded into the night. Instinctively, the company drew closer together and stared with throbbing eyes through the thin red light which seemed to ooze like sweat from the moving darkness on the flat. In suspense, they stood hushed, hardly breathing. Pietan sat in Laura's arms, as wide awake as a vigil. Covenant learned later that the pack numbered fifteen of the great yellow wolves. Their four shoulders were waist-high on a man. They had massive jaws lined with curved, ripping fangs and yellow, omnivorous eyes. They were drooling on the trail of two Ronihan foals, protected only by a stallion and his mare. The legends of the Raman said that the breath of such creche was hot enough to scorch the ground, and they left a wheel of pain across the grass wherever their plundering took them. But all Covenant saw now was an approaching darkness, growing larger moment by moment. Then, to his uncertain eyes, the rear of the pack appeared to swirl in confusion briefly, and as the wolves moved on he thought he could see two or three black dots lying motionless on the flat. The pack swirled again. This time several short howls of surprise and fear broke the silence. One harsh snarl was suddenly choked off. The next instant the pack started a straight dash toward the company, leaving five more dots behind. But now Covenant was sure that the dots were dead wolves. Three more creche dropped. Now he could see three figures leap away from the dead and sprint after the survivors. They vanished into shadows at the foot of the hill. From the darkness came sounds of fighting, enraged snarls, the snap of jaws that missed their mark, bones cracking. Then silence flooded back into the night. The apprehension of the company sharpened, for they could see nothing. The shadow reached almost to the crest of the hill where they stood. Abruptly they heard the sound of frantic running. It came directly toward them. Prothol sprang forward. He raised his staff, and blue fire flared from its tip. The sudden light revealed a lone creche with hatred in its eyes pelting at him. Tuvar reached Prothol's side an instant before foam follower, but the giant went ahead to meet the wolf's charge. Then, without warning, Cord Grace rose out of hiding squarely in front of the wolf. She executed her movement as smoothly as if she were dancing. As she stood, a swift jerk freed her rope. When the creche sprang at her, she flipped a loop of the rope around its neck and stepped neatly aside, turning as she did so to brace her feet. The force of the wolf's charge as it hit her noose broke its neck. The yank pulled her from her feet, but she rolled lightly to one side, keeping pressure on the rope, and came to her feet in a position to finish the creche if it were still alive. The eelman met her performance with a low murmur of admiration. She glanced toward them, and smiled diffidently in the blue light of Prothol's staff. Then she turned to greet the other cords as they loped out of the shadow of the hill. They were uninjured. All the wolves were dead. Lowering his staff, Prothol gave the cords a Raman bow. Well done, he said. They bowed in acknowledgment. When he extinguished his staff, red darkness returned to the hilltop. In the bloodlight, the riders began moving back to their horses. But Bonor stepped over to the dead wolf and pulled Grace's rope from around its neck. Holding the cord in a fighting grip, he stretched it taut. A good weapon, he said with his awkward inflectionlessness. The Raman did mighty work with it in the days when High Lord Kevin 
fought corruption openly. Something in his tone reminded Covenant that the Blood Guard were lusty men who had gone unwived for more than two thousand years. Then, on the spur of an obscure impulse, Bonor tightened his muscles, and the rope snapped. Shrugging slightly, he dropped the pieces on the dead creche. His movement had the finality of a prophecy. Without a glance at Cord Grace, he left the hilltop to mount the Ronihin that had chosen him. Chapter 19 Ring Thane's Choice Cord Rusta informed Prothal that, according to Raman custom, dead renders of the Ronihin were left for the vultures. The Raman had no desire to honor Kreesh or to affront the earth by burying them, and pyres raised the danger of fire on the plains, so the riders could rest as soon as their horses were away from the smell of death. The cord led the company on southward for nearly a league until he was satisfied that no night breeze would carry unrest to the animals. Then the quest camped. Covenant slept fitfully, as if he lay with the point of a spike against his stomach, and when the dawn came, he felt as ineffectual as if he had spent the night trying to counterpunch hunger, and when his nose tasted again the tangy smell of the poison Amanibhavam, the sensation made his eyes water as if he had been struck. He did not believe that he could hold himself upright much longer, but he still did not have the answer he needed. He had found no new insight, and the green handiwork of Moran Moss on his robe seemed illegible. A sure instinct told him that he could find what he lacked in the extremity of hunger. When his companions had eaten and were ready to travel again, he climbed dully onto Dura's back and rode with them. His eyes dripped senselessly from time to time, but he was not weeping. He felt charged with passion but could not let it out. The grief of his leprosy did not permit any such release. In contrast to the cold ash of his mood, the day was cheery, full of bright, unclouded sun and a warm northward breeze of deep sky and swift hills. Soon the rest of the company had surrendered to the spell of the plains, an incantation woven by the proud roaming of the Ranihin. Time and again, Mighty horses cantered or raced by, glancing aside at the riders with laughter in their eyes and keen, shimmering calls in their throats. The sight of them added a spring to the strides of the cords, and as the morning passed, Grace and Thew sang together. Run, Ranihin, gallop, play, feed and drink, and coat-gloss gleam. You are the marrow of the earth. No rain will curb or bit control, no claw or fang unpunished rend, no horse blood drop without the healing grass. We are the Raman, born to serve, main thrall curry, cord protect, win home hearth and bed anneal. Our feet do not bear our hearts away, grass grown hooves and forehead stars, hawks and withers, earthwood bloom, regal Ronihan, gallop. Run, we serve the tale of the sky, mane of the world. Hearing the song, Ronihan pranced around the company and away, running as smoothly as if the ground flowed in their strides. In foam followers' arms, Pietan stirred and shook off his day sleep for a while to watch the Ronihan with something like longing in his blank eyes. Prothal and Moram sat relaxed in their saddles, as if for the first time since leaving Revelstone, they felt that the company was safe, and tears ran down Covenant's face as if it were a wall. In his emptiness, the heat of the sun confused him. His head seemed to be fulminating, and the sensation made him feel that he was perched on an unsteady height, where great gulfs of vertiginous grass snapped like wolves at his heels. But the clingor of his saddle held him on Dura's back. After a time, he dozed into a dream where he danced and wept and made love at the commands of a satirical puppeteer. When he awoke, it was mid-afternoon, and there were mountains across most of the horizon ahead. 
the company was making good time. In fact, the horses were cantering now, as if the plains gave them more energy than they could contain. For a moment he looked ahead to Manholm, where, he foresaw, a misguided and valueless respect for his wedding ring would offer him to the Ranihin as a prospective rider. This was surely one of Prothal's reasons for choosing to visit the plains of Ra before approaching Mount Thunder. Honor the Erlord, the Ring Thane. Ah, oh, hell! He tried to envision himself riding a Ranihin, but his imagination could not make the leap. More than anything else except Andalane, the great, dangerous, earth-powerful horses, quintessenced the land. And Joan had been a breaker of horses. For some reason, the thought made his nose sting, and he tried to hold back his tears by gritting his teeth. The rest of the afternoon he passed by watching the mountains. They grew ahead of the company as if the peaks were slowly clambering to their feet. Curving away southwest and northeast, the range was not as high as the mountains behind Mithil Stone Down, but it was rugged and raw, as if high pinnacles had been shattered to make those forbidding impenetrable. Covenant did not know what lay behind the mountains, and did not want to know. Their impenetrability gave him an obscure comfort, as if they came between him and something he could not bear to see. They stood up more swiftly now as the company rode at a slow run toward them. The sun was dipping into the western plains as the riders entered the foothills of a precipitous outcropping of the range, and their backs were hued in orange and pink as they crossed a last rise and reached a broad, flat glade at the foot of the cliff. There, at last, was Manholm. The bottom of the cliff face for the last 250 or 300 feet inclined sharply inward along a broad half-oval front, leaving a cave like a deep vertical bowl in the rock. Far back in the cave, where they were protected from the weather and yet still exposed to the open air, were the hooped tents of the Raman families. And in the front, under the shelter of the cliff, was the communal area the open space and fires where the Raman cooked and talked and danced and sang together when they were not out on the plains with the Ranihin. The whole place seemed austere, as if generations of Raman had not worn a welcome for themselves in the stone. For Manholm was only a center, a beginning for the plains roaming of a nomadic people. Perhaps seventy Raman gathered to watch the company approach. They were nearly all Winhomes, the young and old of the Raman, and others who needed safety and a secure bed. Unlike the cords and main thralls, they had no fighting ropes. But Lithe was there, and she walked lightly out to meet the company with three other Raman, whom Covenant took to be main thralls also. They wore necklets of yellow flowers like hers, and carried their cords in their hair rather than at their waists. The company halted, and Prothol dismounted before the main thralls. He bowed to them in the Raman fashion, and they gestured their welcome in return. Hail again, lords from afar, said Lithe. Hail Ringthane, and High Lord, and Giant, and Bloodguard. Be welcome to the hearth and bed of Manholm. At her salutation, the Winholm surged forward from under the cliff. As the riders got down from their horses, each was greeted by a smiling Winholm bearing a small band of woven flowers. With gestures of ritual stateliness, they fastened the bands to the right wrists of their guests. Covenant climbed off Dura and found a shy, bold Raman girl, no more than fifteen or sixteen years old, standing before him. She had fine black hair that draped her shoulders, and soft, wide brown eyes. She did not smile. She seemed odd to find herself greeting the ring thane, the wielder of the white gold. Carefully, she reached out to put her flowers around his wrist. Their smell staggered him, and he nearly retched. The band was woven of Amanibhatham. Its tang burned his nose like acid, 
made him so hungry that he felt about to vomit chunks of emptiness. He was helpless to stop the tears that ran from his eyes. With a face full of solemnity, the Winholm girl raised her hands and touched his tears as if they were precious. Behind him, the Ranihin of the Blood Guard were galloping off into the freedom of the plains. The cords were leading the company's horses away to be tended, and more Raman cantered into the glade in answer to the news of the quest's arrival. But Covenant kept his eyes on the girl, stared at her as if she were a kind of food. Finally, she answered his gaze by saying, I am Winholm Gay. Soon I will share enough knowing to join the cords. After an instant of hesitation, she added, I am to care for you while you guest here. When he did not respond, she said hurriedly, Others will gladly serve if my welcome is not accepted. Covenant remained silent for a moment longer, clenching his useless ferocity. But then he gathered his strength for one final refusal. I don't need anything. Don't touch me. The words hurt his throat. A hand touched his shoulder. He glanced around to find Foam Follower beside him. The giant was looking down at Covenant, but he spoke to the pain of rejection in Gay's face. Do not be sad, little Winholm, he murmured. Covenant Ring Thane tests us. He does not speak his heart. Gay smiled gratefully up at Foam Follower, then said with sudden sauciness, Not so little giant. Your size deceives you. I have almost reached cording. Her jibe appeared to take a moment to penetrate Foam Follower. Then his stiff beard twitched. Abruptly he began to laugh. His glee mounted. It echoed off the cliff above Manholm, until the mountain seemed to share his elation, and the infectious sound spread until everyone near him was laughing without knowing why. For a long moment he threw out gales as if he were blowing debris from his soul. But Covenant turned away, unable to bear the loud weight of the giant's humor. Hell fire, he growled. Hell and blood, what are you doing to me? He had made no decision, and now his capacity for self-denial seemed spent. So when Gay offered to guide him to his seat for the feast which the Winholms had prepared, he followed her numbly. She took him under the ponderous overhang of the cliff to a central, clear space with a campfire burning in the middle. Most of the company had already entered Manholm. There were two other fires, and the Raman divided the company into three groups. The blood guards sat around one of the fires, Quan and his fourteen warriors around another, and in the center the Raman invited Prothol, Moram, Foam Follower, Laura, Pietan, and Covenant to join the main thralls. Covenant let himself be steered until he was sitting cross-legged on the smooth stone floor across the circle from Prothol, Moram, and Foam Follower. Four main thralls made places for themselves beside the lords, and Lithe seated herself near Covenant. The rest of the circle was filled with cords who had come in from the plains with their main thrall teachers. Most of the wind homes bustled around cooking fires farther back in the cave, but one stood behind each guest, waiting to serve. Gay attended Covenant, and she hummed a light melody which reminded him of another song he had once heard. Something there is in beauty, which grows in the soul of the beholder like a flower. Under the wood smoke and the cooking odors, he thought that he could smell Gay's clean, grassy fragrance. As he sat lumpishly on the stone, the last glow of the sunset waved orange and gold on the roof like an affectionate farewell. Then the sun was gone. Night spread over the plains. Campfire flames gave the only light in Manholm. The air was full of bustle and low talk, like a hill breeze rich in Ronihan's scent. But the food Covenant dreaded did not come immediately. First, some of the cords danced. Three of them performed within the circle where Covenant sat. They danced around the fire with high, prancing movements and sang a nickering song to the beat of complex clapping from the wind homes. 
the smooth flow of their limbs, the sudden eruptions of the dance, the dark tan of their skins, made them look as if they were enacting the pulse of the plains, dancing the pulse by making it fast enough for human eyes to see. And they repeatedly bent their bodies so that the firelight cast horse-like shadows on the walls and ceiling. Occasionally the dancers leaped close enough to Covenant for him to hear their song. Grass-grown hooves and forehead stars, hawks and withers, earth wood bloom. Regal Ronihin, gallop, run, we serve the tale of the sky, main of the world. The words in the dance made him feel that they expressed some secret knowledge, some vision that he needed to share. The feeling repelled him. He tore his eyes away from the dancers to the glowing coals of the fire. When the dance was done, he went on staring into the fire's heart with a gaze full of vague trepidations. Then the Windholms brought food and drink to the circles. Using broad leaves for plates, they piled stew and wild potatoes before their guests. The meal was savory with rare herbs, which the ramen relished in their cooking, and soon the questers were deep in the feast. For a long time the only sounds in Manholm were those of serving and eating. In the midst of the feast, Covenant sat like a stunted tree. He did not respond to anything Gay offered him. He stared at the fire. There was one coal in it which burned redly, like the night glow of his ring. He was doing a kind of V.S.E. in his mind, studying his extremities from end to end, and his heart ached in the conviction that he was about to find some utterly unexpected spot of leprosy. He looked as if he were withering. After a time, people began to talk again. Prothal and Moram handed their leaf plates back to the Windholms and turned their attention to the main thralls. Covenant caught glimpses of their conversation. They were discussing him, the message he had brought to them, the role he played in the fate of the land. Their physical comfort contrasted strangely with the seriousness of their words. Near them, Foam Follower described the plight of Laura and Pietan to one of the main thralls. Covenant scowled into the fire. He did not need to look down to see the blood change which came over his ring. He could feel the radiation of wrong from the metal. He concealed the band under his fist and trembled. The stone ceiling seemed to hover over him like a cruel wing of revelation, awaiting the moment of his greatest helplessness to plunge onto his exposed neck. He was abysmally hungry. I'm going crazy, he muttered into the flames. Winholm Gay urged him to eat, but he did not respond. Across the circle, Brothall was explaining the purpose of his quest. The main thralls listened uncertainly, as if they had trouble seeing the connection between evils far away and the plains of Ra. So the High Lord told them what had been done to Andalain. Pietan gazed with blank unfocus out into the night, as if he were looking forward to moonrise. Beside him, Laura spoke quietly with the cords around her, grateful for the Raman hospitality. As Foam Forward detailed the horrors which had been practiced on the two survivors of Soaring Woodhelven, his forehead knotted under the effort he made to contain his emotion. The fire shone like a door with an intolerable menace waiting behind it. The back of Covenant's neck was stiff with vulnerability, and his eyes stared blindly, like knot holes. The green stains on his robe marked him like a warning that said, Leper, outcast, unclean. He was nearing the end of his VSE. Behind him was the impossibility of believing the land true, and before him was the impossibility of believing it false. Abruptly, Gay entered the circle and confronted him, with her hands on her hips and her eyes flashing. She stood with her legs slightly apart, so that he saw the bloody coals of the fire between her thighs. He glanced up at her. You must take food, she scolded. Already you are half dead. Her shoulders were squared, drawing her shift tight over her breasts. 
She reminded him of Lena. Prothor was saying, He has not told us all that occurred at the celebration. The ravage of the wraiths was not prevented, yet we believe he fought the Irviles in some way. His companion blamed both herself and him for the ill which befell the dance. Covenant trembled. Like Lena, he thought. Lena? Darkness pounced at him like claws of vertigo. Lena? For an instant his vision was obscured by roaring and black waters. Then he crashed to his feet. He had done that to Lena. Done that? He flung the girl aside and jumped toward the fire. Lena! Swinging his staff like an axe, he chopped at the blaze. But he could not fight off the memory, could not throw it back. The staff, twisted with the force of the blow, fell from his hands. Sparks and coals shattered, flew in all directions. He had done that to her. Shaking his half-fist at Prothal, he cried, She was wrong, I couldn't help it. Thinking, Lena, what have I done? I'm a leper. Around him, people sprang to their feet. Moram came forward quickly, stretched out a restraining hand. Softly, Covenant, he said. What is wrong? We are guests. But even while he protested, Covenant knew that Ati Aran had not been wrong. He had seen himself kill at the Battle of Soaring Woodhelven, and had thought in his folly that being a killer was something new for him, something unprecedented. But it was not something he had recently become. He had been that way from the beginning of the dream, from the beginning. In an intuitive leap, he saw that there was no difference between what the Irviles had done to the wraiths and what he had done to Lena. He had been serving Lord Fowl since his first day in the land. No, he spat as if he were boiling in acid. No, I won't do it any more. I'm not going to be the victim any more. I will not be waited on by children. He shook with the ague of his rage as he cried at himself, You raped her, you stinking, bloody bastard. He felt as weak as if the understanding of what he had done corroded his bones. Moram said intently, Unbeliever, what is wrong? No, Covenant repeated. No, he was trying to shout, but his voice sounded distant, crippled. I will not tolerate this. It isn't right. I am going to survive. Do you hear me? Who are you? Main thrall lithe hissed through taut lips. With a quick shake of her head, a flick of her wrist, she pulled the cord from her hair and held it battle-ready. Prothal caught her arm. His old voice rattled with authority and supplication. Forgive, Main Thrall. This matter is beyond you. He holds the wild magic that destroys peace. We must forgive. Forgive! Covenant tried to shout. His legs failed under him, but he did not fall. Banor held him erect from behind. You can't forgive! Do you ask to be punished? Moram said incredulously. What have you done? Ask! Covenant struggled to recollect something. Then he found it. He knew what he had to do. No. Call the Ranihin. What? snapped Lithe in indignation, and all the Raman echoed her protest. The Ranihin, call them. Are you mad? Have a care, Ring Thane. We are the Raman. We do not call. We serve. They come as they will. They are not for your calling, and they do not come at night. Call, I tell you. I call them. Something in his terrible urgency confounded her. She hesitated, stared at him in confused anger and protest and unexpected compassion, then turned on her heel and strode out of Manholm. Supported by Banor, Covenant tottered out from under the oppressive weight of the mountain. The company and the Raman trailed after him like a wake of dumbfounded outrage. Behind them, the red moon had just crested the mountain, and the distant plains, visible beyond the foothills in front of Manholm, 
were already awash with crimson. The incarnadine floods seemed to untexture the earth, translate rock and soil and grass into decay and bitter blood. The people spread out on either side of the flat so that the open ground was lit by the campfires. Into the night walked Lithe, moving toward the plains until she stood near the far edge of the glade. Covenant stopped and watched her. Unsteadily, but resolutely, he freed himself from Banor's support, stood on his own like a wrecked galleon left by the tide, perched impossibly high on a reef. Moving woodenly, he went toward Lithe. Before him, the bloody vista of the moonlight lay like a dead sea, and it tugged at him as it flowed closer with each degree of the moonrise. His ring smoldered coldly. He felt that he was the lodestone. Sky and earth were alike hued scarlet, and he walked outward as if he were the pole on which the red knight turned. He and his ring, the force which compelled that tide of violated night. Soon he stood in the center of the open flat. A winding sheet of silence enwrapped the onlookers. Ahead of him, Main Thrall Lithe spread her arms as if she were beckoning the darkness toward her. Abruptly she gave a shrill cry. Kellen Brabanal, Marushin, Rushin, Hinin, Kellen Kur, Drillinarunal, Ranihin, Kellen Brabanal. Then she whistled once. It echoed off the cliff like a shriek. For a long moment, Silence choked the flat. Striding defiantly, Lithe moved back toward Manholm. As she passed Covenant, she snapped, I have called. Then she was behind him, and he faced the siege of the moonlight alone. But shortly there came a rumbling of hooves. Great horses pounded the distance. The sound swelled as if the hills themselves were rolling Manholmward. Scores of Ranihin approached. Covenant locked his knees to keep himself upright. His heart felt too weak to go on beating. He was dimly conscious of the hushed suspense of the spectators. Then the outer edge of the flat seemed to rise up redly, and a wave of Ranihin broke into the open, nearly a hundred chargers galloping abreast like a wall at Covenant. A cry of amazement and admiration came from the Raman, Few of the oldest main thralls had ever seen so many Ranihin at one time, and Covenant knew that he was looking at the proudest flesh of the land. He feared that they were going to trample him. But the pounding wall broke away to his left, ran around him until he was completely encircled, manes and tails tossing, forehead stars catching the firelight as they flashed past, five score Ranihin thundered on the turf and enclosed him. The sound of their hooves roared in his ears. Their circle drew tighter as they ran. Their reeling strength snatched at his fear, pulled him around with them, as if he were trying to face them all at once. His heart labored painfully. He could not turn fast enough to keep up with them. The effort made him stumble, lose his balance, fall to his knees. But the next instant he was erect again, with his legs planted against the vertigo of their circling, and his face contorted as if he were screaming, a cry lost in the thunder of Ranihin hooves. His arms spread as if they were braced against opposing walls of night. Slowly, tortuously, the circle came stamping and fretting to a halt. The Ranihin faced inward toward Covenant. Their eyes rolled and several of them had froth on their lips. At first he failed to comprehend their emotion. From the onlookers came a sudden cry. He recognized Laura's voice. Turning, he saw Pietan running toward the horses, with Laura struggling after him, too far behind to catch him. The child had caught everyone by surprise. They had been watching Covenant. Now Pietan reached the circle, and scrambled among the frenzied feet of the Ranihin. It seemed impossible that he would not be trampled. His head was no larger than one of their hooves, and the chargers were stamping, skittering. 
Then Covenant saw his chance. With an instinctive leap, he snatched Pietan from under one of the horses. His half-unfingered hand could not retain its grip. Pietan sprawled away from him. Immediately the child jumped to his feet. He dashed at Covenant and struck as hard as he could. They hate you, he raged. Go away! Moonlight fell into the flat as if it had sprung from the sides of the mountain. In the crimson glow, Pietan's little face looked like a wasteland. The child struggled, but Covenant lifted him off the ground, gripped him to his chest with both arms. Restraining Pietan in his hug, he looked up at the Ranihin. Now he understood. In the past, he had been too busy avoiding them to notice how they reacted to him. They were not threatening him. These great chargers were terrified, terrified of him. Their eyes shied off his face, and they scattered foam flecks about them. The muscles of their legs and chests quivered, yet they came agonized forward. Their old role was reversed. Instead of choosing their riders, they were submitting themselves to his choice. On an impulse, he unwrapped his left arm from Pietan and flourished his cold red ring at one of the horses. It flinched and ducked as if he had thrust a serpent at it, but it held its ground. He gripped Pietan again. The child's struggles were weaker now, as if Covenant's hug slowly smothered him. But the unbeliever clung. He stared wildly at the Ranihin, and wavered as if he could not regain his balance. But he had already made his decision. He had seen the Ranihin recognize his ring. Clenching Pietan to his heart like a helm, he cried, Listen, in a voice as hoarse as a sob. Listen. I'll make a bargain with you. Get it right. Hellfire, get it right. A bargain. Listen. I can't stand. I'm falling apart. Apart. He clenched Pietan. I see. I see what's happening to you. You're afraid. You're afraid of me. You think I'm some kind of... All right. You're free. I don't choose any of you. The Ranihan watched him fearfully. But you've got to do things for me. You've got to back off. That wail almost took the last of his strength. You, the land, he panted, pleaded. Let me be. Don't ask so much. But he knew that he needed something more from them in return for his forbearance, something more than their willingness to suffer his unbelief. Listen, listen. If I need you, you had better come, so that I don't have to be a hero. Get it right. His eyes bled tears, but he was not weeping. And, and there's one more thing, one more. Lena, Lena. A girl, she lives in Midhill Stonedown, daughter of Trell and Atiaran. I want, I want one of you to go to her, tonight, and every year. At the last full moon before the middle of spring, Ranihin are, are what she dreams about. He shook the tears out of his eyes and saw the Ranihin regarding him as if they understood everything he had tried to say. Now go, he gasped. Have mercy on me. With a sudden, bursting, united neigh, all the Ranihin reared around him, pawing the air over his head as if they were delivering promises. Then they wheeled, whinnying with relief, and charged away from Manholm. The moonlight did not appear to touch them. They dropped over the edge of the flat and vanished as if they were being welcomed into the arms of the earth. Almost at once, Laura reached Covenant's side. Slowly, he released Pietan to her. She gave him a long look that he could not read, then turned away. He followed her, trudging as if he were overburdened with the pieces of himself. He could hear the amazement of the Raman, amazement too strong for them to feel any offense at what he had done. He was beyond them. He could hear it. They reared to him, the whispers ran. But he did not care. He was perversely sick with the sense that he had mastered nothing, proved nothing, resolved nothing. Lord Moram came out to join him. 
Covenant did not meet Moram's gaze, but he heard complex wonder in the Lord's voice as he said, Er, Lord, ah, such honor has never been done to mortal man or woman. Many have come to the plains and have been offered to the Ranihin and refused. And when Lord Tamarantha, my mother, was offered, five Ranihin came to consider her. Five. It was a higher honor than she had dreamed possible. We could not hear. Have you refused them? Refused? Refused. Covenant groaned. They hate me. He pushed past Moram and shambled into Manholm. Moving unsteadily, like a ship with a broken keel, he headed toward the nearest cooking fire. The Raman made way for him, watched him pass with awe in their faces. He did not care. He reached the fire and grabbed the first food he saw. The meat slipped in his half-hand, so he held it with his left fist and devoured it. He ate blankly, swallowing food in chunks and taking more by the fistful. Then he wanted something to drink. He looked around, discovered foam followers standing nearby with a flagon of diamond draft, dwarfed in his huge hand. Covenant took the flagon and drained it. Then he stood numbly still, waiting for the diamond draft's effect. It came swiftly. Soon mist began to fill his head. His hearing seemed hollow, as if he were listening to man home from the bottom of a well. He knew that he was going to pass out, wanted hungrily to pass out. But before he lost consciousness, the hurt in his chest made him say, Giant, I, I need friends. Why do you believe that you have none? Covenant blinked and saw everything that he had done in the land. Don't be ridiculous. Then you do believe that we are real. What? Covenant groped for the giant's meaning with hands which had no fingers. You think us capable of not forgiving you, Foam Follower explained. Who would forgive you more readily than your dream? No, the unbeliever said. Dreams never forgive. Then he lost the firelight and Foam Follower's kind face and stumbled into sleep. Chapter 20 A Question of Hope He wandered, wincing in sleep, expecting nightmares, but he had none. Through the vague rise and fall of his drifting, as if even asleep his senses were alert to the land, he felt that he was being distantly watched. The gaze on him was anxious and beneficent. It reminded him of the old beggar who had made him read an essay on the fundamental question of ethics. When he woke up, he found that Manholm was bright with sunshine. The shadowed ceiling of the cave was dim, but light reflecting off the village floor seemed to dispel the oppressive weight of the stone. And the sun reached far enough into Manholm to tell Covenant that he had awakened early in the afternoon of a warm pre-summer day. He lay near the back of the cave in an atmosphere of stillness. Beside him sat Saltheart Foam Follower. Covenant closed his eyes momentarily. He felt he had survived a gauntlet, and he had an unfocused sense that his bargain was going to work. When he looked up again, he asked, How long have I been asleep? As if he had just been roused from the dead. Hail and welcome, my friend, returned the giant. You make my diamond draft appear weak. You have slept for only a night and a morning. Stretching luxuriously, Covenant said, Practice. I do so much of it, I'm becoming an expert. A rare skill, Foam Follower chuckled. Not really. There are more of us lepers than you might think. Abruptly he frowned as if he had caught himself in an unwitting violation of his promised forbearance. In order to avoid being taken seriously, he added, in a lugubrious tone, We're everywhere. But his attempt at humor only appeared to puzzle the giant. After a moment, Foam Follower said slowly, Are the others? Leper is not a good name. It is too short for such as you. 
I do not know the word, but my ears hear nothing in it but cruelty. Covenant sat up and pushed off his blankets. It's not cruel, exactly. The subject appeared to shame him. While he spoke, he could not meet Foam Follower's gaze. It's either a meaningless accident or a just desert. If it were cruel, it would happen more often. More often? Sure. If leprosy were an act of cruelty, by God or whatever, it wouldn't be so rare. Why be satisfied with a few thousand abject victims when you could have a few million? Accident, Foam Follower murmured. Just. My friend, you bewilder me. You speak with such haste. Perhaps the despiser of your world has only a limited power to oppose its creator. Maybe. Somehow I don't think my world works that way. Yet you said, did you not, that lepers are everywhere. That was a joke, or a metaphor. Covenant made another effort to turn his sarcasm into humor. I can never tell the difference. Foam Follower studied him for a long moment, then asked carefully, My friend, do you jest? Covenant met the giant's gaze with a sardonic scowl. Apparently not. I do not understand this mood. Don't worry about it. Covenant caught his chance to escape this conversation. Let's get some food. I'm hungry. To his relief, Foam Follower began laughing gently. Ah, Thomas Covenant, he chuckled. Do you remember our river journey to Lord's Keep? Apparently there is something in my seriousness which makes you hungry. Reaching down to one side, he brought up a tray of bread and cheese and fruit and a flask of spring wine. And he went on laughing quietly while Covenant pounced on the food. Covenant ate steadily for some time before he began looking around. Then he was taken aback to find that the cave was profuse with flowers. Garlands and bouquets lay everywhere, as if overnight each ramen had raised a garden thick with white columbines and greenery. The white and green eased the austerity of Manholm, covered the stone like a fine robe. Are you surprised? asked Foam Follower. These flowers honor you. Many of the ramen roamed all night to gather blooms. You have touched the hearts of the Ranihin, and the ramen are not unamazed or ungrateful. A wonder has come to pass for them. Five score Ranihin offering to one man. The ramen would not exchange such a sight for Andalane itself, I think. So they have returned what honor is in their power. Honor? Covenant echoed. The giant settled himself more comfortably and said, as if he were beginning a long tale, It is sad that you did not see the land before the desecration. Then the ramen might have shown you honor that would humble all your days. All matters were higher in that age, but even among the lords there were few beauties to equal the great craft of the ramen. Marrow meld, they called it, Anundivian Yajnya in the tongue of the old lords. Bone sculpting it was, from vulture and time-clean skeletons on the plains of Ra, the ramen formed figures of rare truth and joy. In their hands, under the power of their songs, the bones bent and flowed like clay, and were fashioned curiously, so that from the white core of lost life the ramen made emblems for the living, I have never beheld these figures, but the tale of them is preserved by the giants. In the destitution and diminishment, the long generations of hunger and hiding and homelessness, which came to the Ranihin and the Raman with the desecration, the skill of Maromeld was lost. His voice faded as he finished, and after a moment he began to sing softly, Stone and sea are deep in life. A silence of respectful attention surrounded him. The Winholms near him had stopped to listen. A short time later, one of them waved out toward the glade, and Covenant, following the gesture, saw Lithe striding briskly across the flat. 
She was accompanied by Lord Moram, astride a beautiful Roan Ranihin. The sight gladdened Covenant. He finished his spring wine in a salute to Moram. Yes, said Foam Follower, noticing Covenant's gaze. Much has occurred this morning. High Lord Prothal chose not to offer himself. He said that his old bones would better suit a lesser mount, meaning, I think, that he feared his old bones would give affront to the Ranihin. But it would be well not to underestimate his strength. Covenant heard a current of intimations running through Foam Follower's words. Distantly, he said, Prothal is going to resign after this quest, if it succeeds. The giant's eyes grinned. Is that prophecy? Covenant shrugged. You know as well as I do. He spends too much time thinking about how he hasn't mastered Kevin's lore. He thinks he's a failure, and he's going to go on thinking that, even if he gets the staff of law back. Prophecy, indeed. Don't laugh. Covenant wondered how he could explain the resonance of the fact that Prothol had refused a chance at the Ranihin. Anyway, tell me about Moram. Happily, Foam Follower said, Lord Moram, son of Ariel, was this day chosen by Hineril of the Ranihin, who also bore Tamarantha Variol mate. Behold, she is remembered with honor among the great horses. The Ramans say that no Ranihin has ever before borne two riders. Truly an age of wonders has come to the plains of Ra. Wonders, Covenant muttered. He did not like to remember the fear with which all those Ranihin had faced him. He glared into his flask as if it had cheated him by being empty. One of the nearest Windhomes started toward him, carrying a jug. He recognized Gay. She approached among the flowers, then stopped. When she saw that he was looking at her, she lowered her eyes. I would refill your flagon, she said, but I fear to offend. You will consider me a child. Covenant scowled at her. She affected him like a reproach, and he stiffened where he sat. With an effort that made him sound coldly formal, he said, Forget last night. It wasn't your fault. Awkwardly, he extended the flask toward her. She came forward and poured out spring wine for him with hands that shook slightly. He said distinctly, Thank you. She gazed at him widely for a moment, then a look of relief filled her face, and she smiled. Her smile reminded him of Lena. Deliberately, as if she were a burden he refused to shirk, he motioned for her to sit down. She placed herself cross-legged at the foot of his bed, gleaming at the honor the ring thane did her. Covenant tried to think of something to say to her. But before he found what he wanted, he saw Warhaft Quan striding into Manholm. Quan came toward him squarely, as if he were forging against Covenant's gaze, and when he neared the unbeliever, he waited only an instant before asking his question. We were concerned. Life needs food. Are you well? Well? Covenant felt he was beginning to glow with his second flask of spring wine. Can't you see? I can see you. You're as sound as an oak. You are close to us, said Quan, stolid with disapproval. What we see is not what you are. This ambiguous statement seemed to invite a mordant retort, but Covenant restrained himself. He shrugged and said, I'm eating as if he did not want to lay claim to too much health. Quan seemed to accept this reply for what it was worth. He nodded, bowed slightly, and left. Watching him go, when Homegay breathed, he dislikes you. Her tone expressed awe at the Warhaft's audacity and foolishness. She seemed to ask how he dared to feel as he did, as if Covenant's performance the previous night had exalted him in her eyes to the rank of a Ranihin. He has good reason, answered Covenant flatly. Gay looked unsure. As if she were reaching out for dangerous knowledge, she asked quickly, Because you are a... a leper? He could see her seriousness, but he felt that he had already said too much about lepers. 
Such talk compromised his bargain. No, he said. He just thinks I'm obnoxious. At this, she frowned as if she could hear his complex dishonesty. For a long moment, she studied the floor as if she were using the stone to measure his duplicity. Then she got to her feet, filled Covenant's flask to the brim from her jug. As she turned away, she said in a low voice, You do consider me a child. She walked with a defiant and fearful swing to her hips, as if she believed she was risking her life by treating the ring thane so insolently. He watched her young back and wondered at the pride of people who served horses and at the inner conditions which made telling the truth so difficult. From Gay, his gaze shifted to the outer edge of Manholm, where Moram and Lythe stood together in the sunlight. They were facing each other, she nut-brown and he blue-robed, and arguing like earth and sky. When he concentrated on them, he could make out what they were saying. I will, she insisted. No, hear me, Moram replied. He does not want it. You will only cause pain for him and for yourself. Covenant regarded them uneasily out of the cool, dim cave. Moram's rudder nose gave him the aspect of a man who faced fact squarely, and Covenant felt sure that indeed he did not want whatever Moram was arguing against. The dispute ended shortly. Mainthrow Lithe swung away from Moram and strode into the recesses of the village. She approached Covenant and surprised him entirely by dropping to her knees, bowing her forehead to the stone before him. With her palms on the floor beside her head, she said, I am your servant. You are the ring thane, master of the Ranihin. Covenant gaped at the back of her head. For an instant, he did not understand her. In his surprise, he could not conceive of any emotion powerful enough to make a main thrall bow so low. His face felt suddenly full of shame. I don't want a servant, he grated. But then he saw Moram frowning unhappily behind Lithe. He steadied himself, went on more gently. The honor of your service is beyond me. No, she averred without raising her head. I saw the Ranihin reared to you. He felt trapped. There seemed to be no way to stop her from humiliating herself without making her aware of the humiliation. He had lived without tact or humor for such a long time. But he had promised to be forbearant. And in the distance he had traveled since Midhill Stone Down, he had tasted the consequences of allowing the people of the land to treat him as if he were some kind of mythic figure. With an effort, he replied gruffly, Nevertheless, I'm not used to such things. In my own world, I'm just a little man. Your homage makes me uneasy. Softly, Moram sighed his relief, and Lythe raised her head to ask in wonder, Is it possible? Can such worlds be where you are not among the great? Take my word for it. Covenant drank deeply from his flask. Cautiously, as if fearful that he did not mean what he had said, she climbed to her feet. She threw back her head and shook her knotted hair. Covenant ring, Thane, it shall be as you choose, but we do not forget that the Ranihin reared to you. If there is any service we may do, only let it be known. You may command us in all things that do not touch the Ranihin. There is one thing, he said, staring at the mountain stone of the ceiling. Give Laura and Pietan a home. When he glanced at Lythe, he saw that she was grinning. He snapped fiercely. She's one of the heirs of soaring Woodhelven, and he's just a kid. They've been through enough to earn a little kindness. Gently, Moram interposed. Foam Follower has already spoken to the main thralls. They have agreed to care for Laura and Pietan. Lythe nodded. Such commands are easy. If the Ranihin did not challenge us more, we would spend most of our days in sleep. Still smiling, she left Covenant and cantered out into the sun. 
Moram also was smiling. You look better, our lord. Are you well? Covenant returned his attention to his spring wine. Quan asked me the same thing. How should I know? Half the time these days I can't even remember my name. I'm ready to travel, if that's what you're getting at. Good. We must depart as soon as may be. It is pleasant to rest here in safety. But we must go if we are to preserve such safeties. I will tell Quan and Tuvor to make preparation. But before the Lord could leave, Covenant said, Tell me something. Exactly why did we come here? You got yourself a Ranihin, but we lost four or five days. We could have skipped Morinmos. Do you wish to discuss tactics? We believe we will gain an advantage by going where Drool cannot expect us to go, and by allowing him time to respond to his defeat at Soaring Woodhelven. Our hope is that he will send out an army. If we arrive too swiftly, the army may still be in Mount Thunder. Covenant resisted the plausibility of this. You planned to come here long before we were attacked at Soaring Woodhelven. You planned it all along. I want to know why. Moram met Covenant's demand squarely, but his face tensed, as if he did not expect Covenant to like his answer. When we made our plans at Revelstone, I saw that good would come of this. You saw? I am an oracle. I see occasionally. And? And I saw rightly. Covenant was not ready to push the question further. It must be fun, but there was little sarcasm in his tone, and Moram laughed. His laughter emphasized the kindness of his lips. A moment later he was able to say without bitterness, I would rather see more such good. There is so little in these times. As the Lord walked away to ready the company, Foam Follower said, My friend, there is hope for you. Forsooth, Covenant sneered. Giant, if I were as big and strong as you, there would always be hope for me. Why? Do you believe that hope is a child of strength? Isn't it? Where do you get hope if you don't get it from power? If I'm wrong, by hell, there's a lot of lepers running around the world confused. How is power judged? Foam Follower asked with a seriousness Covenant had not expected. What? I do not like the way in which you speak of lepers. Where is the value of strength if your enemy is stronger? You assume there is some kind of enemy. I think that's a little too easy. I would like nothing better than, than to blame it on someone else, some enemy who afflicted me. But that's just another kind of suicide. Abdicate the responsibility to keep myself alive. Ah, alive, Foam Follower countered. No, consider further, Covenant. What value has power at all if it is not power over death? If you place hope on anything else, then your hope may mislead you. So? But the power over death is a delusion. There cannot be life without death. Covenant recognized that this was a fact, but he had not expected such an argument from the giant. It made him want to get out of the cave into the sunlight. Home follower, he muttered, climbing out of his bed. You've been thinking again. But he felt the intensity of Foam Follower's gaze. All right, so you're right. Tell me, just where the hell do you get hope? Slowly the giant rose to his feet. He towered over Covenant until his head nearly touched the ceiling. From faith. You've been dealing with humans too long. You're getting hasty. Faith is too short a word. What do you mean? Foam follower began picking his way among the flowers. I mean the Lord's. Consider covenant. Faith is a way of living. They have dedicated themselves wholly to the services of the land, and they have sworn the oath of peace, committed themselves to serve the great goal of their lives in only certain ways, to choose death rather than submit to the destruction of passion which blinded High Lord Kevin 
and brought the desecration. Come, can you believe that Lord Moram will ever despair? That is the essence of the oath of peace. He will never despair, nor ever do what despair commands, murder, desecrate, destroy. And he will never falter, because his lordship, his service to the land, will sustain him. Service enables service. That's not the same thing as hope. With the giant, Covenant moved out of Manholm to stand in the sunny flat. A bright light made him duck his head, and as he did so, he noticed again the moss stains which charted his rope. Abruptly, he looked back into the cave. There the greenery was arranged among the columbines to resemble moss lines on white samite. He stifled a groan. As if he were articulating a principle, he said, All you need to avoid despair is irremediable stupidity or unlimited stubbornness. No, insisted Foam Follower. The lords are not stupid. Look at the land. He gestured broadly with his arm, as if he expected Covenant to view the whole country from border to border. Covenant's gaze did not go so far, but he looked blinking beyond the green flat toward the plains. He heard the distant whistles of the blood guard call to the Ranihan and the nickering answer. He noticed the fond wonder of the Windholms, who came out of the cave because they were too eager to wait in Manholm until the Ranihan appeared. After a moment, he said, In other words, hope comes from the power of what you serve, not from yourself. Hellfire, giant, you forget who I am. Do I? Anyway, what makes you such an expert on hope? I don't see that you've got anything to despair about. No. The giant's lips smiled, but his eyes were hard under his buttressed brows, and his forehead scar shone vividly. Do you forget that I have learned to hate? Do... But let that pass. How if I tell you that I serve you? I, salt-heart foam follower, giant of sea-reach, and legate of my people. Covenant heard echoes in the question, like the distant rack of timbers barely perceived through a high silent wind, and he recoiled. Don't talk like a damned mystic. Say something I can understand. Foam follower reached down to touch Covenant's chest with one heavy finger, as if he marked a spot on Covenant's mapped robe. Unbeliever, you hold the fate of the land in your hands. Soul Crusher moves against the lords at the very time when our dreams of home have been renewed. Must I explain that you have the power to save us, or orphan us, until we share whatever doom awaits the land? Hellfire, Covenant snapped. How many times have I told you that I'm a leper? It's all a mistake. Fowls playing tricks on us. The giant responded simply and quietly. Then are you so surprised to learn that I have been thinking about hope? Covenant met foam follower's eyes under the scarred overhang of his forehead. The giant watched him, as if the hope of the unhomed were a sinking ship, and Covenant ached with the sense of his own helplessness to save that hope. But then foam follower said, as if he were coming to Covenant's rescue, be not concerned, my friend. This tale is yet too brief for any of us to guess its ending. As you say, I have spent too much time with hastening humans. My people would laugh greatly to see me, a giant who has not patience enough for a long story. And the lords contain much which may yet surprise Soul Crusher. Be of good heart. It may be that you and I have already shared our portion of the terrible purpose of these times. Gruffly, Covenant said, Giant, you talk too much. Foam Follower's capacity for gentleness surpassed him. Muttering, hell fire, to himself, he turned away, went in search of his staff and knife. He could hear the noises of preparation from beyond the flat, and in the village the Windholms were busy packing food in saddlebags. The company was readying itself, and he did not want to be behindhand. He found his staff and knife 
with the bundle of his clothes laid out on a slab of stone amid the flowers, as if on display. Then he got a flustered, eager wind home to provide him with water, soap, and a mirror. He felt that he owed himself a shave. But when he had set the mirror so that he could use it, and had doused his face in water, he found Pietan standing solemnly in front of him, and in the mirror he saw that Laura was behind him. Pietan stared at him as if the unbeliever were as intangible as a wisp of smoke, and Laura's face seemed tight, as if she were forcing herself to do something she disliked. She pushed her hand unhappily through her hair, then said, You asked the Raman to make a home for us here. He shrugged. So did Foam Follower. Why? His hearing picked out whole speeches of meaning behind her question. She held his gaze in the mirror, and he saw the memory of a burning tree in her eyes. He asked carefully, Do you really think you might get a chance to hit back at Fowl, or be able to use it if you got it? He looked away at Pietan. Leave it to Moram and Prothol. You can trust them. Of course. Her tone said as clearly as words that she was incapable of distrusting the lords. Then take the job you already have. Here's Pietan. Think about what's going to happen to him. More of what you've already been through. He needs help. Pietan yawned as if he were awake past his bedtime and said, They hate you. He sounded as sober as an executioner. How? Laura returned defiantly. Have you observed him? Have you seen how he sits awake at night? Have you seen how his eyes devour the moon? Have you seen his relish for a taste of blood? He is no child, no more. She spoke as if Pietan were not there listening to her, and Pietan listened as if she were reciting some formula of no importance. He is treachery concealed in a child's form. How can I help him? Covenant wet his face again and began lathering soap. He could feel Laura's presence bearing on the back of his neck as he rubbed lather into his beard. Finally, he muttered, Try the Ronihan. He likes them. When she reached over him to take Pietan's hand and draw the child away, Covenant sighed and set the knife to his beard. His hand was unsteady. He had visions of cutting himself. But the blade moved over his skin as smoothly as if it could remember that Atiaran had refused to injure him. By the time he was done, the company had gathered outside Manholm. He hurried out to join the riders, as if he feared that the crest would leave without him. The last adjustments of saddles and saddlebags were in progress, and shortly Covenant stood beside Dura. The condition of the horses surprised him. They all gleamed with good grooming, and looked as well fed and rested as if they had been under the care of the Raman since the middle of spring. Some of the Eoman mounts, which had been most exhausted, were now pawing the ground and shaking their manes eagerly. The whole company seemed to have forgotten where they were going. The warriors were laughing together. Old Birinair clucked and scolded over the way the Raman handed his Lillian real brands. He treated the Raman like spoiled children, and appeared to enjoy himself almost too much to hide it behind his dignity. Moram sat smiling broadly on Hinero, and High Lord Protho stood relaxed by his mount as if he had shed years of care. Only the blood guard, already mounted and waiting on their Ranihan, remained stern. The company's good spirits disturbed Covenant like a concealed threat. He understood that it arose in part from rest and reassurance, but he felt sure that it also arose from his meeting with the Ranihan. Like the Roman, the warriors had been impressed. Their desire to see in him a new barrack had been vindicated. The white gold wielder had shown himself to be a man of consequence. The Ranihan were terrified, he snapped to himself. They saw Fowl's hold on me, and they were terrified. But he did not remonstrate aloud. He had made a promise of forbearance in return for his survival. 
despite the tacit dishonesty of allowing his companions to believe what they wished of him, he held himself still. As the riders laughed and joked, main thrall Lithe came to stand before them, followed by several other main thralls and a large group of cords. When she had the company's attention, she said, The lords have asked for the help of the Raman in their fight against Fang Thane the Render. The Raman serve the Ranihin. We do not leave the plains of Ra. That is life, and it is good. We ask for nothing else until the end, when all the earth is underlain, and man and Ranihin live together in peace, without wolves or hunger. But we must aid the foes of Fang Thane as we can. This we will do. I will go with you. My cords will go with you, if they choose. We will care for your horses on the way. And when you leave them to seek Fang Thane's hiding in the ground, we will keep them safe. Lords, accept this service as honor among friends and loyalty among allies. At once, the cords Hearn, Thew, Grace, and Rusta stepped forward and avowed their willingness to go wherever main thrall Lithe would lead them. Prothol bowed to Lithe in the Raman fashion. The service you offer is great. We know that your hearts are with the Ranihin. As friends, we would refuse this honor if our need as allies were not so great. The doom of these times compels us to refuse no aid or succor. Be welcome among us. Your hunter's skill will greatly ease the hazards of our way. We hope to do you honor in return, if we survive our quest. Kill Fang Thane, said Lythe. That will do us honor enough to the end of our days. She returned Prothal's bow, and all the assembled Raman joined her. Then the High Lord spoke to his companions. In a moment, a quest for the Staff of Law was mounted and ready to ride. Led by main thrall Lithe and her cords, the company cantered away from Manholm, as if in the village of the Raman they had found abundant courage. Chapter 21 Treacher's Gorge they crossed the plains northward in confidence and good spirits. No danger or report of danger appeared anywhere along their way, and the Ronihan rode the grasslands like live blazonry, challenges uttered in flesh. Foam follower told gay tales as if he wished to show that he had reached the end of a passing travail. Quan and his warriors responded with reposts and jests and the Raman entertained them with displays of hunting skill. The company rode late into the first night, in defiance of the dismal moon, and the second night they camped on the south bank of Rome's Edge Ford. But early the next morning they crossed the ford and turned northeast up a broad way between the Rome's Edge and Moran Moss. By mid-afternoon they reached the eastmost edge of the forest. From there, the Rome's Edge, the northern border of the plains, swung more directly eastward, and the company went on northeast, away from both Moran Moss and the plains of Ra. At night they slept on the edge of a stark, unfriendly flatland, where no people lived and few willingly traveled. The whole region north of them was cut and scarred and darkened, like an ancient battleground a huge field that had been ruined by the shedding of too much blood. Scrub grass, stunted trees, and a few scattered aliantha took only slight hold on the uncompromising waste. The company was due south of Mount Thunder. As the quest angled northeastward across this land, Moran told Covenant some of its history. It spread east to Landsdrop, and formed the natural front of attack for Lord Fowle's armies in the ancient wars. From the fall of the river Landrider to Mount Thunder was open terrain along the great cliff of Landsdrop. The hordes issuing from Fowle's crèche could ascend in scores of places to bring battle to the upper land. So it was that the first great battles in all the land's wars against the despiser 
occurred across this ravaged plain. Age after age, the defenders strove to halt Lord Fowl at Landsdrop, and failed, because they could not block all the ways up from the spoiled plains and Sarangrave Flat. Then Lord Fowl's armies passed westward along the Mithill and struck deep into the center plains. In the last war, before Kevin Landwaster had been finally driven to invoke the ritual of desecration, Lord Fowl had crushed through the heart of the center plains and had turned north to force the lords to their final battle at Kurash Plenathor, now named Trothgard. In the presence of so much old death, the riders did not travel loudly, but they sang songs during the first few days, and several times they returned to the legend-telling of Beric Halfhand and the fire lions of Mount Thunder. On this wilderland Beric had fought, suffering the deaths of his friends and the loss of his fingers in battle. Here he had met despair, and had fled to the slopes of Graven Threndor, the peak of the fire lions and there he had found both earth friendship and earth power. It was a comforting song, and the riders sang its refrain together, as if they sought to make it true for themselves. Merrick, earth friend, help and wheel, battle aid against the foe. Earth gives and answers power's peal, ringing earth friend, help and heal. Cleanse the land from bloody death and woe. They needed its comfort. The hard rift and harrowed warland seemed to say that Beric's victory was an illusion, that all his earth friendship and his staff of law and his lineage of lords, his mighty works and the works of his descendants, amounted to so much scrub grass and charred rock and dust, that the true history of the land was written here, in the bare topsoil and stone, which lay like a litter of graves from the plains of Ra to Mount Thunder from Andalane to Landsdrop. The atmosphere of the region agitated Foam Follower. He strode at Covenant's side with an air of concealed urgency, as if he were repressing a desire to break into a run. And he talked incessantly, striving to buoy up his spirits with a constant stream of stories and legends and songs. At first his efforts pleased the riders, appeasing their deepening, hungry gloom like treasure berries of entertainment. But the questers were on their way toward the bleak, black prospect of drool rockworm, crouched like a bane in the catacombs of Mount Thunder. By the fourth day from Rome's Edge Ford, Covenant felt that he was drowning in giantish talk, and the voices of the warriors when they sang sounded more pleading than confident, like whistling against inexorable night. With a Raman to help him, Prothal found rapid ways over the rough terrain. Long after sunset on that fourth day, when the growing moon stood high and baleful in the night sky, the quest made a weary camp on the edge of Landsdrop. The next dawn, Covenant resisted the temptation to go and look over the great cliff. He wanted to catch a glimpse of the lower land, of the spoiled plains and Sarangrave flat, regions which had filled foam followers' talk in the past days, but he had no intention of exposing himself to an attack of vertigo. The fragile stability of his bargain did not cover gratuitous risks, so he remained in the camp when most of his companions went to gaze out over Landsdrop. But later, as the company rode north within a stone's throw of the edge, he asked Lord Moram to tell him about the great cliff. Ah, Landsdrop, Moram responded quietly. There is talk, unfounded even in the oldest legends, that the cleft of Landsdrop was caused by the sacrilege which buried immense veins under Mount Thunder's roots. In a cataclysm that shook its very heart, the earth heaved with revulsion at the evils it was forced to contain and the force of that dismay broke the upper land from the lower, lifted it toward the sky. So this cliff reaches from deep in the southern range, past the fall of the river Landrider, through the heart of Mount Thunder, at least half a thousand leagues into the mapless winter of the northern climes. 
It varies in height from place to place, but it stands across all the land and does not allow us to forget. The Lord's rough voice only sharpened Covenant's anxiety. As the company rode, he held his gaze away to the west, trusting the wilderland to anchor him against his instinctive fear of heights. Before noon, the weather changed. Without warning, a sharp wind, bristling with grim preternatural associations, sprang out of the north. In moments, black clouds seethed across the sky. Lightning ripped the air. Thunder pounded like a crushing of boulders. Then, out of the bawling sky, rain struck like a paroxysm of rage, hit with savage force until it stung. The horses lowered their heads as if they were wincing. Torrents battered the riders, drenched, blinded them. Mainthrall Lithe sent her cord scouting ahead to keep the company from plunging over Landsdrop. Prothal raised his staff with bright fire flaring at its tip to help keep his companions from losing each other. They huddled together, and the blood guard positioned the Ronihin around them to bear the brunt of the attack. In the white revelations of the lightning, Prothal's flare appeared dim and frail, and thunder detonated hugely over it, as if exploding at the touch of folly. Covenant crouched low on Dura's back, flinched away from the lightning, as if the sky were stone which the thunder shattered. He could not see the cords, did not know what was happening around him. He was constantly afraid that Dura's next step would take him over the cliff. He clenched his eyes to Prothal's flame, as if it would keep him from being lost. The skill and simple toughness of the Raman preserved the company, kept it moving toward Mount Thunder. But the journey seemed like wandering in the collapse of the heavens. The riders could only be sure of their direction because they were always forcing their way into the maw of the storm. The wind flailed the rain at their faces until their eyes felt lacerated and their cheeks shredded, and the cold drenching stiffened their limbs, paralyzed them slowly, like the rigor of death. But they went on as if they were trying to beat down a wall of stone with their foreheads. For two full days they pushed onward, felt themselves crumbling under the onslaught of the rain, but they knew neither day nor night, knew nothing but one continuous, pummeling, dark, savage, implacable storm. They rode until they were exhausted, rested on their feet, knee-deep in water and mud, gripping the reins of their horses, ate sopping morsels of food half-warmed by Lillian Rill fires, which Birenair struggled to keep half alive, counted themselves to be sure no one had been lost, and rode again until they were forced by exhaustion to stop again. At times they felt that Prothol's wan blue flame alone sustained them. Then Lord Moram moved among the company. In the lurid lightning his face appeared awash with water, like a foundering wreck, but he went to each quester, shouted through the howl of wind and rain the devastating thunder. Drool, storm for us, but he mistaken. Main force passes west. Take heart, augurs for us. Covenant was too worn and cold to respond, but he heard the generous courage behind Moram's words. When the company started forward again, he squinted ahead toward Prothal's flame, as if he were peering into a mystery. The struggle went on, prolonged itself far beyond the point where it felt unendurable. In time, endurance itself became abstract, a mere concept, too impalpable to carry conviction. The lash and riot of the storm reduced the riders to raw, quivering flesh, hardly able to cling to their mounts. But Prothol's fire burned on. At each new flash and blast, Covenant reeled in his seat. He wanted nothing in life but a chance to lie down in the mud. But Prothol's fire burned on. It was like a manacle, imprisoning the riders, dragging them forward. In the imminent madness of the torrents, Covenant gritted his gaze as if that manacle were precious to him. Then they passed the boundary. It was as abrupt as if the wall against which they had thrown themselves, like usurped titans, 
had suddenly fallen into mud. Within ten stumbling heartbeats, the end of the storm blew over them, and they stood gasping in a sun-bright noon. They could hear the tumult rushing blindly away. Around them were the remains of the deluge, broken pools and streams and fens, thick mud like wreckage on the battle plain. And before them stood the great ravaged head of Mount Thunder, Graven Threndor, peak of the fire lions. For a long moment it held them like an aegis of silence, grim, grave, and august, like an outcropping of the earth's heart. The peak was north and slightly west of them. Taller than Kevin's watch above the upper land, it seemed to kneel on the edge of the Saran grave, with its elbows braced on the plateau, and its head high over the cliff, fronting the sky in a strange attitude of pride and prayer, and it rose twelve thousand feet over the defile's course, which flowed eastward from its feet. Its sides, from its crumpled foothills to the raw rock of its crown, were bare, not cloaked or defended from storms, snows, besieging time by any trees or grasses, but instead wearing sheer, fragmented cliffs like facets, some as black as obsidian and others as gray as the ash of a granite fire, as if the stone of the mount were too thick, too charged with power to bear any gentle kind of life. There, deep in the hulky chest of the mountain, was the destination of the quest, Kiro Thrindor, Heart of Thunder. They were still ten leagues from the peak, but the distance was deceptive. Already that scarred visage dominated the northern horizon. It confronted them over the rift of Landsdrop like an irrefusable demand. Mount Thunder. There Beric Halfhand had found his great revelation. There the quest for the Staff of Law hoped to regain the future of the land. And there Thomas Covenant sought release from the impossibility of his dreams. The company stared at the upraised rock, as if it searched their hearts, asked them questions which they could not answer. Then Quan grinned fiercely and said, At least now we have been washed clean enough for such work. That incongruity cracked the trance which held the riders. Several of the warriors burst into laughter, as if recoiling from the strain of the past two days, and most of the others chuckled, daring drool or any enemy to believe that the storm had weakened them. Though nearly prostrated by the exertion of finding a path through the torrents on foot, the Raman laughed as well, sharing a humor they did not fully understand. Only Foam Follower did not respond. His eyes were fixed on Mount Thunder, and his brows overhung his gaze, as if shielding it from something too bright or hot to be beheld directly. The questers found a relatively dry hillock on which to rest and eat and feed their mounts, and Foam Follower went with them absently. While the company made itself as comfortable as possible for a time, he stood apart and gazed at the mountain as if he were reading secrets in its scored crevices and cliffs. Softly he sang to himself, Now we are unhomed, bereft of root and kith and kin. From other mysteries of delight we set our sails to resail our track. But the winds of life blew not the way we chose, and the land beyond the sea was lost. High Lord Prothol let the company rest for as long as he dared in the open plain. Then he moved on again for the remainder of the afternoon, clinging to the edge of land's drop as if it were his only hope. Before the storm, Covenant had learned that the sole known entrance to the catacombs of Mount Thunder was through the western chasm of the Soul's Ease, Treacher's Gorge, the rocky maw which swallowed the river, only to spit it out again eastward on the lower land, transmogrified by hidden turbulent depths into the defile's course a stream gray with the sludge and waste of the white warrens. So Prothol's hope lay in his southeastern approach. He believed that by reaching Mount Thunder on the south and moving toward Treacher's Gorge from the east, the company could arrive unseen and unexpected at the gorge's western exposure. 
but he took no unnecessary risks. Grabenthrendor stood perilously large against the sky and seemed already to lean looming toward the company as if the peak itself were bent to the shape of drool's malice. He urged the tired Roman to their best cunning in choosing a way along Landstrop, and he kept the riders moving until after the sun had set. But all the time he rode slumped agedly in his saddle, with his head bowed, as if he were readying his neck for the stroke of an axe. He seemed to have spent all his strength in pulling his companions through the storm. Whenever he spoke, his long years rattled in his throat. The next morning the sun came up like a wound into ashen skies. Gray clouds overhung the earth, and a shuddering wind fell like a groan from the slopes of Mount Thunder. Across the wasteland, the pools of rainwater began to stagnate, as if the ground refused to drink the moisture, leaving it to rot instead. And as they prepared to ride, the questers heard a low rumble, like the march of drums deep in the rock. They could feel the throb in their feet, in their knee joints. It was the high beat of mustering war. The High Lord answered as if it were a challenge. Melancholian, he called clearly. Arise, champions of the land. I hear the drums of the earth. This is the great work of our time. He swung onto his horse with his blue robe fluttering. Warhaft Quan responded with a cheer. Hail, High Lord Protho. We are proud to follow. Prothal's shoulders squared. His horse lifted its ears, raised its head, took a few prancing steps as grandly as a Ranihin. The Ranihin nickered humorously at the sight, and the company rode after Prothal boldly, as if the spirits of the ancient lords were in them. They made their way to the slopes of Mount Thunder, through the constant buried rumble of the drums. As they found a path across the thickening rubble which surrounded the mountain, the booming subterranean call accompanied them like an exhalation of despite. But when they started up the first battered sides of the peak, they forgot the drums. They had to concentrate on the climb. The foothills were like a gnarled stone mantle which Mount Thunder had shrugged from its shoulders in ages long past, and the way westward over the slopes was hard. Time and again, the riders were forced to dismount to lead their mounts down tricky hills or over gray piles of tumbled ashen rock. The difficulty of the terrain made their progress slow, despite all the Raman could do to search out the easiest trails. The peak seemed to lean gravely over them, as if watching their small struggles, and down onto them from the towering cliffs came a chilling wind as cold as winter. At noon, Prothal halted in a deep gully which ran down the mountainside like a cut. There the company rested and ate. When they were not moving, they could hear the drums clearly, and the cold wind seemed to pounce on them from the cliffs above. They sat in the straight light of the sun and shivered, some at the cold, others at the drums. During the halt, Moran came over to Covenant and suggested that they climb away up the gully together. Covenant nodded. He was glad to keep himself busy. He followed the Lord up the cut's contorted spine until they reached a break in its west wall. Moram entered the break, and when Covenant stepped in behind the Lord, he got a broad, sudden view of Andalane. From the altitude of the break, between the stone walls, he felt that he was looking down over Andalane from a window in the side of Mount Thunder. The hills lay richly over all the western horizon, and their beauty took his breath away. He stared hungrily with a feeling of stasis, of perfect pause in his chest, like a quick grip of eternity. The lush, clear health of Andalane shone like a country of stars despite the gray skies and the dull battle roll. He felt obscurely unwilling to breathe, to break the trance, but after a moment his lungs began to hurt for air. Here is the land, Moram whispered, grim, powerful Mount Thunder above us, the darkest veins and secrets of the earth in the catacombs beneath our feet, the battleground behind, Sarengrave flat below. And there, 
priceless underling, the beauty of life. Yes, this is the heart of the land. He stood reverently, as if he felt himself to be in an august presence. Covenant looked at him. So you brought me up here to convince me that this is worth fighting for. His mouth twisted on the bitter taste of shame. You want something from me, some declaration of allegiance, before you have to face drool. The cave whites he had slain lay hard and cold in his memory. Of course, the Lord replied, but it is the land itself which asks for your allegiance. Then he said with sudden intensity, Behold, Thomas Covenant, use your eyes, look upon it all, look and listen, hear the drums, and hear me. This is the heart of the land. It is not the home of the despiser. He has no place here. Oh, he desires the power of the banes, but his home is in Fowl's Cresh, not here. He has not depth or sternness or beauty enough for this place, and when he works here it is through Irviles or Cave Whites. Do you see? I see. Covenant met the Lord's gaze flatly. I've already made my bargain, my peace, if you want to call it that. I'm not going to do any more killing. Your peace? Moram echoed in a complex tone. Slowly the danger dimmed in his eyes. Well, you must pardon me. In times of trouble, some lords behave strangely. He passed Covenant and started back down the gully. Covenant remained in the window for a moment, watching Moram go. He had not missed the Lord's oblique reference to Kevin, but he wondered what kinship Moram saw between himself and the land waster. Did the Lord believe himself capable of that kind of despair? Muttering silently, Covenant returned to the company. He saw a measuring look in the eyes of the warriors, they were trying to assess what had occurred between him and Lord Moram, but he did not care what portents they read into him. When the company moved on, he led Yura up the side of the gully, blank to the shifting shale, which more than once dropped him to his hands and knees, scratching and bruising him dangerously. He was thinking about the celebration of spring, about the battle of soaring Woodhelven, about children and Laura and Pietan and Atiaran and the nameless unfettered one and Lena and Chayak and the warrior who had died defending him, thinking and striving to tell himself that his bargain was secure, that he was not angry enough to risk fighting again. That afternoon the company struggled on over the arduous ground, drawing slowly higher as they worked westward. They caught no glimpses of their destination. Even when the sun fell low in the sky and the roar of waters became a distinct accompaniment to the buried beat of the drums, they were still not able to see the gorge. But then they entered a sheer, sheltered ravine in the mountainside. From this ravine, a rift too narrow for the horses angled away into the rock, and through it they could hear a snarling current. In the ravine, the riders left their mounts under the care of the cords. They went ahead on foot, down the rift as it curved into the mountain, and then broke out of the cliff no more than a hundred feet directly above Treacher's Gorge. They no longer heard the drums. The tumult of the river smothered every sound but their own half-shouts. The walls of the chasm were high and sheer, blocking the horizon on either side. But through the spray that covered them like a mist, they could see the gorge itself the tight rock channel constricting the river until it appeared to scream, and the wild, white, sunset flame-plumed water thrashing as if it fought against its own frantic rush. From nearly a league away to the west, the river came writhing down the gorge and sped below the company into the guts of the mountain as if sucked into an abyss. Above the gorge, the setting sun hung near the horizon like a ball of blood in the leaden sky, and the light gave a shade of fire to the few hardy trees that clung to the rims of the chasm as if rooted by duty. But within Treacher's Gorge was nothing but spray and sheer stone walls 
and tortured waters. The roar inundated Covenant's ears, and the mist-wet rock seemed to slip under his feet. For an instant the cliffs reeled. He could feel the maw of Mount Thunder gaping for him. Then he snatched himself back into the rift, stood with his back pressed against the rock, hugged his chest, and fought not to gasp. There was activity around him. He heard shouts of surprise and fear from the warriors at the end of the rift, heard foam followers strangled howl. But he did not move. He clenched himself against the rock in the mist and roar of the river until his knees steadied and the scream of slippage eased in his feet. Only then did he go to find out what caused the distress of his companions. He kept one hand braced on the wall and moved the other from shoulder to shoulder among the company as he went forward. Between Covenant and the cliff, foam followers struggled. Two bloodguard clung to his arms, and he battered them against the sides of the rift, hissing rapaciously, Release me, release, I want them, as if he wished to leap down into the gorge. No. Abruptly, Prothol stood before the giant. The backlight of the sunset dimmed his face as he stood silhouetted against the glow with his arms wide and his staff held high. He was old and only half the giant's size, but the orange-red fire seemed to expand him, make him taller, more full of authority. Rock, brother, master yourself. By the seven, do you rave? At that, Foam Follower threw off the blood guard. He caught the front of Prothol's robe, heaved the high lord into the air, pinned him against the wall. Into his face the giant wheezed as if he were choking with rage. Rave, do you accuse me? The bloodguard sprang toward Foam Follower, but a shout from Moram stopped them. Prothol hung clamped against the stone like a handful of old rags, but his eyes did not flinch. He repeated, do you rave? For one horrible moment, Foam Follower held the High Lord as if he meant to murder him with one huge squeeze of his fist. Covenant tried to think of something to say, some way to intervene, but could not. He had no conception of what had happened to Foam Follower. Then, from behind Covenant, First Mark Tuvor said clearly, A raver? In one of the Sea Reach giants? Impossible. As if impaled by Tuvor's assertion, Foam Follower broke into a convulsion of coughing. The violence of his reaction knotted his gnarled frame. He lowered Prothol, then collapsed backward, falling with a thud against the opposite wall. Slowly, his paroxysm changed into a low chuckle, like the glee of hysteria. Heard through the groaning of the river, that sound made Covenant's skin crawl like a slimy caress. He could not abide it. Driven by a need to learn what had befallen Foam Follower, he moved forward to look into the gorge. There, braced now against his vertigo and the inundation of the river roar, he saw what had ignited Foam Follower. Ah, giant, he groaned, to kill. Below him, and barely twenty feet above the level of the river, was a narrow roadway like a ledge in the south wall of the gorge, and along the roadway to the beat of unheard drums marched an army of cave whites out of Mount Thunder. Captained by a wedge of Irviles, file after file of the gangrel creatures jerked out of the mountain and tramped along the ledge with a glare of lust in their lava eyes. Thousands had already left their white warrants, and behind them the files continued, as if Mount Thunder were spewing all the hordes of its inhabiting vermin onto the undefended earth. Foam follower. For a moment Covenant's heart beat to the rhythm of the giant's pain. He could not bear to think that Foam follower and his people might lose their hope of home because of creatures like those. Is killing the only answer? Numbly, half blindly, he began looking for the way in which Foam Follower had meant to reach the ledge and the cave whites. He found it easily enough. It looked simple for anyone not timorous of heights. 
There was a rude, slick stair cut into the rock of the south wall from the rift down to the roadway. Opposite it were steps which went from the rift up to the top of the gorge. They were as grey, spray-worn, and old as native stone. Lord Moram had come up behind Covenant. His voice reached dimly through the river roar. This is the ancient look of Treacher's Gorge. That part of the first ward which tells of this place is easily understood. It was formed for the watch and concealment of the betrayers. For here, at Treacher's Gorge, Lord Fowl the Despiser revealed his true self to High Lord Kevin. Here was struck the first blow of the open war, which ended in the ritual of desecration. Before that time, Kevin Landwaster doubted Lord Fowl without knowing why, for the despiser had enacted no ill which Kevin could discover, and he showed trust for Lord Fowl out of shame for his unworthy doubt. Then, through the despiser's plotting, a message came to the Council of Lords from the Demon Dim in Mount Thunder. The message asked the lords to come to the Demon Dim lore works, the spawning crypts where the Irviles were made, to meet with the lore masters, who claimed knowledge of a secret power. Clearly, Lord Fowl intended for Kevin to go to Mount Thunder, but the High Lord doubted and did not go. Then he was ashamed of his doubt and sent in his stead some of his truest friends and strongest allies. So a high company of the old lords rafted, as was their wont, down the soul's ease through Andalane to Mount Thunder. And here, in the roar and spray and ill of Treacher's Gorge, they were ambushed by Irviles. They were slaughtered, and their bodies sent to the abyss of the mountain. Then marched armies like these out of the catacombs, and the land was plunged all unready into war. That long conflict went on, battle after death-littered battle without hope. High Lord Kevin fought bravely, but he had sent his friends into ambush. Soon he began his midnight meetings with despair, and there was no hope. The seductive, dizzy rush of the river drained Covenant's resistance. Spray beaded on his face like sweat. Foam follower had wanted to do the same thing, leap into the writhing allure of the gorge, fall on the cave whites from ambush. With an effort that made him moan through his clenched teeth, Covenant backed away from the look. Gripping himself against the wall, he asked without apparent transition, Is he still laughing? Moram appeared to understand. No. Now he sits and quietly sings the song of the unhomed, and gives no sign. Foam follower, Covenant breathed. Why did you stop the blood guard? He might have hurt Prothal. The Lord turned his back on Treacher's Gorge to face Covenant. Saltheart Foam follower is my friend. How could I interfere? A moment later he added, The High Lord is not defenseless. Covenant persisted. Maybe a raver... No. Moram's flat assertion acknowledged no doubt. Tuvor spoke truly. No raver has the might to master a giant. But something, Covenant groped, something is hurting him. He, he doesn't believe those omens. He thinks drool, or something, is going to prevent the giants from going home. Moram's reply was so soft that Covenant was forced to read it on his crooked lips. So do I. Foam follower. Covenant looked down the rift at the giant. In the darkness, Foam follower sat like a lump of shale against one wall, singing quietly and staring at invisible visions on the stone before him. The sight brought up a surge of sympathetic anger in Covenant, but he clamped it down, clutched his bargain. The walls of the rift leaned in toward him, like suffocating fear, dark wings. He thrust himself past the giant and out toward the ravine. Before long, the company gathered there for supper. They ate by the light of one dim, lillian-rilled torch. And when the meal was done, 
they tried to get some sleep. Covenant felt that rest was impossible. He sensed the army of cave whites unrolling like a skein of destruction for the weaving of the land's death. But the ceaseless roar of the river lulled him until he relaxed against the ground. He dozed slightly, with the drums of war throbbing in the rock under him. Later he found himself sharply awake. The red moon had passed the crest of Mount Thunder and now glared straight down on the ravine. He guessed that midnight was past. At first he thought that the moon had roused him with its nearly full stare, but then he realized that the vibration of the drums was gone from the rock. He glanced around the camp and saw Tuvor whispering with High Lord Prothol. The next moment Tuvor began waking the sleepers. Soon the warriors were alert and ready. Covenant had his knife in the belt of his robe, his staff in his hand. Deerenair held aloft a rod with a small flame flickering from its tip, and in that uncertain light Moram and Prothol stood together with main thrall lithe, warhaft Quan, and the first mark. Dim shadows shifted like fear and resolution across Prothol's face. His voice sounded weak with age as he said, Now is our last hour of open sky. The outpouring of Drool's army has ended. Those of us who will must go into the catacombs of Mount Thunder. We must take this chance to enter while Drool's attention is still with his army, before he can perceive that we are not where he thinks us to be. Now is the time for those who would to lay down the quest. There can be no retreat or escape after failure in the White Warrants. The quest has already been bravely served. None who now lay it down need feel shame. Carefully, Quan said, Do you turn back, High Lord? Ah, no, sighed Prothol. The hand of these times is upon me. I dare not falter. Then Quan replied, can a eoman of the warward of lords keep turn back when the high lord leads? Never. And the eoman echoed, Never. Covenant wondered where Foam Follower was, what the giant would do. For himself, he felt intuitively sure that he had no choice, that his dream would only release him by means of the staff of law, or by death. The next moment, Main Thrall Lithe spoke to Prothal. Her head was back, and her slim form was primed as if she were prepared to explode. I gave my word. Your horses will be tended. The cords will preserve them in hope of your return. But I... She shook her bound hair as if she were defying herself. I will go with you, under the ground. Prothal's protest she stopped with a sharp gesture. You set an example I must follow. How could I stand before a Ronihan again if I come so far only to turn away when the peril becomes great? And I feel something more. The Raman know the sky, the open earth. We know air and grass. We do not lose our way in darkness. The Ronihan have taught our feet to be sure. I feel that I will always know my way outward. You may have need of me though I am far from the plains of Ra and from myself. The shadows formed Prothol's face into a grimace, but he responded quietly, I thank you, Mainthrall. The Raman are brave friends of the land. Casting his eyes over the whole company, he said, Come then, the outcome of our quest awaits. Whatever may befall us, as long as there are people to sing, they will sing that in this dark hour the land was well championed. Now, be true to the last. Without waiting for an answer, he went out of the bloody moonlight into the rift. The warriors let Covenant follow behind the two lords, as if according him a position of respect. Prothol and Moram walked side by side, and when they neared the look, Covenant could see from between them Foam followers standing at the edge of the cliff. The giant had his palms braced above his head on either wall. His back was to the lords. 
He stared into the bleak, blood-hued writhing of the river. His huge form was dark against the vermilion sky. When the lords came near him, he said, as if he were speaking back to them from the gorge, I remain here, my watch. I will guard you. Drool's army will not trap you in Mount Thunder while I live. A moment later, he added, as if he had recognized the bottom of himself, From here I will not smell the white warrants. But his next words carried an echo of old giantish humor. The catacombs were not made to accommodate creatures the size of giants. You choose well, murmured Protho. We need your protection. But do not remain here after the full moon. If we do not return by that time, we are lost, and you must go to warn your people. Foam follower answered, as if in reply to some other voice. Remember the oath of peace. In the maze where you go, it is your lifeline. It preserves you against soul crusher's purposes, hidden and savage. Remember the oath. It may be that hope misleads, but hate, hate corrupts. I have been too quick to hate. I become like what I abhor. Have some respect for the truth, Moram snapped. The sudden harshness of his tone startled Covenant. You are salt-heart foam follower of the sea-reach giants, rock brother to the men of the land. That name cannot be taken from you. But Covenant had heard no self-pity in the giant's words, only recognition and sorrow. Foam follower did not speak again. He stood as still as the walls against which he braced himself, stood like a statue carved to occupy the look. The Lord spent no more time with him. Already the night was waning, and they wanted to enter the mountain before daylight. The questers took positions. Prothol, Viranair, and two bloodguard followed first Mark Tuvor. Then came Moram, Lithe, Bonor, Covenant, and Korik. Then came Warhaft Quan, his fourteen warriors, and the last four bloodguard. They were only twenty-nine against all of Drool Rockworm's unknown might. They strung a line of Klingor from Tuvor to the last bloodguard. In single file, they started down the slick stair into Treacher's Gorge. Chapter 22 The Catacombs of Mount Thunder Drool's moon embittered the night like a consummation of gall. Under it, the river thrashed and roared in Treacher's Gorge, as if it were being crushed. Spray and slick wet moss made the stare down from the look as treacherous as a quagmire. Covenant bristled with trepidations. At first, when his turn to begin the descent had come, his dread had paralyzed him. But when Bonor had offered to carry him, he had found the pride to make himself move. In addition to the Klingor line, Bonor and Korik held his staff like a railing for him. He went torturously down into the gorge, as if he were striving to lock his feet on the stone of each step. The stair dropped irregularly from the cliff into the wall of the gorge. Soon the company was creeping into the loud chasm, led only by the light of Viranair's torch. The crimson froth of the river seemed to leap up at them like a hungry plague as they neared the roadway. Each step was slicker than the one before. Behind him, Covenant heard a gasp as one of the warriors slipped. The low cry carried terror like the quarrel of a crossbow. But the blood guard anchoring the line were secure. The warrior quickly regained his footing. The descent dragged on. Covenant's ankles began to ache with the increasing uncertainty of his feet. He tried to think his souls into the rock, make them part of the stone through sheer concentration, and he gripped his staff until his palms were so slick with sweat that the wood seemed to be pulling away from him. His knees started to quiver, but Bonor and Korik upheld him. The distance to the roadway shrank. After several long, bad moments, the threat of panic receded. 
Then he reached the comparative safety of the ledge. He stood in the midst of the company between the gorge wall and the channel of the river. Above them, the slash of sky had begun to turn gray, but that lightning only emphasized the darkness of the gorge. Viranair's lone torch flickered as if it were lost in a wilderland. The questers had to yell to make themselves understood over the tumult of the current. Briskly, Quan gave marching orders to his eelmen. The warriors checked over their weapons. With a few gestures and a slight nod or two, Tuvor made his last arrangements with the bloodguard. Covenant gripped his staff and assured himself of his stone-downer knife, Atiaran's knife. He had a vague impression that he had forgotten something, but before he could try to think what it was, he was distracted by shouts. Old Viranair was yelling at High Lord Prothol. For once, the hearthrall seemed careless of his gruff dignity. Against the roar of the river, he thrust his seamed and quivering face at Prothol and barked, You cannot! The risk! Prothol shook his head negatively. You cannot lead! Allow me! Again Prothol silently refused. Of course! shouted Biranair, struggling to make his determination carry over the howl of water. You must not! I can! I know the ways! Of course! Are you alone old enough to study? I know the old maps! No fool, you know! If I look old and— He faltered momentarily. And useless! You must allow me! Prothor strove to shout without sounding angry. Time is short. We must not delay. Dear and dear old friend, I cannot put the first risk of this quest onto another. It is my place. Fool! spat Biranair, daring any insolence to gain his point. How will you see? See? Of course! The hearthrug quivered with sarcasm. You will go before. Risk all. Light the way with Lord's fire. Fool! Drool will see you before you reach Warren Bridge. Prothol at last understood. Ah, that is true. He sagged as if the realization hurt him. Your light is quieter than mine. Drool will surely sense our coming if I make use of my staff. Abruptly he turned to one side, angry now. Tuvor, he commanded. Harthrall Birenair leads. He will light our way in my place. Ward him well, Tuvor. Do not let this old friend suffer my perils. Birenair drew himself up, rediscovering dignity in his responsibility. He extinguished the rod he carried and gave it to a warrior to pack away with the rest of his brands. Then he stroked the end of his staff and a flame sprang up there. With a brusque beckon, he raised his fire and started stiffly down the roadway toward the maw of Mount Thunder. At once, Terrell and Corrick passed the higher brand and took scouting positions twenty feet ahead of him. Two other blood guard placed themselves just behind him, and after them went Prothol and Moram together. Then two more blood guard followed singly by Mainthrall Lithe, Covenant, and Banor. Next marched Quan with his eelmen in files of three, leaving the last two blood guard to bring up the rear. In that formation, the company moved toward the entrance to the catacombs. Covenant looked upward briefly to try to catch a last glimpse of Foam Follower in the look, but he did not see the giant. The gorge was too full of darkness, and the roadway demanded his attention. He went into the rock under Foam Follower without any wave or sign of farewell. Thus the company strode away from daylight, from sun and sky and open air and grass and possibility of retreat, and took their quest into the gullet of Mount Thunder. Covenant went into that demean of night as if into a nightmare. He was not braced for the entrance to the catacombs. He had approached it without fear. The relief of having survived the descent from the look had rendered him temporarily immune to panic. He had not said farewell to Foam Follower. He had forgotten something. But these pangs were diffused by a sense of anticipation 
a sense that his bargain would bring him out of the dream with his ability to endure intact. But the sky above, an openness of which he had hardly been aware, was cut off as if by an axe, and replaced by the huge stone weight of the mountain, so heavy that its aura alone was crushing. In his ears its mass seemed to rumble like silent thunder. The river's roaring mounted in the gullet of the cave, adumbrated itself as if the constricted pain of the current were again constricted into keener and louder pain. The spray was as thick as rain. Ahead of the company, Virenaire's flame burned dim and penumbral, nearly quenched by the wet air, and the surface of the roadway was hazardous, littered with holes and rocks and loose shale. Covenant strained his attention, as if he were listening for a note of sense in the gibberish of his experience, and under this alertness he wore his hope of escape like a buckler. In more ways than one, he felt that it was his only protection. The company seemed pathetically weak, defenseless against the dark-dwelling cave whites and herb vials. Stumbling through night, broken only at the solitary point of Birenair's fire, he predicted that the company would be observed soon. Then a report would go to drool, and the inner forces of the White Warrens would pour forth, and the army would be recalled. What chance had foam follower against so many thousands of cave whites? And the company would be crushed like a handful of presumptuous ants. And in that moment of resolution or death would come his own rescue or defeat. He could not envision any other outcome. With these thoughts, he walked as if he were listening for the downward rush of an avalanche. After some distance, he realized that the sound of the river was changing. The roadway went inward almost horizontally, but the river was falling into the depths of the rock. The current was becoming a cataract, an abysmal plummet like a plunge into death. The sound of it receded slowly, as the river crashed farther and farther away from the lip of the chasm. Now there was less spray in the air to dim Virenaire's flame. With less dampness to blur it, the stone wall showed more of its essential granite. Between the wall and the chasm, Covenant clung to the reassurance of the roadway. When he put a foot down hard, he could feel the solidity of the ledge jolt from his heel to the base of his spine. Around him the cave had become like a tunnel, except for the chasm on the left. He fought his apprehension by concentrating on his feet and the higher brand's flame. The river fell helplessly, and its roar faded like fingers scraping for a lost purchase. Soon he began to hear the moving noises of the company. He turned to try to see the opening of the gorge, but either the road had been curving gradually or the opening had been lost in the distance. He saw nothing behind him but night, as unmitigated as the blackness ahead. But after a time he felt that the looming dark was losing its edge. Some change in the air attenuated the midnight of the catacombs. He stared ahead, trying to clarify the perception. No one spoke. The company hugged its silence, as if in fear that the walls were capable of hearing. Shortly, however, Birenair halted. Covenant, Lithe, and the Lords quickly joined the old Hirebrand. With him stood Terrell. Warren Bridge lies ahead, said the bloodguard. Coric watches. There are sentries. He spoke softly, but after the long silence, his voice sounded careless of hazards. Ah, I feared that, whispered Protho. Can we approach? Rock light makes dark shadows. The sentries stand atop the span. We can approach within bowshot. Moram called quietly for Quan, while Prothol asked, How many sentries? Terrell replied, Two. Only two? The bloodguard shrugged fractionally. They suffice. Between them lies the only entrance to the White Warrens. But Prothor breathed again. Only two? He seemed to be groping to recognize a danger he could not see. 
While the High Lord considered, Moram spoke rapidly to Quan. At once the war half turned to his eelman, and shortly two warriors stood by Tyrrell, unslinging their bows. They were tall, slim, wood helmen, and in the pale light their limbs hardly looked brawny enough to bend their stiff bows. For a moment longer Prothol hesitated, pulling at his beard as if he were trying to tug a vague impression into consciousness. But then he thrust his anxiety down, gave Terrell a sharp nod. Briskly, the blood guard led the two warriors away toward the attenuated night ahead. Prothol whispered intently to the company, Have a care. Take no risk without my order. My heart tells me there is peril here, some strange danger which Kevin's lore names, but now I cannot recall it. Ah, memory! That knowledge is so dim and separate from what we have known since the desecration. Think, all of you. Take great care. Walking slowly, he went forward beside Birenair, and the company followed. Now the light became steadily clearer, an orange-red, rocky glow, like that which Covenant had seen long ago in his brief meeting with Drool in Kiril Threndor. Soon the questers could see that in a few hundred yards the cave took a sharp turn to the right, and at the same time the ceiling of the tunnel rose as if there were a great vault beyond the bend. Before they had covered half the distance, Korik joined them to guide them to a safe vantage. On the way, he pointed out the position of Terrell and the two warriors. They had climbed part way up the right wall and were kneeling on a ledge in the angle of the bend. Korik led the company close to the river cleft until they reached a sheer stone wall. The chasm appeared to leave them, vanished straight into the rock which turned the road toward the right, but light shone over this rock as well as through the chasm. The rock was not a wall, but rather a huge boulder, sitting like a door ajar before the entrance to an immense chamber. Terrell had taken the two warriors to a position from which they could fire their shafts over this boulder. Korik guided Prothol, Moram, and Covenant across the shadow cast by the boulder until they could peer to the left around its edge. Covenant found himself looking into a high, flat-floored cavern. The chasm of the river swung around behind the boulder and cut at right angles to its previous direction, straight through the center of the vault, then disappeared into the far wall. So the roadway went no farther along the river's course, but there were no other openings in the outer half of the cavern. At that point, the chasm was at least fifty feet wide. The only way across it was a massive bridge of native stone which filled the middle of the vault. Carefully, Moram whispered, Only two. They are enough. Pray for a true aim. There will be no second chance. At first, Covenant saw no guards. His eyes were held by two pillars of pulsing, fiery rock light which stood like sentries on either side of the bridge crest but he forced himself to study the bridge, and shortly he discerned two black figures on the span, one beside each pillar. They were nearly invisible, so close to the rock light. Irviles, the High Lord muttered. By the seven, I must remember. Why are they not cave whites? Why does Drool waste Irviles on such duty? Covenant hardly listened to Prothor's uneasiness, the rock light demanded his attention. It seemed to hold affinities for him that he could not guess. By some perverse logic of its pulsations, he felt himself made aware of his wedding band. The droolish, powerful glow made his hand itch around his ring like a reminder that its promise of cherishing had failed. Grimly, he clenched his fist. Prothor gripped himself, said heavily to Korik, Make the attempt. We can only fail. Without a word, Korik nodded up at Terrell. Together, two bowstrings thrummed flatly. The next instant, the Irviles were gone. 
Covenant caught a glimpse of them dropping like black pebbles into the chasm. The High Lord sighed his relief. Moram turned away from the vault, threw a salute of congratulation toward the two archers, and hurried back to give explanations and orders to the rest of the company. From the eomen came low, murmured cheers, and the noises of a relaxation of battle tension. Do not lower your guard, Prothal hissed. The danger is not past. I feel it. Covenant stood where he was, staring into the rock light, clenching his fist. Something that he did not understand was happening. Erlord, Prothal asked softly, what do you see? Power. The interruption irritated him. His voice scraped roughly in his throat. Jules got enough to make you look silly. He raised his left fist. It's daylight outside. His ring burned blood red, throbbed to the pulse of the rock light. Prothal frowned at the ring, concentrating fiercely. His lips were taut over his teeth as he muttered, This is not right. I must remember. Rock light cannot do this. Moram approached and said, before he saw what was between Covenant and Prothal, Terrell has rejoined us. We are ready to cross. Prothal nodded inattentively. Then Moram noticed the ring. Covenant heard a sound as if Moram were grinding his teeth. The Lord reached out, clasped his hand over Covenant's fist. A moment later, he turned and signaled to the company. Quan led his eoman forward with the blood guard. Prothal looked distracted, but he went with Virenair into the vault. Automatically, Covenant followed them toward Warren Bridge. Tuvor and another blood guard went ahead of the High Lord. They neared the bridge, inspecting it to be sure that the span was truly safe before the lords crossed. Covenant wandered forward as if in a trance. The spell of the rock light grew on him. His ring began to feel hot. He had to make an effort of consciousness to wonder why his ring was bloody rather than orange-red like the glowing pillars. But he had no answer. He felt a change coming over him that he could not resist or measure or even analyze. It was as if his ring were confusing his senses turning them on their pivots to peer into unknown dimensions. Tuvor and his comrade started up the bridge. Prothol held the company back, despite the inherent danger of remaining in the open light. He stared after Tuvor and yanked at his beard with a hand which trembled agedly. Covenant felt the spell mastering him. The cavern seemed to change. In places, the rock wall seemed thinner, as if they were about to become transparent. Quan and Lithe and the warriors grew transparent as well, approached the evanescence of wraiths. Prothol and Moram appeared solider, but Prothol flickered where Moram was steady. Only the blood guard showed no sign of dissipating, of losing their essence in mist. The blood guard and the ring. Covenant's own flesh now looked so vague that he feared his ring would fall through it to the stone. At his shoulder, Banor stood, hard, implacable, and dangerous, as if the blood guard's mere touch might scatter his beclouded being to the winds. He was drifting into transience. He tried to clench himself. His fingers came back empty. Tuvor neared the crest of the span. The bridge seemed about to crumble under him, he appeared so much solider than the stone. Then Covenant saw it. A loop of shimmering air banded around the center of the bridge, standing flat across the roadway and around under the span and back. He did not know what it was, understood nothing about it, except that it was powerful. Tuvor was about to step into it. With an effort like a convulsion, Covenant started to fight, resist the spell. Some intuition told him that Tuvor would be killed. Even a leper, he adjured himself. This was not his bargain. He had not promised to stand silent and watch men die. Hellfire. Then 
With recovered rage, he cried again, Hellfire! Stop! he gasped. Can't you see? At once, Prothor shouted, Tuvor, do not move! Wheeling on Covenant, he demanded, What is it? What do you see? The violence of his rage brought back some of the solidity to his vision. But Prothor still appeared dangerously evanescent. Covenant jerked up his ring, spat, Get them down, are you blind? It's not the rock light, something else up there. Moram recalled Tuvor and his companion. But for a moment, Prothol only stared in blank fear at Covenant. Then, abruptly, he struck his staff on the stone and ejaculated, Irviles! And rock light just there, as anchors. Ah, I am blind, blind. They tend the power. Incredulously, Moram whispered, A word of warning? Yes. Is it possible? Has Drool entirely mastered the staff? Can he speak such might? Prothol was already on his way toward the bridge. Over his shoulder he replied, He has Lord Fowl to teach him. We have no such help. A moment later, he strode up the span with Tuvor close behind him. The spell reached for Covenant again, but he knew it better now and held it at bay with curses. He could still see the shimmering loop of the word as Prothol neared it. The High Lord approached slowly and at last halted a step before the word. Gripping his staff in his left hand, he held his right arm up with a palm forward like a gesture of recognition. With a rattling cough, he began to sing. Constantly repeating the same motif, he sang cryptically in a language Covenant did not understand, a language so old that it sounded grizzled and hoary. Prothor sang it softly, intimately, as if he were entering into private communion with the word of warning. Gradually, vaguely, like imminent mist, the word became visible to the company. In the air opposite Prothor's palm, an indistinct shred of red appeared, coalesced like a fragment of an unseen tapestry. The pale hanging red expanded until a large rough circle was centered opposite his palm. With extreme caution, singing all the while, he raised his hand to measure the height of the word, moved sideways to judge its configuration. Thus in tatters the company saw the barrier which opposed them, and as Covenant brought more of himself to the pitch of his stiff rage, his own perception of the word paled until he saw only as much of it as the others did. At last Prothor lowered his hand and ceased his song. The shreds vanished. He came tightly down the bridge, as if he were only holding himself erect by the simple strength of his resolution but his gaze was full of comprehension and the measure of risks. A word of warning, he reported sternly, set here by the power of the staff of law to inform Drool if his defenses were breached and to break Warren Bridge at the first touch. His tone carried a glimpse of a plunge into the chasm. It is a work of great power. No lord since the desecration has been capable of such a feat. And even if we had the might to undo it, we would gain nothing, for Drool would be warned. Still, there is one sign in our favor. Such a word cannot be maintained without constant attention. It must be tended, else it decays, though not speedily enough for our purpose. That Drool set Irviles here as sentries perhaps shows that his mind is elsewhere. Wonderful. Covenant growled corrosively. Terrific! His hands itched with an intense urge to throttle someone. Prothol continued, If Drool's eyes are turned away, it may be that we can bend the word without breaking. He took a deep breath, then asserted, I believe it can be done. This word is not as pure and dangerous as might be. He turned to Covenant. But I fear for you, Er, Lord. For me, Covenant reacted 
as if the High Lord had accused him of something. Why? I fear that the mere closeness of your ring to the word may undo it. So you must come last. And even then, we may be caught within the catacombs, with no bridge to bear us out again. Last? He had a sudden vision of being forsaken or trapped here, blocked by that deep cleft from the escape he needed. He wanted to protest, let me go first. If I can make it, anybody can. But he saw the folly of that argument. Forbear, he urged himself. Keep the bargain. His fear made him sound bitter as he grated, Get on with it. They're bound to send some new guards one of these days. Prothol nodded. With a last measuring look at Covenant, he turned away. He and Moram went up onto the bridge to engage the word. Tuvor and Terrell followed, carrying coils of Klingor, which they attached to the Lord's waist, and anchored at the foot of the bridge. Thus secured against the collapse of the span, Prothol and Moram ascended cautiously until they were only an arm's length from the invisible word. There they knelt together and started their song. When the bottom of the word became visible in crimson, they placed their staffs parallel to it on the stone before them. Then, with tortuous care, they rolled their staffs directly under the iridescent power. For one baited moment, they remained still in an attitude of prayer, as if beseeching their wood not to interrupt the current flowing past their faces. A heart-stopping flicker replied in the red shimmer. But the lords went on singing, and shortly the word steadied. Bracing themselves, they started the most difficult part of their task. They began lifting the inner ends of their staffs. With a quick intake of wonder and admiration, the company saw the lower edge of the word bend, leaving a low, tented gap below it. When the peak of the gap was more than a foot high, the lords froze. Instantly, Bonor and two other blood guard dashed up the bridge, unrolling a rope as they ran. One by one they crawled through the gap and took their end of the lifeline to safe ground beyond the span. As soon as Bonor had attached his end of the rope, Moram took hold of Prothor's staff. The High Lord wormed through the gap, then held the staffs for Moram. By the time Moram had regained his position beside Prothol, old Birinair was there and ready to pass. Behind him in rapid single file went the eelman, followed by Quan and Lithe. In turn, Tuvor and Terrell slipped under the word and anchored their ropes to the two lords beyond the chasm. Then, moving at a run, the last blood guard slapped the central lifeline around Covenant and made their way through the gap. He was left alone. In a cold sweat of anger and fear, he started up the bridge. He felt the two pillars of rock light as if they were scrutinizing him. He went up the span fiercely, cursing foul, and cursing himself for his fear. He did not give a glance to the chasm. Starting at the gap, he ground his rage into focus and approached the shimmering tapestry of power. As he drew nearer, his ring ached on his hand. The bridge seemed to grow thinner, as if it were dissolving under him. The word became starker, dominating his vision more and more. But he kept his hold on his rage. Even a leper. He reached the gap, knelt before it, looked momentarily through the shimmer at the lords. Their faces ran with sweat, and their voices trembled in their song. He clenched his hands around the staff of Baroticus and crawled into the gap. As he passed under the word, he heard an instant high keening like a whine of resistance. For that instant, a cold red flame burst from his ring. Then he was through, and the bridge and the word were still intact. He stumbled down the span, flinging off the Klingor lifeline. When he was safe, he turned long enough to see Prothol and Moram remove their staffs from under the word. Then he stalked out of the vault of Warren Bridge into the dark tunnel of the roadway. 
He felt Bonor's presence at his shoulder almost at once, but he did not stop until the darkness against which he thrust himself was thick enough to seem impenetrable. In frustration and congested fear, he groaned, I want to be alone. Why don't you leave me alone? With a repressed lilt of his Haruchai inflection, Bonor responded, You are Erlord Covenant. We are the Blood Guard. Your life is in our care. Covenant glared into the ineluctable dark around him and thought about the unnatural solidity of the Blood Guard. What binding principle made their flesh seem less mortal than the gut rock of Mount Thunder? A glance at his ring showed him that its incarnadine gleam had almost entirely faded. He found that he was jealous of Bonor's dispassion. His own pervasive erectitude offended him. On the impulse of a ferocious intuition, he returned, That isn't enough. He could envision Bonor's slight, eloquent shrug without seeing it. In darkness, he waited defiantly until the company caught up with him. But when he was again marching in his place in the quest, and Birinair's wan flame had passed by him, treading as if transfixed by leadership the invisible directions of the roadway, the night of the catacombs crowded toward him, like myriad leering spectators, impatient for bloodshed, and he suffered a reaction against the strain. His shoulders began to tremble, as if he had been hanging by his arms too long, and cold petrification settled over his thoughts. The word of warning revealed that Lord Fowle was expecting them, knew they would not fall victim to Drool's army. Drool could not have formed the word, much less made it so apposite to white gold. Therefore it served the despiser's purposes rather than Drool's. Perhaps it was a test of some kind, a measure of the Lord's strength and resourcefulness, an indication of Covenant's vulnerability. But whatever it was, it was Lord Fowle's doing. Covenant felt sure that the despiser knew everything, planned, arranged, made inevitable all that happened to the quest, every act and decision. Drool was ignorant, mad, manipulated. The cave white probably failed to understand half of what he achieved under Lord Fowle's hand. But in his bones, Covenant had known such things from the beginning. They did not surprise him. Rather, he saw them as symptoms of another, a more essential threat. This central peril, a peril which so froze his mind that only his flesh seemed able to react by trembling, had to do with his white gold ring. He perceived the danger clearly because he was too numb to hide from it. The whole function of the compromise, the bargain he had made with the Ranihan, was to hold the impossibility and the actuality of the land apart. In equipoise, back off, let me be. To keep them from impacting into each other and blasting his precarious hold on life. But Lord Fowle was using his ring to bring crushing together the opposite madnesses which he needed so desperately to escape. He considered throwing the ring away, but he knew he could not do it. The band was too heavy with remembered lost love and honor and mutual respect to be tossed aside. And an old beggar, if his bargain failed, he would have nothing left with which to defend himself against the darkness, no power or fertility or coherence, nothing but his own capacity for darkness, his violence, his ability to kill. That capacity led, he was too numb to resist the conclusion, as unalterably as leprosy to the destruction of the land. There his numbness seemed to become complete. He could not measure his situation more than that. All he could do was trail behind Birinair's flame and tell over his refusals like some despairing acolyte, desperate for faith, trying to invoke his own autonomy. He concentrated on his footing as if it were tenuous and the rock unsure, as if Birinair might lead him over the edge of an abyss. Gradually, the character of their benighted journey changed. 
First, the impression of the surrounding tunnel altered. Behind the darkness, the walls seemed to open from time to time into other tunnels, and at one point the night took on an enormous depth, as if the company were passing over the floor of an amphitheater. In his blind openness, Birenair searched for his way. When the sense of vast empty space vanished, he led his companions into a stone corridor so low that his flame nearly touched the ceiling, so narrow that they had to pass in single file. Then the old hearthrug took them through a bewildering series of shifts in direction and terrain and depth. From the low tunnel they turned sharply and went down a long, steep slope with no discernible walls. As they descended, turning left and right at landmarks only beer and air seemed able to see, the black air became colder and somehow loathsome, as if it carried an echo of Irvile's. The cold came in sudden drafts and pockets, blowing through chasms and tunnels that opened unseen on either side into dens and coverts and passages and great cave-whitish halls, all invisible but for the timbre, the abrupt impression of space, which they gave the darkness. Lower down the sudden drafts began to stink. The buried air seemed to flow over centuries of accumulated filth, vast hordes of unencrypted dead, long-abandoned laboratories where banes were made. At moments the putrescence became so thick the Covenant could see it in the air, and out of the adjacent openings came cold, distant sounds, the rattle of shale dropping into immeasurable faults, occasional low complaints of stress, soft, crystalline, chinking noises like the tap of iron hammers, muffled sepulchral detonations, and long, tired sighs, exhalations of fatigue from the ancient foundations of the mountain. The darkness itself seemed to be muttering as the company passed. But at the end of the descent, they reached a wavering stair cut into a rock wall with lightless, hungry chasms gaping below them. And after that, they went through winding tunnels, along the bottoms of crevices, over sharp rock ridges like arates within the mountain, around pits with the moan of water and the reek of decay in their depths, under arches like entryways to grotesque festal halls, turned and climbed and navigated in the darkness as if it were a perilous limbo, trackless and fatal, varying only in the kind and extremity of its dangers. Needing proof of his own reality, Covenant moved with the fingers of his left hand knotted in his robe over his heart. Three times in broad, flat spaces, which might have been halls or ledges or peak tops surrounded by plunges, the company stopped and ate cold food by the light of Birenair's staff. Each meal helped. The sight of other faces around the flame, the consumption of tangible provender, acted like an affirmation or a pooling of the company's capacity for endurance. Once, Quan forced himself to attempt a jest, but his voice sounded so hollow in the perpetual midnight that no one had the heart to reply. After each rest, the questers set out again bravely, and each time their pooled fortitude evaporated more rapidly, as if the darkness inhaled it with increasing veracity. Later, Old Birenair led them out of cold and ventilated ways into close, musty, hot tunnels far from the main white warrens. To reduce the risk of discovery, he chose a path through a section of the caves deader than the rest, silent and abandoned, with little fresh air left. But the atmosphere only raised the pitch of the company's tension. They moved as if they were screaming voicelessly in anticipation of some blind disaster. They went on and on, until Covenant knew only that they had not marched for days because his ring had not yet started to glow with the rising of the moon. But after a time, his white gold began to gleam like a crimson prophecy. Still they went on into what he now knew was night. They could not afford sleep or long rests. 
the peak of Drool's present power, was only one day away. They were following a tunnel with walls which seemed to stand just beyond the reach of Birenair's tottering fire. Abruptly, Terrell returned from his scouting position, loomed out of the darkness to appear before the old Higherbrand. Swiftly, Prothal and Moram, with Lithe and Covenant behind them, hastened to Birenair's side. Terrell's voice held a note like urgency as he said, Irvile's approach, perhaps fifty. They have seen the light. Prothal groaned. Moram spat a curse. Mainthrall Lithe drew a hissing breath, whipped her cord from her hair, as if she were about to encounter the stuff of which Raman nightmares were made. But before anyone could take action, old Birenair seemed to snap like a dry twig, shouting, Follow! He spun to his right and raced away into the darkness. At once, two blood guards sprinted after him. For an instant, the lords hesitated. Then Prothol cried, Melinkurian! and dashed after Birenair. Moram began shouting orders. The company sprang into battle readiness. Covenant fled after Birenair's bobbing fire. The higher brand's shout had not sounded like panic. That cry, follow, urged Covenant along. Behind him, he heard the first commands and clatters of combat. He kept his eyes on Birenair's light, followed him into a low, nearly airless tunnel. Birenair raced down the tunnel, still a stride or two ahead of the blood guard. Suddenly there came a hot noise like a burst of lightning. Without warning, a sheet of blue flame enveloped the higher brand. Dazzling, coruscating, it walled the tunnel from top to bottom. It roared like a furnace, and Birenair hung in it, spread-limbed and transfixed, his frame contorted with agony. Beside him, his staff flared, and became ash. Without hesitation, the two blood guards threw themselves at the fire. It knocked them back like blank stone. They leaped together at Birenair, trying to force him through and past the flame sheet. But they had no effect. Birenair hung where he was, a charred victim in a web of blue fire. The blood guard were poised to spring again when the High Lord caught up with them. He had to shout to make himself heard over the crackling of power. My place, he cried, almost screaming. He will die. Aid Moram. He seemed to have fallen over an edge into distraction. His eyes had a look of chaos. Spreading his arms, he went forward and tried to embrace Birenair. The fire kicked him savagely away. He fell and for a long moment lay face down on the stone. Behind them the battle mounted. The Irviles had formed a wedge, and even with all the help of the blood guard and warriors, Moram barely held his ground. The first rush of the attack had driven the company back. Moram had retreated several yards into the tunnel, where Birenair hung. There he made a stand. Despite Prothol's cries and the roar of the fire behind him, he kept his face toward the Irviles. Heavily, Prothol raised himself. His head trembled on his tired old neck, but his eyes were no longer wild. He took a moment to recollect himself, knowing that he was already too late. Then, mustering his strength, he hurled his staff at the blue coruscation. The shod wood struck with a blinding flash. For one blank instant, Covenant could see nothing. When his vision cleared, he found the staff hanging in the sheet of flame. Birenair lay in the tunnel beyond the fire. Birenair, the High Lord cried, my friend. He seemed to believe that he could help the higher brand if he reached him in time. Once again, he flung himself at the flame and was flung back. The Irviles pressed their attack ferociously in hungry silence. Two of Quan's eelmen, were felled as the company backed into the tunnel, and one more died now with an iron spike in his heart. A woman struck in too close to the wedge, and her hand was hacked off. Moram fought the lore master with growing desperation. Around him the blood guard battled skillfully,
but they could find few openings in the wedge. Covenant peered through the blue sheet at Birenair. The higher brand's face was unmarked, but it held a wide stare of agony, as if he had remained alive for one instant after his soul had been seared. The remains of his cloak hung about him in charred wisps. Follow! That call had not been panic. Birenair had had some idea. His shout echoed and compelled. His cloak hung about him. Follow! Covenant had forgotten something, something important. Wildly, he started forward. Moram strove to strike harder. His strength played like lightning along his staff as he dealt blow after blow against the lore master. Weakened by its losses, the wedge began to give ground. Covenant stopped inches away from the sheet of power. Prothal's staff was suspended vertically within it like a landmark. The fire seemed to absorb rather than give off heat. Covenant felt himself growing cold and numb. In the dazzling blue force, he saw a chance for immolation, escape. Abruptly, the Irvile lore master gave a barking shout and broke formation. It ducked past Moram and dashed into the tunnel toward the fire, toward the kneeling High Lord. Moram's eyes flashed perilously, but he did not turn from the fight. He snapped an order to Quan and struck at the Irviles with still fiercer force. Quan leaped from the fight. He raced to unsling his bow, knock an arrow, and shoot before the lore master reached Prothol. Vaguely, Covenant heard the High Lord gasp against the dead air. Er, Lord, beware. But he did not listen. His wedding band burned as if the defiled moon were like the rock light on Warren Bridge, a word of warning. He reached out his left hand, hesitated momentarily, then grasped the High Lord's staff. Power surged. Bloody fire burst from his ring against the coruscating blue. The roar of the flame cycled upward beyond hearing. Then came a mighty blast, a silent explosion. The floor of the tunnel jumped as if its keel had struck a reef. The blue sheet fell in tatters. Quan was too late to save Prothol, but the Irvile did not attack the High Lord. It sprang over him toward Covenant. With all his strength, Quan bent his bow and fired at the creature's back. For an instant, Covenant stood still, listing crazily to one side and staring in horror at the abrupt darkness. Dim orange fire burned on his hand and arm, but the brilliant blue was gone. The fire gave no pain, though at first it clung to him as if he were dry wood. It was cold and empty, and it died out in sputtering flickers, as if after all he did not contain enough warmth to feed it. Then the lore master, with Quan's arrow squarely between its shoulders, crashed into him and scattered him across the stone. A short time later he looked up, with his head full of mist. The only light in the tunnel came from Moram's lord's fire as he drove back the Irviles. Then that light was gone too. The Irviles were routed. Tuvor and the blood guards started after them to prevent them from carrying reports to Drool, but Moram called, let them go, we are already exposed. No reports of Irviles matter now. Voices gasped and groaned in the darkness. Soon two or three of the warriors lit torches. The flames cast odd dim shadows on the walls. The company drew together around Lord Moram and moved down to where Prothol knelt. The High Lord held Birenair's charred form in his arms but he brushed aside the sympathy and grief of the company. Go on, he said weakly. Discover what he intended. I will be done with my farewell soon. In explanation, he added, he led in my place. Moram laid a commiserating hand on the High Lord's shoulder, but the dangers of their situation did not allow him to remain still. Almost certainly, Drool now knew where they were. 
The energies they had released would point them out like an accusing finger. Why? Moram wondered aloud. Why was such power placed here? This is not Drool's doing. Carrying one of the torches, he started down the tunnel. From his collapse on the stone, Covenant replied in a grotesque, stricken voice, but he was answering a different question. I forgot my clothes, left them behind. Moram bent over him. Lighting his face with the torch, the Lord asked, Are you injured? I do not understand. Of what importance are your old clothes? The question seemed to require a world of explanation, but Covenant responded easily, glib with numbness and fog. Of course I'm injured. My whole life is an injury. He hardly listened to his own speech. Don't you see? When I wake up and find myself dressed in my old clothes, not this moss-stained robe at all, why, that will prove that I really have been dreaming. If it wasn't so reassuring, I would be terrified. You have mastered a great power, Moram murmured. That was an accident. It happened by itself. I was, I was trying to escape, burn myself. Then the strain overcame him. He lowered his head to the stone and went to sleep. He did not rest long. The air of the tunnel was too uncomfortable and there was too much activity in the company. When he opened his eyes, he saw Lithe and several warriors preparing a meal over a low fire. With a trembling song on his lips and tears spilling from his eyes, Prothal was using his blue fire to sear the injured woman's wrist stump. Covenant watched as she bore the pain. Only when her wrist was tightly bandaged did she let herself faint. After that, he turned away, sick with shared pain. He lurched to his feet, reeled as if he could not find his footing, had to brace himself against the wall. He stood there, hunched over his aching stomach, until Moram returned, accompanied by Quan, Korik, and two other bloodguard. The war haft was carrying a small iron chest. When Moram reached the fire, he spoke in quiet wonder. The power was a defense placed here by High Lord Kevin. Beyond this tunnel lies a chamber. There we found the second ward of Kevin's lore, the second of the seven. High Lord Prothor's face lit up with hope. Chapter 23 Kirill Threndor Reverently, Prothol took the chest. His fingers fumbled at the bindings. When he raised the lid, a pale, pearly glow like clean moonlight shone from within the cask. The radiance gave his face a look of beatitude as he ventured his hand into the chest to lift out an ancient scroll. When he raised it, the company saw that it was the scroll which shone. Quan and his eelman half knelt before the ward, bowed their heads. Moram and Prothor stood erect, as if they were meeting the scrutiny of the master of their lives. After a moment of amazement, Lithe joined the warriors. Only Covenant and the blood guard showed no reverence. Tuvor's comrades stood casually alert, and Covenant leaned uncomfortably against the wall, trying to bring his unruly stomach under control but he was not blind to the importance of that scroll. A private hope wrestled with his nausea. He approached it obliquely. Did Birinir know what you were going to find? Is that why? Why he ran here? Moram spoke absently. All of him except his voice was focused on the scroll which Prothol held up like a mighty talisman. Perhaps it is possible he knew the old maps. No doubt they were given to us in the first ward, so that in time we might find our way here. It may be that his heart saw what our eyes did not. Covenant paused, then asked, obliquely again, Why did you let the Irviles escape? This time the Lord seemed to hear his seriousness. 
with a piercing glance at him, Prothol replaced the scroll in the cask. When the lid was closed, Moram answered stiffly, Unnecessary death, unbeliever. We did not come here to slay Irviles. We will harm ourselves more by unnecessary killing than by risking a few live foes. We fight in need, not in lust or rage. The oath of peace must not be compromised. But this also did not answer Covenant's question. With an effort, he brought out his hope directly. Never mind. This second ward, it doubles your power. You could send me back. Moram's face softened at the need for assurance, for consolation against impossible demands in the question. But his reply denied Covenant. Ah, my friend, you forget. We have not yet mastered the first ward, not in generations of study. The best of the Lars Rat have failed to unveil the central mysteries. We can do nothing with this new ward now. Perhaps, if we survive this quest, we will learn from the second in later years. There he stopped. His face held a look of further speech, but he said no more until Prothol sighed. Tell him all. We can afford no illusions now. Very well, Moram said hurriedly. In truth, our possession of the second ward at such a time is perilous. It is clear from the first that High Lord Kevin prepared the seven in careful order. It was his purpose that the second ward remain hidden until all the first was known. Apparently, certain aspects of his lore carry great hazard to those who have not first mastered certain other aspects. So he hid his wards and defended them with powers which could not be breached until the earlier lore was mastered. Now his intent has been broken. Until we penetrate the first, we will risk much if we attempt the use of the second. He pulled himself up and took a deep breath. We do not regret. For all our peril, this discovery may be the great moment of our age, but it may not altogether bless us. In a low voice, Prothol added, We raise no blame or doubt. How could any have known what we would find? But the doom of the land is now doubly on our heads. If we are to defeat Lord Fowl in the end, we must master powers for which we are not ready. So we learn hope and dismay from the same source. Do not mistake us. This risk we accept gladly. A mastery of Kevin's lore is the goal of our lives, but we must make clear that there is risk. I see hope for the land, but little for myself. Even that sight is dim, said Moram tightly. It may be that Lord Fowl has led us here so that we may be betrayed by powers we cannot control. At this, Prothol looked sharply at Moram. Then slowly the High Lord nodded his agreement. But his face did not lose the relief, the lightening of its burdens, which his first sight of the ward had given him. Under its influence, he looked equal to the stewardship of his age. Now the time of High Lord Prothol, son of Dwillian, would be well remembered if the company survived its quest. His resolve had a forward look as he closed the chest of the second ward. His movements were crisp and decisive. He gave the cask to Korik, who bound it to his bare back with strips of Klingor and covered it by knotting his tunic shut. But Covenant looked at the remains of the brief structure of his own hope, collapsed like a child's toy house, and he did not know where to turn for new edifices. He felt vaguely that he had no solid ground on which to build them. He was too weak and tired to think about it. He stood leaning where he was for a long time, with his head bent, as if he were trying to decipher the chart of his robe. Despite the danger, the company rested and ate there in the tunnel. Prothol judged that remaining where they were for a time was as unpredictable as anything else they might do. So while the blood guards stood watch, he encouraged his companions to rest. 
Then he lay down, pillowed his head on his arms, and seemed at once to fall into deep sleep, so intensely calm and quiet that it looked more like preparation than repose. Following his example, most of the company let their eyes close, though they slept only fitfully. But Moram and Lithe remained watchful. He stared into the low fire, as if he were searching for a vision, and she sat across from him with her shoulders hunched against the oppressive weight of the mountain, as unable to rest underground, as if the lack of open sky and grasslands offended her Raman blood. Reclining against the wall, Covenant regarded the two of them, and slept a little until the stain of his ring began to fade with moonset. After that, Prothol arose, awake and alert, and roused the company. As soon as everyone had eaten again, he put out the campfire. In its place, he lit one of the Lillian Rill torches. It guttered and jumped dangerously in the thick air, but he used it, rather than his staff, to light the tunnel. Soon the quest was marching again. Helpless to do otherwise, they left their dead lying on the stone of the ward chamber. It was the only tribute they could give Birinair and the slain warriors. Again they went into darkness, led by the High Lord, through interminable, black, labyrinthian passages in the deep rock of Mount Thunder. The air became thicker, hotter, deader. In spite of occasional ascents, their main progress was downward, toward the bottomless roots of the mountain, closer with every unseen, unmeasured league, toward immense, buried, slumbering, grim ills, the terrible bones of the earth. On and on they walked, as if they were amazed by darkness, irremediable night. They made their way in hard silence, as if their lips were stiff with resisted sobs. They could not see. It affected them like a bereavement. As they approached the working heart of the White Warrens, certain sounds became louder, more distinct. The battering of anvils, the groaning of furnaces, gasps of anguish. From time to time they crossed blasts of hot, fetid air, like forced ventilation for charnel pits. And a new noise crept into their awareness a sound of bottomless boiling. For a long while they drew nearer to this deep moil without gaining any hint of what it was. Later they passed its source. Their path lay along the lip of a huge cavern. The walls were lit luridly by a seething orange sea of rock light. Far below them was a lake of molten stone. After the long darkness of their trek, the bright light hurt their eyes. The rising, acrid heat of the lake snatched at them, as if it were trying to pluck them from their perch. The deep, boiling sound thrummed in the air. Great gouts of magma spouted toward the ceiling, then fell back into the lake like crumbling towers. Vaguely, Covenant heard someone say, The demon dim in the days of High Lord Lorik discarded their failed breathing efforts here. It is said that the loathing of the demon dim and of the vials who sired them for their own forms surpassed all restraint. It led them to the spawning which made both Irviles and wane him, and it drove them to cast all their weak and faulty into such pits as this, so strongly did they abhor their unseen eyelessness. Groaning, he turned his face to the wall and crept past the cavern into the passage beyond it. When he dropped his hands from the support of the stone, his fingers twitched at his sides as if he were testing the sides of a casket. Prothal chose to rest there, just beyond the cavern of rock light. The company ate a quick, cold meal, then pressed on again into darkness. From this passage they took two turns, went up a long slope, and at length found themselves walking a ledge in a fault. Its crevice fell away to their left. Covenant made his way absently, shaking his head in an effort to clear his thoughts. Irviles reeled across his brain like images of self-hatred, premonitions. 
Was he doomed to see himself even in such creatures as that? No, he gritted his teeth. No. In the light of remembered bursts of lava, he began to fear that he had already missed his chance, his chance to fall. In time, fatigue came back over him. Prothol called a rest halt on the ledge, and Covenant surprised himself, nearly falling asleep that close to a crevice. But the High Lord was pushing toward his goal now, and did not let the company rest long. With his guttering torch, he led the quest forward again, through darkness into darkness. As the trek dragged on, their moment-by-moment moment caution began to slip. The full of the moon was coming, and somewhere ahead, Drool was preparing for them. Prothol moved as if he were eager for the last test, and led them along the ledge at a stiff pace. As a result, the lone Irvile took them all by surprise. It had hidden itself in a thin fissure in the wall of the crevice. When Covenant passed it, it sprang out at him, threw its weight against his chest. Its roinish, eyeless face was blank with ferocity. As it struck him, it grappled for his left hand. The force of the attack knocked him backward toward the crevice. For one flicker of time, he was not aware of that danger. The Irvile consumed his attention. It pulled his hand close to its face, sniffed wetly over his fingers, as if searching for something, then tried to jam his ring finger into its ragged mouth. He staggered back one more step. His foot left the ledge. In that instant, he realized the hungry fall under him. Instinctively, he closed his fist against the Irvile and ignored it. Clinging to his staff with all the strength of his half-hand, he thrust its end toward Banor. The bloodguard was already reaching for him. Banor caught hold of the staff. For one slivered moment, Covenant kept his grip. But the full weight of the Irvile hung on his left arm. His hold tore loose from the staff. With the creature struggling to bite off his ring, he plunged into the crevice. Before he could shriek his terror, a force like a boulder struck him, knocked the air from his lungs, left him gasping sickly as he plummeted. With his chest constricted and retching, unable to cry out, he lost consciousness. When he roused himself after the impact, he was struggling for air against a face full of dirt. He lay head down on a steep slope of shale and loam and refuse, and the slide caused by his landing had covered his face. For a long moment he could not move except to gag and cough. His efforts shook him without freeing him. Then, with a shuddering exertion, he rolled over, thrust up his head. He coughed up a gout of dirt and found that he could breathe, but he still could not see. The fact took a moment to penetrate his awareness. He checked his face, found that his eyes were uncovered and open, but they perceived nothing except an utter and desolate darkness. It was as if he were blind with panic, as if his optic nerves were numb with terror. For a time he did panic. Without sight, he felt the empty air suck at him as if he were drowning in quicksand. The night beat about him on naked wings like vultures dropping toward dead meat. His heart beat out heavy jolts of fear. He cowered there on his knees, abandoned, bereft of eyes and light and mind by the extremity of his dread, and his breath whimpered in his throat. But as the first rush of his panic passed, he recognized it. Fear. It was an emotion he understood, a part of the condition of his existence. And his heart went on beating. Lurching as if wounded, it still kept up his life. Suddenly, convulsively, he raised his fists and struck at the shale on either side of his head, pounded to the rhythm of his pulse, as if he were trying to beat rationality out of the dirt. No, no, I am going to survive. The assertion steadied him. Survive? He was a leper, accustomed to fear. He knew how to deal with it. Discipline, discipline. He pressed his hands over his eyeballs, 
Spots of color jerked across the black. He was not blind. He was seeing darkness. He had fallen away from the only light in the catacombs. Of course he could not see. Hell and blood. Instinctively he rubbed his hands, winced at the bruises he had given himself. Discipline. He was alone, alone, lightless, somewhere on the bottom of a ledge of the crevice, long leagues from the nearest open sky, without help, friends, rescue. For him, the outside of the mountain was as unattainable as if it had ceased to exist. Escape itself was unattainable unless discipline, unless he found some way to die. Hellfire. Thirst, hunger, injury, loss of blood. He iterated the possibilities as if he were going through a VSE. He might fall prey to some dark red bane, might stumble over a more fatal precipice. Madness, yes, it would be as easy as leprosy. Midnight wings beat about his ears, reeled vertiginously across the blind blackscape. His hands groped unconsciously around his head, seeking some way to defend himself. Damnation! None of this is happening to me. Discipline! A fetal fancy came over him. He caught hold of it as if it were a vision. Yes. Quickly he changed his position so that he was sitting on the shale slope. He fumbled over his belt until he found Atiaran's knife. Poising it carefully in his half-fingerless grip, he began to shave. Without water or a mirror, he was perilously close to slitting his throat, and the dryness of his beard caused him pain as if he were using the knife to dredge his face into a new shape. But this risk, this pain, was part of him. There was nothing impossible about it. If he cut himself, the dirt on his skin would make infection almost instantaneous. It calmed him like a demonstration of his identity. In that way, he made the darkness draw back, withhold its talents. When he was done, he mustered his resolution for an exploration of his situation. He wanted to know what kind of place he was in. Carefully, tentatively, he began searching away from the slopes on his hands and knees. Before he had moved three feet across flat stone, he found a body. The flesh yielded, as if it had not been dead long, but its chest was cold and slick, and his hand came back wet, smelling of rotten blood. He recoiled to the slope, gritted himself into motionlessness, while his lungs heaved loudly and his knees trembled. The Irvile the Irvile that had attacked him, broken by the fall. He wanted to move, but could not. The shock of discovery froze him like a sudden opening of dangerous doors. He felt surrounded by perils which he could not name. How had that creature known to attack him? Could it actually smell white gold? Then his ring began to gleam. The bloody radiation transformed it into a band of dull fire about his wedding finger, a crimson fetter. But it shed no light, did not even enable him to see the digit on which it hung. It shone balefully in front of him, exposed him to any eyes that were hidden in the dark, but it gave him nothing but dread. He could not forget what it meant. Drool's bloody moon was rising full over the land. It made him quail against the shale slope. He had a gagging sensation in his throat, as if he were being force-fed terror. Even the uncontrollable wheeze of his respiration seemed to mark him for attack by claws and fangs so invisible in the darkness that he could not visualize them. He was alone, helpless, abject. Unless he found some way to make use of the power of his ring. He fell back in revulsion from that thought, the instant it crossed his mind. No, never. He was a leper. His capacity for survival depended on a complete recognition, acceptance, of his essential impotence. That was the law of leprosy. Nothing could be as fatal to him, 
nothing could destroy him, body and mind, as painfully, as the illusion of power, power in a dream. And before he died, he would become as fetid and deformed as that man he had met in the leprosarium. No, better to kill himself outright. Anything would be better. He did not know how long he spun giddily before he heard a low noise in the darkness, distant, slippery, and ominous, as if the surrounding midnight had begun breathing softly through its teeth. It stunned him like a blow to the heart. Flinching in blind fear, he tried to fend it off. Slowly, it grew clearer, a quiet, susurrous sound, like a gritted exhalation from many throats. It infested the air like vermin, made his flesh crawl. They were coming for him. They knew where he was because of his ring, and they were coming for him. He had a quick vision of a wane him with an iron spike through its chest. He clapped his right hand over his ring, but he knew that was futile as soon as he did it. Frenetically, he began searching over the shale for some kind of weapon. Then he remembered his knife. It felt too weightless to help him. But he gripped it and went on hunting with his right hand, hardly knowing what he sought. For a long moment he fumbled around him, regardless of the noise he made. Then his fingers found his staff. Bonor must have dropped it, and it had fallen near him. The susurration drew nearer. It was the sound of many bare feet sliding over stone. They were coming for him. The staff, it was a higher brand staff. Veroticus had given it to him. In the hour of darkness, remember the higher brand staff. If he could light it, but how? The black air loomed with enemies. Their steps seemed to slide toward him from above. How? he cried desperately, trying to make the staff catch fire by sheer force of will. Veroticus! Still the feet came closer. He could hear hoarse breathing behind their sibilant approach. It had burned for him at the celebration of spring. Shaking with haste, he pressed the end of the staff to his blood-embered ring. At once, red flame blossomed on the wood, turned pale orange and yellow, flared up brightly. The sudden light dazzled him, but he leaped to his feet and held the staff over his head. He was standing at the bottom of a long slope, which filled half the floor of the crevice. This loose-piled shale had saved his life by giving under the impact of his fall, rolling him down instead of holding him where he hit. Before and behind him, the crevice stretched upward, far beyond the reach of his flame. Nearby, the Irvile lay twisted on its back, its black skin wet with blood. Shuffling purposefully toward him along the crevice floor was a disjointed company of cave whites. They were still thirty yards away, but even at that distance he was surprised by their appearance. They did not look like other cave whites he had seen. The difference was not only in costume, though these creatures were ornately and garishly caparisoned, like a royal cadre, elite and obscene. They were physically different. They were old, old prematurely, unnaturally. Their red eyes were hooded, and their long limbs bent as if the bones had been warped in a short time. Their heads sagged on necks that still looked thick enough to be strong and erect. Their heavy spatulate hands trembled as if with palsy. Together they reeked of ill, of victimization. But they came forward with clenched determination, as if they had been promised the peace of death when this last task was done. Shaking off his surprise, he brandished his staff threateningly. Don't touch me, he hissed through his teeth. Back off, I made a bargain. The cave whites gave no sign that they had heard, but they did not attack him. When they were almost within his reach, they spread out on both sides, awkwardly encircled him. Then, by giving way on one side and closing toward him on the other, they herded him in the direction from which they had come. As soon as he understood that they wished to take him someplace without a fight, he began to cooperate, 
He knew intuitively where they were going. So through their torturous herding, he moved slowly along the crevice until he reached a stair in the left wall. It was a rude way, roughly hacked out of the rock, but it was wide enough for several cave whites to climb abreast. He was able to control his vertigo by staying near the wall, away from the crevice. They ascended for several hundred feet before they reached an opening in the wall. Though the stairs continued upward, the cave whites steered him through this opening. He found himself in a narrow tunnel with a glow of rock light at its end. The creatures marched him more briskly now, as if they were hurrying him toward a scaffold. Then a wash of heat and a stink of brimstone poured over him. He stepped out of the tunnel into Kirol Threndor. He recognized the burnished stone gleam of the faceted walls, the fetid stench like sulfur consuming rotten flesh, the several entrances, the burning dance of light on the clustered stalactites high overhead. It was all as vivid to him as if it had just been translated from a nightmare. The cave whites ushered him into the chamber, then stood behind him to block the entrance. For the second time, he met Drool Rockworm. Drool crouched on his low dais in the center of the cave. He clenched the staff of law in both his huge hands, and it was by the staff that Covenant first recognized him. Drool had changed. Some blight had fallen on him. As he caught sight of Covenant, he began laughing shrilly, but his voice was weak and his laughter had a pitch of hysteria. He did not laugh long. He seemed too exhausted to sustain it. Like the cave whites who had herded Covenant, he was old. But whatever had damaged them had hurt him more. His limbs were so gnarled that he could hardly stand. Saliva ran uncontrolled from his drooping lips, and he was sweating profusely, as if he could no longer endure the heat of his own domain. He gripped the staff in an attitude of fierce possessiveness and desperation. Only his eyes had not changed. They shone redly, without iris or pupil, and seemed to froth like malicious lava, eager to devour. Covenant felt a strange mixture of pity and loathing, but he had only a moment to wonder what had happened to Drool. Then he had to brace himself. The cave white began hobbling painfully toward him. Groaning at the ache in his limbs, Drool stopped a few paces from Covenant. He released one hand from the intricately ruined staff to point a trembling finger at Covenant's wedding band. When he spoke, he cast continual twitching leers back over his shoulder, as if referring to an invisible spectator. His voice was as gnarled and racked as his arms and legs. Mine, he coughed. You promised, mine. Lord Drool, staff and ring, you promised. Do this, you said. Do that. Do not crush. Wait now. He spat viciously. Kill later. You promised. The ring if I did what you said. You said. He sounded like a sick child. Drool, Lord Drool, power, mine now. Slavering thickly, he reached a hand for Covenant's ring. Covenant reacted in instant revulsion. With his burning staff, he struck a swift blow, slapped Drool's hand away. At the impact, his staff broke into slivers, as if Drool's flesh were vehement iron. But Drool gave a coughing roar of rage and stamped the heel of the staff of law on the floor. The stone jumped under Covenant's feet. He pitched backward, landed with a jolt that seemed to stop his heart. He lay stunned and helpless. Through a throbbing noise in his ears, he heard Drool cry, Slay him! Give the ring! He rolled over. Sweat blurred his vision. Blearily, he saw the cave whites converging toward him. His heart felt paralyzed in his chest, and he could not get his feet under him. Retching for air, he tried to crawl out of reach. The first cave white caught hold of his neck, and abruptly groaned and fell away to the side. Another cave white fell. The rest drew back in confusion. One of them cried fearfully, Bloodguard! Lord Drool, help us! Fool! retorted Drool. 
coughing as if his lungs were in shreds. Coward! I am power! Slay them! Covenant climbed to his feet, wiped the sweat from his eyes, and found Bonor standing beside him. The bloodguard's robe hung tattered from his shoulders, and a large bruise on his brow closed one eye. But his hands were poised, alert. He carried himself on the balls of his feet, ready to leap in any direction. His flat eyes held a dull gleam of battle. Covenant felt such a surge of relief that he wanted to hug Bonor. After his long, lightless ordeal, he felt suddenly rescued, almost redeemed. But his gruff voice belied his emotion. What the hell took you so long? The cave whites came forward slowly, timorously, and surrounded Covenant and Bonor. Drool raged at them in hoarse gasps. Overhead, the chiaroscuro of the stalactites danced gaily. With startling casualness, Bonor replied that he had landed badly after killing the Irvile and had lost consciousness. Then he had been unable to locate Covenant in the darkness. Lashed by Drew's strident commands, a cave white charged Covenant from behind, but Bonor spun easily, felled the creature with a kick. The flame of your staff revealed you, he continued. I chose to follow. He paused to spring at two of the nearest attackers. They retreated hastily. When he spoke again, his foreign Haruchai tone held a note of final honesty. I withheld my aid, awaiting proof that you are not a foe of the Lord's. Something in the selfless and casual face that Bonor turned toward death communicated itself to Covenant. He answered without rancor, You picked a fine time to test me. The blood guard, no doubt, we require to be sure. Drool mustered his strength to shriek furiously, Fools! Worms! Afraid of only two! He spat. Go! Watch! Lord Drool kills! The cave whites gave way, and Drool came wincing forward. He held the staff of law before him like an axe. Bonor leaped, launched a kick at Drool's face. But for all his crippled condition, Drool Rockworm was full of power. He did not appear to feel Bonor's attack. In ponderous fury, he raised the staff to deal a blast which would incinerate Bonor and Covenant where they stood. Against the kind of might he wielded, they were helpless. Still, Bonor braced himself in front of Covenant to meet the blow. Flinching, Covenant waited for the pain that would set him free. But Drool was already too late. He had missed his chance, neglected other dangers. Even as he raised the staff, the company of the quest, led by First Mark Tuvor and High Lord Prothol, broke into Kirill Threndor. They looked battered, as if they had just finished a skirmish with Drool's outer defenses, but they were whole and dour-handed, and they entered the chamber like a decisive wave. Prothol stopped Drool's blast with a shout full of authority. Before the cave whites could gather themselves together, the eelmen fell on them, drove them from the cave. In a moment, Drool was surrounded by a wide ring of warriors and bloodguard. Slowly, with an appearance of confusion, he retreated until he was half crouching on his dais. He looked around the circle as if unable to realize what had happened, but his spatulate hands held the staff in a grip as grim as death. Then, grotesquely, his lava eyes took on an angle of cunning. Twitching nods over his shoulder, he hissed in a raw voice, Here, this is fair, fair, better than promises, all of them, here. Oh, little lords and puny bloodguard, humans, ready for crushing. He started to laugh, broke into a fit of coughing. Crush! He spat when he regained control of himself. Crush with power! He made a noise like a cracking of bones in his throat. Power! Little lords, mighty drool! Better than promises! Prothold faced the cave white squarely. 
giving his staff to Moram, he stepped forward to the dais with Tuvor at his side. He stood erect. His countenance was calm and clear. Supported by their years of abnegation, his eyes neither wavered nor burned. In contrast, Drool's red orbs were consumed with the experience of innumerable satiations, an addictive gluttony of power. When the High Lord spoke, even the rattle of his old voice sounded like authority and decision. Softly he said, Give it up, Drool Rockworm, hear me. The staff of law is not yours. It is not meant for you. Its strength must only be used for the health of the land. Give it to me. Covenant moved to stand near the High Lord. He felt that he had to be near the staff. But Drool only muttered, Power, give it up. Never. His lips went on moving, as if he were communing over secret plans. Again, Prothol urged, Surrender it for your own sake. Are you blind to yourself? Do you not see what has happened to you? This power is not meant for you. It destroys you. You have used the staff wrongly. You have used the ill earth stone. Such powers are deadly. Lord Fowl has betrayed you. Give the staff to me. I will strive to help you. But that idea offended Drool. Help! he coughed. Fool! I am Lord Drool, master. The moon is mine. Power is mine. You are mine. I can crush. Old man, little lord. I let you live to make me laugh. Help! No! Dance! Dance for Lord Drool! He waved the staff threateningly. Make me laugh. I let you live. Prothol drew himself up and said in a tone of command, Drool, rockworm, release the staff. He advanced a step. With a jerk like a convulsion of hysteria, Drool raised the staff to strike. Prothol rushed forward, tried to stop him, but Tuvor reached the cave white first. He caught the end of the staff. Slavering with rage, Drool jabbed the iron heel of the staff against Tuvor's body. Bloody light flashed. In that instant, the first mark's flesh became transparent. The company could see his bones burning like dry sticks. Then he fell, reeling backward, to collapse in Covenant's arms. His weight was too great for the unbeliever to hold. Covenant sank to the stone under it. Cradling Tuvor, he watched the High Lord. Prothal grappled with Drool. He grasped the staff with both hands to prevent Drool from striking him. They wrestled together for possession of it. The struggle looked impossible for Prothol. Despite his decrepitude, Drool retained some of his cave-whitish strength, and he was full of power, and Prothol was old. With Tuvor in his arms, Covenant could do nothing. Help him, he cried to Moram. He'll be killed. But Lord Moram turned his back on Prothol. He knelt beside Covenant to see if he could aid Tuvor. As he examined the first mark, he said roughly, Drool seeks to master the staff with malice. The High Lord can sing a stronger song than that. Appalled, Covenant shouted, He'll be killed. You've got to help him. Help him? Moram's eyes glinted dangerously. Pain and raw restraint sharpened his voice as he said, He would not welcome my help. He is the High Lord. Despite my oath, he choked momentarily on a throat full of passion, I would crush Drool. He invested Drool's word crush with a potential for despair that silenced Covenant. Panting, Covenant watched the High Lord's fight. He was horrified by the danger, by the price both lords were willing to pay. Then battle erupted around him. Cave whites charged into Kiro Threndor from several directions. Apparently, Drool had been able to send out a silent call. His guards were answering. The first forces to reach the chamber were not large, but they sufficed to engage the whole company. Only Moram did not join the fight. He knelt beside Covenant and stroked the first Mark's face as if he were transfixed by Tuvor's dying. 
shouting stertorously over the clash of weapons. Kwan ordered his warriors into a defensive ring around the dais and the lords. Loss and fatigue had taken their toll on the Eomen, but stalwart Kwan led his command as if the lord's need rendered him immune to weakness. Among the bloodguard, his Eomen parried, thrust, fought on the spur of his exhortations. The mounting perils made Covenant real. Prothol and Drool struggled horribly above him. The fighting around him grew faster and more frenzied by the moment. Tuvor lay expiring in his lap, and he could do nothing about any of it, help none of them. Soon their escape would be cut off, and all their efforts would be in vain. He had not foreseen this outcome to his bargain. Drool bore Prothor slowly backward. Dance! he raged. Tuvor shuddered. His eyes opened. Covenant looked away from Prothor. Tuvor's lips moved, but he made no sound. Moram tried to comfort him. Have no fear. This evil will be overcome. It is in the High Lord's hands, and your name will be remembered with honor wherever trust is valued. But Tuvor's eyes held Covenant, and he managed to whisper one word. True? His whole body strained with supplication, but Covenant did not know whether he asked for a promise or a judgment. Yet the unbeliever answered. He could not refuse a bloodguard, could not deny the appeal of such expensive fidelity. The word stuck in his throat, but he forced it out. Yes. Duvor shuddered again and died with a flat groan as if the cord of his vow had snapped. Covenant gripped his shoulders, shook him. There was no response. On the dais, Drool had forced Prothol to his knees and was bending the High Lord back to break him. In futility and rage, Covenant howled, Moram! The Lord nodded, surged to his feet, but he did not attack Drool. Holding his staff over his head, he blared in a voice that cut through the clamor of the battle, Melancuri and Abatha, Minas Mil Cabal. From end to end, his staff burst into incandescent fire. The power of the words jolted Drool, knocked him back a step. Prothol regained his feet. More cave whites rushed into Kiro Thrindor. Quan and his eelmen were driven back toward the dais. At last, Moram sprang to their aid. His staff burned furiously as he attacked. Around him, the bloodguard fought like wind devils, leaping and kicking among the cave whites so swiftly that the creatures interfered with each other when they tried to strike back. But Drew's defenders kept coming, pouring into the cave. The company began to founder in the rising onslaught. Then Prothal cried over the din, I have it! The moon is free. He stood triumphant on the dais with the staff of law upraised in his hands. Drew lay at his feet, sobbing like a piece of broken rock. Between spasms of grief, the creature gasped, Give it back! I want it! The sight struck fear into the cave whites. They recoiled, quailed back against the walls of the chamber. Released from battle, Quan and his warriors turned toward Prothol and gave a raw cheer. Their voices were hoarse and worn, but they exulted in the High Lord's victory as if he had won the future of the land. Yet overhead the dancing lights of Kiro Threndor went their own bedizened way. Covenant snapped a look at his ring. Its argent still burned with blood. Perhaps the moon was free. He was not. Before the echoes of cheering died, before anyone could move, a new sound broke over them. It started softly, then expanded until it filled the chamber like a collapse of the ceiling. It was laughter, Lord Fowl's laughter, throbbing with glee and immitigable hate. Its belittling weight dominated them, buried them in their helplessness. It paralyzed them seemed to cut them off from their own heartbeats and breathing. While it piled onto them, they were lost. Even Prothor stood still. Despite his victory, he looked old and feeble, 
and his eyes had an unfocused stare as if he were gazing into his own coffin. And Covenant, who knew that laugh, could not resist it. But Lord Moram moved. Springing onto the dais, he whirled his staff around his head until the air hummed, and blue lightning bolted upward into the clustered stalactites. Then show yourself, despiser, he shouted. If you are so certain, face us now. Do you fear to try your doom with us? Lord Fowl's laughter exploded with fiercer contempt. But Moram's defiance had broken its transfiction. Prothal touched Moram's shoulder. The warriors gripped their swords, placed themselves in grim readiness behind the lords. More cave whites entered the chamber, though they did not attack. At the sight of them, Drool raised himself on his crippled arms. His bloody eyes boiled still, clinging to fury and malice to the end. Coughing, as if he were about to heave up his heart, he gasped, The staff! You do not know, cannot use it, fools! No escape, none. I have armies, I have the stone. With a savage effort, he made himself heard through the laughter. Ill earth stone, power! and power. I will crush, crush. Flailing one weak arm at his guards, he screamed in stricken command, Crush! Wielding their weapons, the cave whites surged forward. Chapter 24 The Calling of Lions They came in a mass of red eyes, dull with empty determination. But Lord Fowl's bodiless laughter seemed to slow them. They waded through it as if it were a quagmire, and their difficult approach gave the company time to react. At Quan's command, the warriors ringed Moram and Prothal. The blood guard took fighting positions with the eomen. Moram called to Covenant. Slowly, Covenant raised his head. He looked at his companions, and they seemed pitifully few to him. He tried to get to his feet, but Tuvor was too heavy for him to lift. Even in death, the massive devotion of the first mark surpassed his strength. He heard Mainthrall Lithe shout, This way! I know the way! She was dodging among the cave whites toward one of the entrances. He watched her go as if he had already forsaken her. He could not lift Tuvor because he could not get a grip with his right hand. Two fingers were not enough. Then Banor snatched him away from the fallen first mark, thrust him toward the protective ring of the eomen. Covenant resisted. You can't leave him. But Banor forced him among the warriors. What are you doing? he protested. We've got to take him along. If you don't send him back, he won't be replaced. He spun to appeal to the lords. You can't leave him. Moram's lips stretched taut over his teeth. We must. From the mouth of the tunnel she had chosen, Lithe called, Here! She clenched her cord around the cave white's neck and used the creature's body to protect herself from attack. This is the way! Other cave whites converged on her, forced her backward. In response, Prothal lit his old staff, swung it, and led a charge toward her. With Moram's help, he burned passage for his companions through the masked cave whites. Bright lord's fire intimidated the creatures, but before the company had gained the tunnel Lithe had chosen, a wedge of Irviles drove snarling into the chamber from a nearby entrance. They were led by a mighty lore master, as black as the catacombs, wielding an iron stave that looked wet with power or blood. Prothal cried, Run! The questers dashed for the tunnel. The Irviles raced to intercept them. The company was faster. Prothol and Moram gained the passage and parted to let the others enter between them. But one of the warriors decided to help his comrades escape. He suddenly veered away from the eoman. Whirling his sword fervidly, he threw himself at the Irvile wedge. Moram yelled, started back out into the chamber to help him. But the lore master brushed the warrior aside with a slap of its stave, and he fell. Dark moisture covered him from head to foot. He screamed as if he had been drenched in acid. Moram barely evaded the stave's backstroke, 
retreated to Prothor's side in the mouth of the passage. There they tried to stand. They opposed their blazing blue flame to the Irviles. The lore master struck at them again and again. They blocked each blow with their staffs, gouts of flaming fluid, igniting blue and then turning quickly black, spattered on all sides at every clash. But the wedge fought with a savagery which drove the lords backward step by step into the tunnel. Quan tried to counter by having his strongest archers loose arrows at the lore master, but the shafts were useless. They caught fire in the Irvile's black power and burned to ashes. Behind the company, Lythe was chafing to pursue the guide of her instinct for daylight. She called repeatedly for the lords to follow her, but they could not. They did not dare turn their backs on the wedge. Each clash drove them backward. For all their courage and resolve, they were nearly exhausted, and every blow of the lore master's stave weakened them further. Now their flame had a less rampant blaze, and the burning gouts turned black more swiftly. It was clear that they could not keep up the fight, and no one in the company could take it for them. Abruptly Moram shouted, Back! Make room! His urgency allowed no refusal. Even the blood guard obeyed. Covenant! Moram cried. Covenant moved forward until he was only an arm's length from the searing battle. Raise your ring! Compelled by Moram's intensity, the unbeliever lifted his left hand. A crimson cast still stained the heart of his wedding band. The lore master observed the ring as if suddenly smelling its presence. It recognized white gold, hesitated. The wedge halted, though the lore master did not drop its guard. Ellen Kurian Abatha, Moram commanded. Blast them! Half intuitively, Covenant understood. He jabbed at the lore master with his left fist, as if launching a boat. Barking in strident fear, the whole wedge recoiled. In that instant, the lords acted, shouting, Minas mil cabal, on different pitches in half-screamed harmony. They drew with their fire an X, which barricaded the tunnel from top to bottom. The flame of the X hung in the air, and before it could die, Prothol placed his staff erect within it. At once, a sheet of blue flared in the passage. Howling in rage at Moram's ruse, the Irvile sprang forward. The lore master struck hugely at the flame with its stave. The fiery wall rippled and fluttered, but did not let the wedge pass. Prothol and Moram took only a moment to see how their power held. Then they turned and dashed down the tunnel. Gasping for breath, Moram told the company, We have forbidden the tunnel, but it will not endure. We are not strong enough. The High Lord's staff was needed to make any forbidding at all, and the Irviles are savage. Drool drives them mad with the ill earth stone. In spite of his haste, his voice carried a shudder. No, we must run, we must escape, must. All our work will go for nothing if we do not take both staff and ward to safety. Come, the main thrall responded. I know grass and sky. I can find the way. Prothol nodded agreement, but his movements were slow, despite the need for alacrity. He was exhausted, driven far past the normal limits of his stamina. With his breath rattling deep in his chest, as if he were drowning in the phlegm of his age, he leaned heavily on the staff of law. Go, he panted. Run! Two bloodguard took his arms, and between them, he stumbled into a slow run down the passage. Rallying around him, the company started away after Lythe. At first they went easily. Their tunnel offered few branchings. At each of these, Lythe seemed instantly sure which held the greatest promise of daylight. Lit from behind by Moram's staff, she loped forward as if following a warm trail of freedom. After the struggles of close combat, the company found relief in simple, single-minded running. It allowed them to focus and conserve their strength. Furthermore, they were passing, 
as if slowly liberated, out of the range of Lord Fowle's laughter. Soon they could hear neither mockery nor threat of slaughter at their backs. For once, the silent darkness befriended them. For nearly a league, they hastened onward. They began to traverse a section of the catacombs, which was intricate with small caves and passages and turnings, but which appeared to contain no large halls, crevices, whiteworks. Throughout these multiplied corridors, Lythe did not hesitate. Several times she took ways which inclined slowly upward. But as the complex tunnels opened into broader and blacker ways, where Moram's flame illumined no cave walls or ceilings, the catacombs became more hostile. Gradually the silence changed, lost the hue of relief, and became the hush of ambush. The darkness around Moram's light seemed to conceal more and more. At the turnings and intersections, night thickened in their choices, clouding Lythe's instinct. She began to falter. Behind her, Prothal grew less and less able to keep up the pace. His hoarse, wheezing breath was increasingly labored. Even the weariest questers could hear his gasps over their own hard panting. The blood guard were almost carrying him. Still they pushed on into stark midnight. They bore the staff of law and the second ward, and could not afford surrender. Then they reached a high cave, which formed a crossroads for several tunnels. The general direction they had maintained since Kiro Threndor was continued by one passage across the cave. But Lythe stopped in the center of the junction, as if she had been reined to a halt. She searched about her uncertainly, confused by the number of her choices, and by some intuitive rejection of her only obvious selection. Shaking her head as if resisting a bit, she groaned, Ah, lords, I do not know. Oram snapped, You must. We have no other chance. The old maps do not show these ways. You have led us far beyond our kin. He gripped her shoulder as if he meant to force her decision. But the next moment he was distracted by Prothal. With a sharp spasm of coughing, the High Lord collapsed to the floor. One blood guard quickly propped him into a sitting position, and Moram knelt beside him, peering with intent concern into his old face. Rest briefly, mumbled Moram. Our forbidding has long since broken. We must not delay. Between fits of coughing, the High Lord replied, Leave me. Take the staff and go. I am done. His words appalled the company. Covenant and the warriors covered their own breathing to hear Moram's answer. The air was suddenly intense with the fear that Moram would accept Prothal's sacrifice. But Moram said nothing. Leave me, Prothal repeated. Give your staff to me, and I will defend your retreat as I can. Go, I say. I am old. I have had my time of triumph. I lose nothing. Take the staff and go. When the Lord still did not speak, he rattled in supplication, Moram, hear me. Do not let my old bones destroy this high quest. I hear you. Moram's voice sounded thick and wounded in his throat. He knelt with his head bowed. But a moment later he rose to his feet and put back his head and began to laugh. It was quiet laughter, unfeverish and unforced, the laughter of relief and in despair. The company gaped at it until they understood that it was not hysteria. Then, without knowing why, they laughed in response. Humor ran like a clean wind through their hearts. Covenant almost cursed aloud because he could not share it. When they had subsided into low chuckling, Moram said to the High Lord, Ah, Prothal, son of Twillian, it is good that you are old. Leave you? How will I be able to take pleasure in telling Osandrea of your great exploits if you are not there to protest my boasting? Gaily he laughed again. Then, as if recollecting himself, he returned to where Lythe stood bewildered in the center of the cave. Mainthrall, he said gently, 
You have done well. Your instinct is true. Remember it now. Put all doubt away. We do not fear to follow where your heart leads. Covenant had noticed that she, too, had not joined the laughter of the company. Her eyes were troubled. He guessed that her swift blood had been offended by Moram's earlier sharpness. But she nodded gravely to the Lord. That is well. My thoughts do not trust my heart. In what way? My thoughts say that we must continue as we have come. But my heart wishes to go there. She indicated a tunnel opening back almost in the direction from which they had come. I do not know, she concluded simply. This is new to me. But Moram's reply held no hesitation. You are main thrall lithe of the Raman. You have served the Ranihin. You know grass and sky. Trust your heart. After a moment, lithe accepted his counsel. Two bloodguard helped Prothal to his feet. Supporting him between them, they joined the company and followed Lai's instinct into the tunnel. This passage soon began to descend slowly, and they set a good pace down it. They were buoyed along by the hope that their pursuers would not guess what they were doing, and so would neither cut them off nor follow them directly. But in the universal darkness and silence they had no assurances. Their way met no branchings, but it wavered as if it were tracing a vein in the mountain. Finally, it opened into a vast impression of blank space and began to climb a steep, serrated rock face through a series of switchbacks. Now the company had to toil upward. The difficulties of the ascent slowed them as much as the climbing. The higher they went, the colder the air became and the more there seemed to be a wind blowing in the dark gulf beside them. But the cold and the wind only accented their dripping sweat and the exhausted rack of their respiration. The bloodguard alone appeared unworn by the long days of their exertion. They strode steadily up the slope, as if it were just a variation of their restless devotion. But their companions were more death-prone. The warriors and covenant, began to stagger like cripples in the climb. Finally, Moram called a halt. Covenant dropped to sit with his back to the rock, facing the black-blown, measureless cavern. The sweat seemed to freeze on his face. The last of the food and drink was passed around, but in this buried place both appeared to have lost their capacity to refresh, as if at last even sustenance were daunted by the darkness of the catacombs. Covenant ate and drank numbly. Then he shut his eyes to close out the empty blackness for a time. But he saw it, whether his eyes were open or not. Some time later, Covenant no longer measured duration, Lord Moram said in a stinging whisper, I hear them. Corrick's reply sounded as hollow as a sigh from a tomb. Yes, they follow. They are a great many. Lurching as if stricken, the questers began to climb again, pushing themselves beyond the limits of their strength. They felt weak with failure, as if they were moving only because Moram's blue flame pulled them forward, compelled them, beseeched, cajoled, urged, inspired, refused to accept anything from them except endurance and more endurance. Disregarding every exigency, except the need for escape, they continued to climb. Then the wind began to howl around them, and their way changed. The chasm abruptly narrowed. They found themselves on a thin spiral stair, carved into the wall of a vertical shaft. The width of the rude steps made them ascend in single file, and the wind went yelling up the shaft as if it fled the catacombs in stark terror. Covenant groaned when he realized that he would have to risk yet another perilous height, but the rush of the wind was so powerful that it seemed to make falling impossible. Cycling dizzily, he struggled up the stair. The shaft went straight upward, and the wind yowled in pain, and the company climbed as if they were being dragged by the air. 
but as the shaft narrowed, the force of the wind increased. The air began to move past them too fast for breathing. As they gasped upward, a light-headed vertigo came over them. The shaft seemed to cant precariously from side to side. Covenant moved on his hands and knees. Soon the whole company was crawling. After an airless ache which extended interminably around him, Covenant lay stretched out on the stairs. He was not moving. Dimly he heard voices trying to shout over the roar of the wind, but he was past listening. He felt that he had reached the verge of suffocation, and the only thing he wanted to do was weep. He could hardly remember what prevented him, even now, from releasing his misery. Hands grabbed his shoulders, hauled him up onto flat stone. They dragged him ten or fifteen feet along the bottom of a thin crevice. The howl of the wind receded. He heard Quan give a choked, panting cheer. With an effort, he raised his head. He was sprawled in the crevice where it opened on one of the eastern faces of Mount Thunder. Across a flat, gray expanse far below him, the sun rose redly. To his stunned ears, the cheering itself sounded like sobs. It spread as the warriors one by one climbed out past him into the dawn. Lithe had already leaped down a few feet from the crevice and was on her knees kissing the earth. Far away, across the sarin grave and the gleaming line of the defile's course and the great swamp, the sun stood up regally, wreathed in red splendor. Covenant pushed himself into a sitting position and looked over at the lords to see their victory. They had no aspect of triumph. The high lord sat crumpled like a sack of old bones with the staff of law on his knees. His head was bowed, and he covered his face with both hands. Beside him, Moram stood still and dour, and his eyes were as bleak as a wilderness. Covenant did not understand. Then Banor said, We can defend here. Moram's reply was soft and violent. How? Drool knows many ways. If we prevent him here, he will attack from below, above. He can bring thousands against us. Then close this gap to delay them. Moram's voice became softer still. The High Lord has no staff. I cannot forbid the gap alone. I have not the power. Do you believe that I am strong enough to bring down the walls of this crevice? No, not even if I were willing to damage the earth in that way. We must escape. There. He pointed down the mountainside with a hand that trembled. Covenant looked downward. The crevice opened into the bottom of a ravine, which ran straight down the side of Mount Thunder like a knife wound. The spine of this cut was jumbled and tossed with huge rocks, fallen boulders, pieces of the higher cliffs like dead fragments of the mountain, and its walls were sheer, unclimbable. The questers would have to pick their way torturously along the bottom of the cut for half a league. There the walls gave way, and the ravine dropped over a cliff. When the company reached the cliff, they would have to try to work around the mountainsides until they found another descent. Still Covenant did not understand. He groaned at the difficulty of the ravine, but it was escape. He could feel sunlight on his face. Heaving himself to his feet, he muttered, Let's get going. Moram gave him a look thick with suppressed pain, but he did not voice it. Instead, he spoke stiffly to Quan and Korik. In a few moments, the questers started down the ravine. Their progress was deadly slow. In order to make their way, they had to climb from rock to rock, swing themselves over rough boulders, squeeze on hands and knees through narrow gaps between huge fists of stone. And they were weak. The strongest of the warriors needed help time and again from the blood guard. Prothol had to be almost entirely carried. He clutched the staff and scrabbled frailly at the climbs. Whenever he jumped from a rock, he fell to his knees. Soon the front of his robe was spattered with blood. Covenant began to sense their danger. 
Their pace might be fatal. If Drool knew other ways onto the slope, his forces might reach the end of the ravine before the company did. He was not alone in his perception. After their first relief, the warriors took on a haunted look. Soon they were trudging, clambering, struggling with their heads bowed and backs bent, as if the weight of all they had ever known were tied around their necks. The sunlight did not allow them to be ignorant of their peril. Like a prophecy, their fear was fulfilled before the company was halfway down the ravine. One of the eomen gave a broken cry, pointed back up the mountain. There they saw a horde of Irviles rushing out of the cleft from which they had come. They tried to push faster down the littered spine of the cut, but the Irviles poured after them like a black flood. The creatures seemed to spring over the rocks without danger of misstep, as if borne along by a rush of savagery. They gained on the company with sickening speed. And the Irviles were not alone. Near the end of the ravine, Cave White suddenly appeared atop one wall. As soon as they spotted the questers, they began throwing ropes over the edge, scaling down the wall. The company was caught like a group of mites in the pincers of Drool's power. They stood where they were, paralyzed by dismay. For a moment, even Quan's sense of responsibility for his eelmen failed. He stared blankly about him and did not move. Covenant sagged against a boulder. He wanted to scream at the mountain that this was not fair. He had already survived so much, endured so much, lost so much. Where was his escape? Was this the cost of his bargain, his forbearance? It was too great. He was a leper, not made for such ordeals. His voice shook uncontrollably, full of useless outrage. No wonder he... Let us have the staff, so it would hurt worse now. He knew we wouldn't get away with it. But Moram shouted orders in a tone that cut through the dismay. He ran a short way down the ravine and climbed onto a wide, flat rock higher than the others near it. There is space for us. Come, he commanded. We will make our end here. Slowly the warriors shambled to the rock, as if they were overburdened with defeat. Moram and the blood guard helped them up. High Lord Prothol came last, propped between two blood guard. He was muttering, no, no, but he did not resist Moram's orders. When everyone was on the rock, Quan's eelman and the blood guard placed themselves around its edge. Lithe joined them, her cord taut in her hands, leaving Prothol and Moram and Covenant in the ring of the company's last defense. Now the Irviles had covered half the distance to the rock where the company stood. Behind them came hundreds of cave whites, gushing out of the crevice and pouring down the ravine, and as many more worked upward from the place where they had entered the cut. Surveying Drool's forces, Moram said softly, Take heart, my friends, you have done well. Now let us make our end so bravely that even our enemies will remember it. Do not despair. There are many chances between the onset of a war and victory. Let us teach Lord Fowl that he will never taste victory until the last friend of the land is dead. But Prothol whispered, No, no. Facing upward toward the crest of Mount Thunder, he planted his feet and closed his eyes. With slow resolution, he raised the staff of law level with his heart, and gripped it in both fists. It must be possible, he breathed. By the seven, it must. His knuckles whitened on the intricate, ruined, and secret surface of the staff. Melancholian Skyweir, help me. I do not accept this end. His brow slowly knotted over his shut, sunken eyes, and his head bowed until his beard touched his heart. From between his pale lips, came a whispered, wordless song. But his voice rattled so huskily in his chest that his song sounded more like a dirge than an invocation. Drew's forces poured down and surged up at the company inexorably. 
Moram watched them with a rictus of helplessness on his humane lips. Suddenly, a desperate chance blazed in his eyes. He spun, gripped covenant with his gaze, whispered, There is a way. Prothol strives to call the fire lions. He cannot succeed. The power of the staff is closed, and we have not the knowledge to unlock it. But white gold can release that power. It can be done. Covenant recoiled, as if Moram had betrayed him. No, he panted. I made a bargain. Then, with a sickening, vertiginous twist of insight, he caught a glimpse of Lord Fowle's plan for him, glimpsed what the despiser was doing to him. Here was the killing blow which had lain concealed behind all the machinations, all the subterfuge. Hell and blood. Here was the point of impact between his opposing madnesses. If he attempted to use the wild magic, if his ring had power, if it had no power, he flinched at the reel and strike of dark visions, the company slain, the staff destroyed, thousands of creatures dead, all that blood on his head, his head. No, he gasped thickly, don't ask me. I promised I wouldn't do any more killing. You don't know what I've done to Ati Aran, to... I made a bargain so I wouldn't have to do any more killing. The Irviles and Cave Whites were almost within bowshot now. The Eelmen had arrows knocked and ready. Drool's horde slowed, began to poise for the last spring of attack. But Moram's eyes did not release Covenant. There will be still more killing if you do not. Do you believe that Lord Fowl will be content with our deaths? Never. He will slay and slay again until all life without exception is his to corrupt or destroy. All life, do you hear? Even these creatures that now serve him will not be spared. No, Covenant groaned again. Don't you see this is just what he wants? The staff will be destroyed, or Drool will be destroyed, or we'll... No matter what happens, he'll win, he'll be free. You're doing just what he wants. Nevertheless, Moram returned fervidly. The dead are dead. Only the living may hope to resist despite. Hellfire! Covenant groped for answers like a man incapable of his own distress. But he found none. No bargain or compromise met his need. In his pain he cried out wildly, protested, appealed. Moram, it's suicide. You're asking me to go crazy. The peril in Moram's eyes did not waver. No, unbeliever, you need not lose your mind. There are other answers, other songs. You can find them. Why should the land be destroyed for your pain? Save or damn. Grasp the staff. Damnation! Fumbling furiously for his ring, Covenant shouted, Do it yourself! He wrenched the band from his finger and tried to throw it at Moram but he was shaking madly. His fingers slipped. The ring dropped to the stone, rolled away. He scrambled after it. He did not seem to have enough digits to catch it. It skidded past Prothol's feet. He lurched toward it again, then missed his footing, fell, and smacked his forehead on the stone. Distantly, he heard the thrum of bowstrings. The battle had begun. But he paid no attention. He felt that he had cracked his skull. When he raised his head, he found that his vision was wrong. He was seeing double. The moss-stained chart of his robe smeared illegibly in his sight. Now he had lost whatever chance he had to read it, decipher the cryptic message of Morin Moss. He saw two of Moram as the Lord held up the ring. He saw two Prothols above him, clutching the staff, and trying with the last strength of his life force to compel its power to his will. Two Bonors turned away from the fight toward the Lord's. Then Moram stooped to Covenant. The Lord lashed out, caught his right wrist. The grip was so fierce that he felt his bones grinding together. It forced his hand open, and when his two fingers were spread and vulnerable, 
Moram shoved the ring onto his index digit. It stuck after the first knuckle. I cannot usurp your place, the double lord grated. He stood and roughly pulled Covenant erect. Thrusting his double face at the unbeliever, he hissed, By the seven, you fear power more than weakness. Yes, Covenant moaned at the pain in his wrist and head. Yes, I want to survive. The snap of bowstrings came now as fast as the warriors could ready their arrows, but their supply of shafts was limited, and the Irviles and Cave Whites hung back, risking themselves only enough to draw the warriors' fire. Drool's forces were in no hurry. The Irviles, particularly, looked ready to relish the slow slaughter of the company. But Covenant had no awareness to spare for such things. He stared in a kind of agony at Moram. The Lord seemed to have two mouths, lips stretched over multiplied teeth, and four eyes, all aflame with compulsions. Because he could think of no other appeal, he reached his free hand to his belt, took out Atiaran's knife, and extended it toward Moram. Through his teeth he pleaded, It would be better if you killed me. Slowly, Moram's grip eased. His lips softened. The fire of his eyes faded. His gaze seemed to turn inward, and he winced at what he beheld. When he spoke, his voice sounded like dust. Ah, Covenant, forgive me. I forget myself. Foam follower, foam follower understood this. I should have heard him more clearly. It is wrong to ask for more than you give freely. In this way, we come to resemble what we hate. He released Covenant's wrist and stepped back. My friend, this is not on your head. The burden is ours, and we bear it to the end. Forgive me. Covenant could not answer. He stood with his face twisted, as if he were about to howl. His eyes ached at the duplicity of his vision. Moram's mercy affected him more than any argument or demand. He turned miserably toward Prothol. Could he not find somewhere the strength for that risk? Perhaps the path of escape lay that way. Perhaps the horror of wild magic was the price he would have to pay for his freedom. He did not want to be killed by Irviles. But when he raised his arm, he could not tell which of those hands was his, which of those two staffs was the real one. Then, with a flat thrum, the last arrow was gone. The cave whites gave a vast shout of malice and glee. At the command of the Irviles they began to approach. The warriors drew their swords, braced themselves for their useless end. The bloodguard balanced on the balls of their feet. Trembling, Covenant tried to reach toward the staff, but his head was spinning, and a whirl of darkness jumped dizzily at him. He could not overcome his fear, he was appalled at the revenge his leprosy would wreak on him for such audacity. His hand crossed half the distance and stopped, clutched in unfingered impotence at the empty air. Ah, he cried lornly, help me. We are the blood guard. Bonar's voice was almost inaudible through the loud lust of the cave whites. We cannot permit this end. Firmly, he took Covenant's hand and placed it on the staff of law, midway between Prothal's straining knuckles. Power seemed to explode in Covenant's chest. A silent concussion, a shock beyond hearing, struck the ravine like a convulsion of the mountain. The blast knocked the questers from their feet, sent all the Irviles and Cave Whites sprawling among the boulders. Only the High Lord kept his feet. His head jerked up and the staff bucked in his hands. For a moment there was stillness in the ravine, a quiet so intense that the blast seemed to have deafened all the combatants. And in that moment the entire sky over Graben Threndor turned black with impenetrable thunder. Then came noise, one deep bolt of sound as if the very rock of the mountain cried out, followed by long waves of hot hissing sputters. 
The clouds dropped until they covered the crest of Mount Thunder. Great yellow fires began to burn on the shrouded peak. For a time, the company and their attackers lay in the ravine as if they were afraid to move. Everyone stared up at the fires and the thunderheads. Suddenly the flames erupted. With a roar as if the air itself were burning, fire started charging like great hungry beasts down every face and side of the mountain. Shrieking in fear, the cave whites sprang up and ran. A few hurled themselves madly against the walls of the ravine, but most of them swept around the company's rock and fled downward, trying to outrun the fire lions. The Irviles went the other way. In furious haste, they scrambled up the ravine toward the entrance to the catacombs. But before they could reach safety, Drool appeared out of the cleft above them. The cave white was crawling, too crippled to stand. But in his fist he clutched a green stone which radiated intense wrong through the blackness of the clouds. His scream carried over the roar of the lions. Crush! Crush! The Irvile stopped, caught between fears. While the creatures hesitated, the company started down the ravine. Both all and Covenant were too exhausted to support themselves, so the blood guard bore them, throwing them from man to man over the boulders, dragging them along the tumbled floor of the ravine. Ahead, the cave whites began to reach the end of the cut. Some of them ran so blindly that they plunged over the cliff. Others scattered in either direction along the edge, wailing for escape. But behind the company, the Irviles formed a wedge and again started downward. The questers were barely able to keep their distance from the wedge. The roar of the flaming air grew sharper, fiercer. Set free by the power of the peak, boulders tumbled from the cliffs. The fire lions moved like molten stone, sprang down the slopes as if spewed out of the heart of an inferno. Still far above the ravine, the consuming howl of their might seemed to double and treble itself with each downward lunge. A blast of scorched air blew ahead of them like a herald, trumpeting the progress of fire and volcanic hunger. Graventhrendor shuddered to its roots. The difficulty of the ravine eased as the company neared the lower end, and Covenant began to move for himself. Impelled by broken vision, overborne hearing, gaining rampage, he shook free of the blood guard. Moving stiff-kneed like a puppet, he jerked in a dogged, stumbling line for the cliff. The other questers swung to the south along the edge, but he went directly to the precipice. When he reached it, his legs barely had the strength to stop him. Tottering weakly, he looked down the drop. It was sheer for two thousand feet, and the cliff was at least half a league wide. There was no escape. The lions would get the company before they reached any possible descent beyond the cliff, long before. People yelled at him, warning him futilely. He could hardly hear them through the roaring air. He gave no heed. That kind of escape was not what he wanted, and he was not afraid of the fall. He could not see it clearly enough to be afraid. He had something to do. He paused for a moment, summoning his courage. Then he realized that one of the blood guard would probably try to save him. He wanted to accomplish his purpose before that could happen. He needed an answer to death. Pulling off his ring, he held it firmly in his half-fingerless hand, cocked his arm to throw the band over the cliff. His eyes followed the ring as he drew back his arm, and he stopped suddenly, struck by a blow of shame. The metal was clean. His vision still saw two rings, but both were flat argent. The stain was gone from within them. He spun from the cliff, searched up the ravine for drool. He heard Moram shout, Banor, it is his choice. The bloodguard was sprinting toward him. At Moram's command, Banor pulled to a halt ten yards away, despite his vow. The next instant... He rejected the command, leaped toward Covenant again. Covenant could not focus his vision. He caught a glimpse of fiery lions pouncing toward the crevice high up the ravine. 
but his sight was dominated by the Irvile Wedge. It was only three strides away from him. The Loremaster had already raised its stave to strike. Instinctively, Covenant tried to move, but he was too slow. He was still leaning when Bonor crashed into him, knocked him out of the way. With a mad, exulting bark, as if they had suddenly seen a vision, the Irvile sprang forward as one and plunged over the cliff. Their cries as they fell sounded ferociously triumphant. Bonor lifted Covenant to his feet. The bloodguard urged him toward the rest of the company, but he broke free and stumbled a few steps up the slope, straining his eyes toward the crevice. Drool! What happened to Drool? His eyes failed him. He stopped, wavered uncertainly, raged. I can't see! Moram hastened to him, and Covenant repeated his question, shouting it into the Lord's face. Moram replied gently, Drool is there in the crevice. Power that he could not master destroys him. He no longer knows what he does. In a moment, the fire lions will consume him. Covenant strove to master his voice by biting down on it. No, he hissed. He's just another victim. Foul planned this all along. Despite his clamped teeth, his voice sounded broken. Comfortingly, Moram touched his shoulder. Be at peace, unbeliever. We have done all we can. You need not condemn yourself. Abruptly, Covenant found that his rage was gone, collapsed into dust. He felt blasted and wrecked, and he sank to the ground as if his bones could no longer hold him. His eyes had a tattered look, like the sails of a ghost ship. Without caring what he did, he pushed his wedding band back onto his ring finger. The rest of the company was moving toward him. They had given up their attempt at flight. Together they watched the progress of the lions. The midnight clouds cast a gloom over the whole mountain, and through the dimness the pouncing fires blazed and coruscated like beasts of sun flame. They sprang down the walls into the ravine, and some of them bounded upward toward the crevice. Lord Moram finally shook himself free of his entrancement. Call your Anihin, he commanded Banor. The blood guard can save themselves. Take the staff and the second ward. Call the Ranihin and escape. Banor met Moram's gaze for a long moment, measuring the Lord's order. Then he refused stolidly. One of us will go to carry the staff and ward to Lord's keep. The rest remain. Why, we cannot escape. You must live to serve the lords who must carry on this war. Perhaps, Bonor shrugged slightly. Who can say? High Lord Kevin ordered us away, and we obeyed. We will not do such a thing again. But this death is useless, cried Moram. Nevertheless, the bloodguard's tone was as blank as iron. Then he added, But you can call Hineril. Do so, Lord. No, Moram sighed with a tired smile of recognition. I cannot. How could I leave so many to die? Covenant only half listened. He felt like a derelict, and he was picking among the wreckage of his emotions in search of something worth salvaging. But part of him understood. He put the two fingers of his right hand between his lips and gave one short, piercing whistle. All the company stared at him. Quan seemed to think that the unbeliever had lost his mind. Moram's eyes jumped at wild guesses. But Mainthrall Live tossed her cord high in the air and crowed, The Ranihin, Mane of the World, he calls them. How? protested Quan. He refused them. They reared to him, she returned with a nickering laugh. They will come. Covenant had stopped listening altogether. Something was happening to him, and he lurched to his feet to meet it upright. The dimensions of his situation were changing. To his blurred gaze, the comrades of the company grew slowly harder and solider, took on the texture of native rock, and the mountain itself became increasingly adamantine. It seemed as immutable as the cornerstone of the world. 
He felt veils drop from his perception. He saw the unclouded fact of Graven Threndor in all its unanswerable power. He paled beside it. His flesh grew thin, transient. Air as thick as smoke blew through him, chilling his bones. The throat of his soul contracted in silent pain. What's happening to me? Around the cliff edge to the south, Ronihin came galloping. Like a blaze of hope, they raced the downrush of the lions. At once, a hoarse cheer broke from the warriors. We are saved, Moram cried. There is time enough. With the rest of the company, he hurried forward to meet the swift approach of the Ranihin. Covenant felt that he had been left alone. What's happening to me? He repeated dimly toward the hard mountain. But Prothol was still at his side. Covenant heard the High Lord say in a kind old voice that seemed as loud as thunder, Drool is dead. He was your summoner, and with his death the call ends. That is the way of such power. Farewell, unbeliever. Be true. You have wrought greatly for us. The Ranihin will preserve us. And with the staff of law and the second ward, we will not be unable to defend against the despiser's ill. Take heart. Despair and bitterness are not the only songs in the world. But Covenant wailed in mute grief. Everything around him, Prothol and the company and the Ranihin and the fire lions and the mountain, became too solid for him. They overwhelmed his perceptions, passed beyond his senses into gray mist. He clutched about him and felt nothing. He could not see. The land left the range of his eyes. It was too much for him, and he lost it. Chapter 25 Survived Gray mist swirled around him for a long, convulsive moment. Then it began to smear, and he lost it as well. His vision blurred, as if some hard god had rubbed a thumb across it. He blinked rapidly, tried to reach up to squeeze his eyes. But something soft prevented his hand. His sight remained blank. He was waking up, though he felt more as if he were dropping into grogginess. Gradually he became able to identify where he was. He lay in a bed with tubular protective bars on the sides. White sheets covered him to his chin. Gray curtains shut him off from the other patients in the room. A fluorescent light stared past him emptily from the ceiling. The air was faintly tinged with ether and germicide. A call button hung at the head of the bed. All his fingers and toes were numb. Nerves don't regenerate. Of course they don't. They don't. This was important. He knew it was important. But for some reason it did not carry any weight with him. His heart was too hot with other emotions to feel that particular ice. What mattered to him was that Prothol and Moram and the quest had survived. He clung to that as if it were proof of sanity, a demonstration that what had happened to him that what he had done was not the product of madness, self-destruction. They had survived. At least his bargain with the Ranihin had accomplished that much. They had done exactly what Lord Fowl wanted them to do, but they had survived. At least he was not guilty of their deaths, too. His inability to use his ring, to believe in his ring, had not made wraiths of them. That was his only consolation for what he had lost. Then he made out two figures standing at the foot of the bed. One of them was a woman in white, a nurse. As he tried to focus on her, she said, Doctor, he's regaining consciousness. The doctor was a middle-aged man in a brown suit. The flesh under his eyes sagged as if he were weary of all human pain. But his lips under his graying mustache were gentle. He approached along the side of the bed, touched Covenant's forehead for a moment, then pulled up Covenant's eyelids and shined a small light at his pupils. With an effort, Covenant focused on the light. The doctor nodded and put his flashlight away. 
Mr. Covenant? Covenant swallowed at the dryness in his throat. Mr. Covenant? The doctor held his face close to Covenant's and spoke quietly, calmly. You're in the hospital. You were brought here after your run-in with that police car. You've been unconscious for about four hours. Covenant lifted his head and nodded to show that he understood. Good, said the doctor. I'm glad you're coming around. Now, let me talk to you for a moment. Mr. Covenant, the police officer who was driving that car says that he didn't hit you. He claims that he stopped in time. You just fell down in front of him. From my examination, I would be inclined to agree with him. Your hands are scraped up a bit, and you have a bruise on your forehead, but things like that could have happened when you fell. He hesitated momentarily, then asked, Did he hit you? Dumbly, Covenant shook his head. The question did not feel important. Well, I suppose you could have knocked yourself out by hitting your head on the pavement. But why did you fall? That, too, did not feel important. He pushed the question away with a twitch of his hands. Then he tried to sit up in bed. He succeeded before the doctor could help or hinder him. He was not as weak as he had feared he might be. The numbness of his fingers and toes still seemed to lack conviction, as if they would recover as soon as their circulation was restored. Nerves don't. After a moment he regained his voice and asked for his clothes. The doctor studied him closely. Mr. Covenant, he said, I'll let you go home if you want to. I suppose I should keep you under observation for a day or two, but I really haven't been able to find anything wrong with you. And you know more about taking care of leprosy than I do. Covenant did not miss the look of nausea that flinched across the nurse's face. And, to be perfectly honest, the doctor's tone turned suddenly acid. I don't want to have to fight the staff here to be sure that you get decent care. Do you feel up to it? In answer, Covenant began fumbling with awkward fingers at the dull white hospital gown he wore. Abruptly, the doctor went to a locker and came back with Covenant's clothes. Covenant gave them a kind of BSE. They were scuffed and dusty from his fall in the street, yet they looked exactly as they had looked when he had last worn them during the first days of the quest, exactly as if none of it had ever happened. When he was dressed, he signed the releases. His hand was so cold that he could hardly write his name. But the quest had survived. At least his bargain had been good for that. Then the doctor gave him a ride in a wheelchair down to the discharge exit. Outside the building, the doctor suddenly began to talk, as if in some oblique way he were trying to apologize for not keeping Covenant in the hospital. It must be hell to be a leper, he said rapidly. I'm trying to understand. It's like I studied in Heidelberg years ago, and while I was there I saw a lot of medieval art especially religious art. Being a leper reminds me of statues of the crucifixion made during the Middle Ages. There is Christ on the cross, and his features, his body, even his face, are portrayed so blandly that the figure is unrecognizable. It could be anyone, man or woman. But the wounds, the nails in the hands and feet, the spear in the side, the crown of thorns, are carved and even painted in incredibly vivid detail. You would think the artist crucified his model to get that kind of realism. Being a leper must be like that. Covenant felt the doctor's sympathy, but he could not reply to it. He did not know how. After a few minutes, an ambulance came and took him back to Haven Farm. He had survived. He walked up the long driveway to his house as if that were his only hope. Here ends Lord Fowl's Bane, Book One of The Chronicles of Thomas Covenant, the Unbeliever. Glossary A Sense 
a stone downer, sister of Atiaran. Aliantha, treasure berries. Amanibhavam, horse healing grass, poisonous to men. Anundivian Yajna, lost Raman craft of bone sculpting. Atiaran Trailmate, a stone downer, daughter of Tiaran. Banas Nimorum, the celebration of spring. Banor, a blood guard assigned to Covenant. Baradicus, a higher brand of soaring woodhelven. Beric Halfhand, founder of the line of lords. Brothair, a people met by the wandering giants. Virenair, a higher brand, Harthrall of Lord's Keep. Bloodguard, the defenders of the lords. Brabha, a Ranihan, Korik's mount. Kaamora, giantish ordeal of grief by fire. Kaaroyal Wildwood, forest hall of garroting deep. Cave Whites, evil creatures existing under Mount Thunder. Celebration of Spring, the dance of the wraiths of Andalane on the dark of the moon in the middle night of spring. Klingor, adhesive leather. Close, thee, the council chamber of Lord's Keep. Cord, Raman's second rank. Cording, ceremony of becoming a cord. Corruption. Bloodguard name for Lord Fowl. Creator, the legendary enemy of Lord Fowl. Damalon Giant Friend, son of Beric Halfhand, ancient High Lord. Dance of the Wraiths, celebration of spring. Demon Dim, spawners of Irviles and Wayne Him. Desolation, the Era of ruin in the land after the ritual of desecration. Despiser, the Lord Fowl. Despite, power of evil. Diamond draft, giantish liquor. Drool rockworm, a cave white, finder of the staff of law. Jura fair flank, a mustang, covenant's mount. Earth friend, Title first given to Beric Halfhand. Elohim, a people met by the wandering giants. Eoman, a unit of the warward of Lord's Keep, twenty warriors and a war haft. Thang Thane the Render, Raman name for Lord Fowl. Fire Lions, fire flow of Mount Thunder. Fire Stones, graveling. First Mark. A blood guard commander. First ward of Kevin's lore. Primary knowledge left by High Lord Kevin. Forbidding. A wall of power. Forestall. Protector of the remnants of the one forest. Fowl's Kresh. The despiser's home. Furl Falls. Waterfall at Revelstone. Furl's Fire. Warning Fire at Revelstone. Garth, war mark of the warward of Lord's Keep. Gay, a wind home of the Raman. Giant Clave, giantish conference. Giants, the unhomed, ancient friends of the Lords. Gildan, a maple like tree with golden leaves. Gildan Lode, a power wood formed from Gildan trees. Grace, a cord of the Raman. Graveling, firestones made to glow by stone lore. Gravelingus, a master of the stone lore. Grey Slayer, plains name for Lord Fowl. Griffin, lion-like beast with wings. Haruchai, a people from whom the blood guard come. Healer, a physician. Hearthrall of Lord's Keep, one responsible for light, Warmth and hospitality. Heart of Thunder. Cave of Power in Mount Thunder. Heart Thew. Beric Halfhand. Heartwood Chamber. Meeting place of a Woodhelven. Hears. Leaders 
of a wood helpin. Harem, a raver. High Lord, leader of the Council of Lords. High Wood, offspring of the One Tree. Higher Brand, a master of wood lore. Hearn, a cord of the Raman. Hurtloam, a healing mud. Hurin, a Ranihin, Terrell's Mount. Hineril, a Ranihin, Mount of Tamarantha and Moram. Ill Earth Stone, source of evil power found under Mount Thunder. Imoiran, Tomal Mate, a stone downer. Irin, warrior of the third Eoman of the Warward. Jahannam, a raver. Kevin Landwaster, son of Loric Vile Silencer, last High Lord of the Old Lords. Kevin's Lore, knowledge of power left by Kevin in the Seven Wards. Kirill Threndor, Heart of Thunder. Korik, a bloodguard. Krish, savage, giant, yellow wolves. Kurash Plenathor, region formerly named Stricken Stone, now called Trothgard. Land, the generally area found on the map. Lena, a stone downer, daughter of Atiaran. Life swallower, the great swamp. Lillianril, wood lore or masters of wood lore. Lithe, a main thrall of the Raman. Laura, here of soaring wood helven. Lomilia lore, high wood. Lord, master of the sword and staff parts of Kevin's lore. Lord Fatherer, Derek Halfhand. Lord Fowl, Lord's name for the enemy of the land. Lord's Fire, staff fire used by the Lords. Lord's Keep, Revelstone. Lore Master, a leader of Irviles. Lorsrat, Trothgard School where Kevin's lore is studied. Lore Warden, teacher in the Lorsrat. Lore Works, Demon Dim Power Laboratory. Loric Vile Silencer, a High Lord, son of Damalon Giant Friend. Lore Liaril, Gildenlode. Maliner, Wood Helvenen Here, son of Vainin. Maining, a ceremony of becoming a main thrall. Main thrall, Robin first rank. Marnie, a Ranihin, Tuvor's mount. Marrow meld, bone sculpting. Melancurian Abatha, phrase of invocation or power. Moram, lord, son of Variol. Murin Odonamate, a stone downer. Oath of Peace, oath by people of the land against needless violence. Odona Murinmate, a stone downer. Old Lords, Lords prior to the ritual of desecration. O Moornil, Wood and here, daughter of Moornil. One Forest, ancient forest which covered most of the land. One Tree, thee. Mystic tree from which the staff of law was made. Orcrest, a stone of power. O Sandrea, Lord, daughter of Sandrea. Padrias, wood helven and here, son of Mil. Peak of the Fire Lions, Mount Thunder. Pietan, wood helven and child, son of Sorano. Protho, High Lord, son of Dwillian. Quan, war haft of the third eoman of the warward. Quest, thee. Search to rescue the staff of law. Raman, a people who served the Ranihin. Ranihin, the great free horses of the plains of Ra. Ravers, Lord Fowl's three ancient servants. Revelstone, Lord's Keep. Mountain City of the Lords. Radameril, Stone Lore, or Masters of Stone Lore. 
Ringthane, Raman name for Thomas Covenant. Rites of unfettering, the ceremony of becoming unfettered. Ritual of desecration, act of despair by which High Lord Kevin destroyed the old lords and ruined most of the land. Rock brother, rock sister, a term of affection between men and giants. Rusta, accord of the Raman. Sacred Enclosure, Vespers Hall at Revelstone. Salt Heart Foam Follower, a giant, friend of Covenant. Sand Gorgons, monsters described by the giants. Satan's Heart, giantish name for Lord Fowl. Seven Wards, collection of knowledge left by High Lord Kevin. Seven Words, Power Words. Sheol, a raver. Serrano, a wood helven in here, son of Thiller. Soul Crusher, giantish name for Lord Fowl. Spar Limb Keelsetter, a giant, father of triplets. Spring Wine, a mild, refreshing liquor. Staff, the, to distinguish from other staves, a branch of Kevin's lore. Staff of Law, the, formed by Beric from the One Tree. Stone Down, a stone village. Stone Downer, one who lives in a stone village. Stricken Stone, now called Trothgard. Suropa Meryl, a stone craft. Sword, the, a branch of Kevin's lore. Tamarantha, Variol Mate, Lord, daughter of Inesta. Teras, a stone downer, daughter of Anoria. Terrell, a blood card. Test of truth. Test of veracity by Lomilia lore or Orcrest. Thew, a cord of the Raman. Torm, Gravelingus and Hearthrall of Lord's Keep. Tomal, a stone downer craftmaster. Treasure berries, nourishing fruit found throughout the land. Chel Atiaran mate. Gravelingus of Mithil stone down. Triak, a stone downer, son of Thuler. Tuvor, first mark of the blood guard. Unbeliever, Thomas Covenant. Unfettered, lower students freed from conventional responsibilities. Unhomed, the, the giants. Erlord, title given to Thomas Covenant. Irviles, demon dim spawn, evil creatures. Valent, former High Lord. Variol Tamarantha mate. Lord, former High Lord, son of Pentil. Viles, sires of the demon dim. Vow, the Haruchai oath, which formed the blood guard. Warhaft, commander of an eoman. War lore, sword knowledge in Kevin's lore. War mark, commander of the warward. Warren Bridge, entrance to the catacombs under Mount Thunder. Warward, the army of Lord's Keep. Wavenhair Haliel, a giant, wife of Sparlim Keelsetter, mother of triplets. Waymeet, resting place for travelers. Wain him, tenders of the Waymeets, opponents of Irviles, though demon dim spawn. White Warrens, homes of the Cave Whites under Mount Thunder. Winholm, Raman lowest rank. Woodhelven, Wood Village. Woodhelvenin, inhabitants of Wood Village. Word of Warning, a powerful, destructive, forbidding. Wraiths of Andalane, creatures that perform the dance at the celebration of spring. End of Lord Fowl's Bane, The Chronicles of Thomas Covenant the Unbeliever, Book One, by Stephen R. Donaldson. Narrated by Terry Hayes Sales, 
in the studios of the American Printing House for the Blind, Louisville, Kentucky, for the Library of Congress, January 1982. For special distribution, as authorized by Act of Congress under Public Law 89-522, with the permission of the copyright holder and the publisher, Valentine Books. End of book.